28. Melly. Tell me something nobody on earth knows about you, not even your mom, I say to Adam, hours after getting into bed. We fell asleep after making love, but when he got up to pee, he woke me up, and neither one of us were able to fall back asleep. He groans and says, Okay, let me think. He stays quiet for a few minutes before speaking. Okay, well, I got it. We moved to Dublin when I was ten. Or he broke a vase that belonged to some dead relative. My grandma found the broken vase the next morning and blamed Uncle Finn. He came home drunk the night before, so he assumed he did it and took the blame. I never told a soul until now. He plays with my cross and laughs at the memory. Oh, poor Uncle Finn. I can't help my own laugh. He apologized and everything. He was in the doghouse with my grandmother for a long time. Your turn. Tell me something, he says. I'm scared of the dark. I speak the words quickly, then I sit up and peek at his face. Get out, he says. Nope, I have a nightlight in my bedroom downstairs, and I don't know if you've noticed, but I put one in here. If I come to bed before you, I turn it on. The second you leave for the gym on those early mornings, that light goes on. Oh, love, I had no idea. I'll be sure to turn it on for you on those mornings, okay? Like he always does, he kisses my temple. Besides the dark, tell me what you're most afraid of in this world, he asks. Not being seen, going through life and not doing anything important. I'm afraid of letting my insecurities keep me from the life I want. Your turn. Tell me something you're afraid of. Needles. His cheeks turn red in embarrassment, but that doesn't stop me from laughing. Needles? Big, strong Adam Flynn is afraid of needles? Get out of here. I shove his chest. Mel, big, strong Adam would put up such a fight at the doctor's office. It would take four or five people to hold me down to get a vaccine. I picture that in my head, and I laugh so hard I fall off the bed. Hey, I didn't laugh at your nightlight thing. That only makes me laugh harder. I laugh so hard and long that my stomach starts to hurt. Are you done? He stands over me and offers me his hand. When I take it, he yanks me to my feet. I'm sorry, Adam. I know I don't look the least bit contrite. Your secret is safe with me. He slides into the bed beside me and pulls me into his arms. Tell me something else that you're afraid of. I won't laugh this time, I promise. I put my hand to my mouth to hide my smile. Oh, I'm afraid of losing you, Mel. He speaks softly, earnestly. I can see it in his blue eyes, but I can't hold his stare. I look away and focus on his hard chest. I run a fingertip down his sternum, but I look up at him again and our eyes lock. Honestly, Adam, I don't understand why you would want to keep me. My voice trembles, and I want to look away, but can't. He closes his eyes and flares his nostrils. His cheek twitches. When he opens his eyes again, the way he looks at me almost makes my heart stop. Oh, he could never figure out why you don't see yourself the way I do. But I get it now. I understand. I'm not going to tell you why I want to keep you. I'm going to show you. He runs the back of his knuckles on my cheek. Tell me you'll give me a chance to show you. I'm here, aren't I? Feeling a sudden bout of shyness, I bite my bottom lip and pull the blanket to cover my breasts, but he pulls them down. Don't hide from me. Let me see the parts of you that you don't let anyone else see. But what if you see them and decide I'm not worth it? I whisper. My heart rate speeds up while I wait for him to answer. I hold my breath and bite my bottom lip so hard I'm afraid it will bleed. The only thing that will happen is that I'll want more and more of you. I want every side of Melanie Flynn, even the bad. I want to be the one who makes it better. He runs a hand over my messy hair and looks into my eyes. 
He's nervous. I can tell from his shallow breathing and the twitching of his eye. Why, Adam? Why would you want that? Because you're my wife. Because I felt a connection to you before I ever laid eyes on your face, when all I knew was your voice. That's why. I can tell he wants to say more, but he doesn't. He holds his breath while he waits for me to speak. Almost overcome with emotions, tears flow freely from my eyes. I move over and climb on top of his naked body. His arms automatically wrap around my waist, and I bury my face on the side of his neck. I would love that, Adam. I'll try, but it will take some time. Just be patient with me, okay? Can we not put an expiration date on our marriage? I know I said a year, but... Done. No expiration date. He relaxes underneath me, letting out a loud rush of breath. Unless you want out, I quickly add. Never, he growls. His large hands caress my lower back, and I sink deeper onto his body. As hard as it is, he's very comfortable to lay on. Tell me something else that nobody knows, he says. I kiss his neck and roll off him, but I cuddle to his side and sigh when he pulls me close. Before I left New Jersey, I started law school. Nobody knows this. The company I worked for offered tuition reimbursement, and I managed to get into CUNY School of Law. I only got through one semester before I lost my job. I just submitted my application to Northeastern School of Law before I went to Vegas. I bite my lip and hold my breath. I've never told that to anyone before. Wow, Mel, that's amazing. I probably won't get in. It's really competitive, and I don't want to ever work at a law firm, but a law degree can open lots of doors in my field. He leans over and kisses my nose. It's a gesture so small, so tender, that something inside of me melts. You'll get in. You'll finish and go on to do great things. I'll be that proud husband at your law school graduation. I'll also be the one bringing you snacks when you study for the bar. A smile so wide spreads across my face. I can picture him doing just that, being my cheerleader, encouraging me when I want to give up and supporting me through it all. Your turn. Tell me something no one else knows, I tell him. When Oi was in second grade... The school arranged something called donuts with Dad. I begged my mom to make Dad come, and he promised he would. Of course, he called the night before and told her he couldn't. I pretended I was okay, but I spent that entire night crying in my room. I was never quite the same after that. That's how we spent the next few hours, the two of us exchanging secrets that no one else knows about us. It was almost sunrise by the time I fell asleep with his arms wrapped around my naked body. When I wake up hours later, we're still in the same position, only he has thrown a leg across my thighs, keeping me securely in place. His phone starts to vibrate on his nightstand, and my bladder is begging to be relieved. Adam, I whisper, when I have no luck pushing his leg off. Adam! He finally stirs and lifts his leg. Your phone. I stumble out of the room, uncaring about my naked body. Despite only getting a few hours of sleep, I feel great, even though my hair is a mess and I have bags under my eyes, but none of that matters this morning. The smile doesn't leave my face, even while I brush my teeth. Not even when I jump in the shower to wash the sweat away. When I step out of the shower to find him standing at the sink brushing his teeth, I walk over and plant a kiss on his cheek. He spanks my wet behind while I reach for my towel. Let's go out for breakfast. It's going to snow again later, and I want to cuddle on the sofa. He grabs my wrist, pulls me to him, and kisses my lips. What about your dad? I thought we were meeting him for breakfast. He looks adorable with his messy hair and flushed face. He texted, they left a few hours ago to avoid the storm. 
breakfast with my wife sounds perfect. He smiles at me, and I kiss him one more time before I leave the bathroom. Half an hour later, we close our front door and walk down the stairs, hand in hand. We were so close to making our exit when the downstairs apartment door opens and my mother steps out. Adam automatically puts an arm across my shoulder, and neither one of us offers a greeting. In fact, I think he growls. I made pancakes, she says, looking from me to Adam. Thanks, but Adam doesn't eat pancakes, I tell her. Well, I can make him whatever he wants, she offers. Before I can tell her no, Adam speaks and says, I appreciate it, but we want to get out and get some air before the snow starts. We'll see you later. He leads me through the front door. When we step outside, we intertwine our hands and walk to a neighborhood breakfast place. If you're not going to sit on her, you have to keep her covered at all times because she's just plain old ugly. I fold the blanket and drape it across Lola, covering most of her hideousness from sight. Do you know how long it took me to find a blanket this size? He snorts, grabs my wrist, and pulls me onto his lap. Today has been amazing. From our talk last night to breakfast at the diner this morning, it's been magical. We know things about each other that nobody else does. And after that confession he made about his dad, I held his hand and told him that I understood. Maybe he always knew from the beginning that we're kindred spirits who have dealt with rejection from the very people who are supposed to love us unconditionally. Don't talk about Lola like that. You'll hurt her feelings. When he bites the top of my ear, I let out a loud shriek. I reach for my bowl of popcorn, but he yanks me back and grabs the bowl before I can. He tucks me into his side and feeds me popcorn while he searches for a movie. The blinds are open, and even though the sun hasn't set yet, it's gray as light snow starts to fall. We're not getting a storm like we did weeks ago, but half a foot is still a lot. I never cared much for snow, but it's not so bad when you're cuddling with your husband. No, I say for the tenth time he starts scrolling. No science fiction. Your taste in movies is as bad as your taste in furniture. I don't want to watch any of that girly shit, Mel, and no goofy comedies either. He flips some more, and when I get exasperated, I try and take the remote from him. He lifts his hand straight up into the air and blocks me with his other hand. It's as if it takes no effort to stop me. You want to do trial by combat again? He asks with a smug smile. You only won because you cheated. No, that was you who cheated, and I still won. Something starts to vibrate in his pocket, a look of irritation crosses his face, but he smiles when he sees Ma flashing across the screen. He puts the phone to his ear, stands up, and mouths that he'll be right back. Just as I grab the remote and get comfortable on the couch, the knock on the door interrupts me. In too much of a good mood to be irritated, I run to the door and open it without asking who it is. That was my first mistake. My mother stands on the other side of the threshold, holding two large Tupperware bowls. My second mistake was letting her inside the apartment after she asked if she could come in. Since you two didn't want breakfast, I brought you dinner. Instead of handing me the bowls, she walks to the kitchen and puts them down on the table. Thanks, is all I say. I stick my hands in the back pockets of my jeans and wait for her to leave. Where's Adam? He's in the back talking to his mother. I take a few steps out of the kitchen, hoping she'll follow me to the door, but she stays rooted to her spot. You seem to be pretty chummy with his mother. I don't respond, but arch my eyebrows. The manicures and matching necklaces. Our family isn't even Catholic. No, but Adam's family is, and she gave me something symbolic to her. Is that a problem for you? I do my best to keep my temper in check, but that's no easy feat. Are you planning on converting? Converting? I'm not religious. 
Other than going to church with Grandma a few times when we were kids, we never went. And why do you care? Just as I get my hand on the doorknob, she speaks again. Why does every interaction between us have to be a fight? I'm trying, Melanie. I keep my back turned and count to ten. Once I've calmed down, I turn to face her. Trying what, exactly? To have a relationship with my daughter. Why? You've never wanted one before. Listen, you have a great relationship with Jason and Alex. Focus on that and don't worry about me. I'm fine. She takes a step closer to me and I take a side step out of the way. I've always wanted one. Listen. She runs a hand through her salt and pepper hair. My mom always swore she would never dye her hair. She spent too much time watching our grandmother use cheap hair dye to bother. I know I've made some mistakes with you, and I was hoping that since I'm here now, we can try to heal. I let out a deep breath and drop my hands to my sides. I look around her, hoping and praying that Adam will come out and save me, but I know his phone calls with his mom never take less than half an hour. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, Mother. I'm really not. No part of me wants to be mean to you or treat you like you've always treated me, but I think it's best if we leave things between us alone. I'm in a great place in my life, and I know you've gotten into some issues recently. Maybe you should focus on fixing your problems and not me. I do my best to keep my voice calm, but just having her here is making my entire body itch. I want to grab the blanket and cover my entire body just so she won't see me and tear me down. There it is. Say it. Let it out, Melanie. Judge me the same way you think I've judged you. The way I think? As if I'm making the entire thing up? I've played a part, but you exaggerate things. You've played a part. Like your constant favoritism? Did you only just play a part in that, mother? Or the belittling of me? Was that just a part, too? Her head rolls back, but she takes a deep breath and says... You never gave me a chance to explain. It's so much better for you to hold this thing between us over my head, isn't it? I wait for the blind rage, but it doesn't come. The only thing I feel is resignation. But because I want this to be the last time we have this conversation, I don't ask her to leave. None of what I just said has anything to do with what I overheard that morning. None of it. But as usual, you refuse to take any responsibility. You want to go back to that morning as if it's the only explanation for the state of our relationship. But if you want to go back there, fine. So I'm partly to blame because I overheard you telling my aunt that you regret having me and I've done nothing but cause strife in your life. That's my fault? I didn't say that. I, you did say that, I yell, stunning her. I remember every word you said, so own it. Do you know how many times I've replayed that conversation in my head? Hundreds. What I don't need is you being around here and reminding me of this shit. You're entitled to your feelings about me, just like I'm entitled to mine about you. This time, I open the door and gesture for her to leave. So, that's it? You married Adam and found yourself a new mother? Yes, because my marriage is about you. Of course it is. That was my diabolical plan all along. I married Adam for his mother. Are you happy now? You've figured it out. I gesture for her to leave again, but when she makes no moves to go, I slam the door shut to keep out the draft. I love my children, Melanie. Both of them. I don't doubt that, but you only like one of us. Maybe my actions showed that, but I'd really like to change that. She takes a small step closer to me, slowly closing the distance. Here's the thing. You can't change it. Like I said, I'm not trying to hurt you. I did that for years to you and Jason, and that only made me feel worse. And let's be honest, 
It's been 10 years, mother, and you've never once shown any interest in fixing things between us. I don't buy your sudden interest in having a relationship with me. You're not here for me. You've never been there for me because you never wanted me. She looks down, but I don't miss the unshed tears in her eyes. That's unfair. All I've ever wanted was the best for you both. I'm sorry about the way I went about it. I'd really like... Whatever she was going to say gets interrupted by the sounds of Adam's heavy footsteps. Mel, Ma wants to talk to you about the wedding dress shopping next Saturday. He comes to a full stop when he sees my mother standing there. The phone dangles in his hand. I open the front door again and walk away, take the phone from Adam's hand, sit on the couch, and say hello. Realizing she's been dismissed, my mom walks out and quietly closes the door behind her. 29. Melly. What about Mermaid? Ananda asks Adam while she shoves a chip in her mouth. I'm picturing a Halloween costume, and I hope it's slutty. Is it slutty, Mel? Maybe you can get a long blue wig to go with it, and your torso's got to be exposed. Everyone erupts in laughter, even Molly, but she walks over and gently whacks him in the back of the head. A-line? I ask. Modified A-line, Molly says. What about sheath? Ananda throws in. No idea what any of that means, but if it... If you say slutty one more time, I'm gonna whack you in the mouth. Molly makes a fist to prove her point. Adam closes his mouth and pretends to zip his lips. Leave Adam alone. Alex waddles over and puts a hand on his arm. He is way too manly to know about dress tiles. Just know that Melly is going to look gorgeous. Alex is right. I'm too much man for this conversation. Look at this. He shows us his bicep and all the women pretend to swoon. All the women except Molly, who only rolls her eyes at her son. Wedding dress and bridesmaids' dresses are done. We still need to coordinate with Mel's mom about her colors, but I think we should match the bridesmaids' dresses. Maybe a darker shade of blue. Too bad she was sick and couldn't come with us. Molly wrings her hands. All laughter and humor cease. Alex looks down and lays a hand on her lower back. I walk over to her and help her to Lola. All week, there was talk about whether I was going to invite my mother with us. All week, I thought about it. Hell, I had a couple of sleepless nights over it. Jason hinted several times about asking her, but my need to have a stress-free day without any tinge of judgment or disapproval won out in the end, and my mother was left out. Besides, the last conversation with her left me completely drained, but today didn't go as planned. My heart felt heavy, despite having the best group of women with me, and as much fun as we had, the feeling of guilt lingered. Almost as if Ananda could sense my change of mood, she comes over and rests her chin on my shoulder while Adam intertwines my fingers with his. I'll ask her about that when she's feeling better, Molly, I say quickly. We have flowers on Wednesday, but Alex will FaceTime you. Jason only let you go today because you wouldn't be on your feet. Let me? Alex snorts. Oh, please. Your brother can take several seats. Ananda walks over and gives her a high five. But I agree to do flowers remotely. This baby is wreaking havoc on my back. Are you coming with us? Ananda asks Adam. Do you need me there, Mel? I can tell from his tone that he'd rather be anywhere else. I'll call you if I do. At this point, I'll just tell you when and where to show up. I can't even trust you to pick out your own tux. Thanks, love. He smiles at me without an ounce of shame. I'll give you my measurements. Oh, wow. You're terrible, Adam. Alex chuckles. It's fine. Don't complain if you don't like something, I warn him. He'd better not complain, Molly says, making a fist at Adam. As long as you're there, and you say I do, it will be perfect. 
The women swoon at his words, and a smile spreads across my face. The food we ordered arrives, and when Adam goes downstairs to get it, I text Jason and tell him to come upstairs with Addie. He shows up a few minutes later, and Addison goes directly to her mother. She sits on her lap and lays her head on Alex's boobs while Jason gets food for them. A salad, love? Adam asks over his grilled chicken a few minutes later. I have a wedding dress to fit, but as soon as we land in Paris, I'm going to eat no less than six croissants per day. We'll need to buy two seats for me for the trip back home. He wiggles his eyebrows and offers me some of his food. And, I say, lowering my voice, I have to update the wedding spreadsheet later. I've run into some unexpected expenses. Later, he whispers back. Jason takes a seat next to me. He smiles, but the smile doesn't quite reach his eyes. On closer inspection, he looks tired, more so than usual. Adam, Molly says, at some point, you're going to have to take your uncle shopping, not just for the wedding, but all his shirts are too tight, and you know he won't order clothes online. Adam sighs, but he kisses me on the cheek before he joins his mother on the couch. You okay, Jace? I ask my brother. He takes a bite of his taco and smiles, but the smile never fully forms. He drops the taco, exhales, and meets my eyes. Mom's upset. My stomach drops, not just at his words, but at the accusatory tone. So I don't say a word. I hold his stare and wait for him to either say more or to shut up. Melly, did you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. I turn back to my salad and stuff lettuce in my mouth. It gets stuck in my throat and I nearly finish my water to get it down. That's it? What do you want me to say? I don't want her to be upset, believe it or not, I tell him. You have a funny way of showing it. I drop my fork in my plate and look around the room for Adam. He must sense my distress. He gets up while in mid-conversation with his mother. You okay, Mel? He sits next to me and starts to rub the back of my neck. I'm having a conversation with my sister, Flynn. You don't need to be involved in this. I flinch at not just my brother's words, but his dismissive tone. Don't dismiss my husband, I hiss at him. I would never do that to your wife, so show us the same respect. Oh, really? Because a few weeks ago, you came home from Vegas married after a drunken night. I stand up so fast, my chair topples over. Adam stands right along with me and takes a step to Jason. I quickly stand between them. I'm talking to my sister about our mother and about the fact that she was excluded today. Maybe you had something to do with that? I turn to face my brother, stunned by his accusation. Are you serious right now, Jason? You think Adam cares who goes with me to buy dresses? It was my decision, so stand down. I look around the room. Molly and Ananda are doing their best to make it look like they're not paying attention, but Alex is glaring at her husband. We need to talk. Jason takes my hand and pulls me down the hall and into Adam's home gym. Adam shuts the door behind us. You could have just taken her with you, Jason says, sighing and running a hand over his head. She didn't want to, Adam says before I can respond. I told you to stay out of it, Jason growls. How does it look that you took Flynn's mother and not your own? Jason asks me. I'm not going to stay out of it, Dupree, Adam says. Don't you come up here and try to bully my wife with a guilt trip. Bully? I should have kicked your ass out of here last year when I had the chance, you sneaky fuck. Oh my God, will you stop? Jason, I thought you of all people would understand that I wanted today to be a peaceful and happy experience. I'm not going out of my way to hurt our mother. But you did, and I was left downstairs trying to clean up the mess you left behind. You didn't see. You need to shut the hell up right now, Dupree, Adam warns. But if this is how it's always been between the three of you, we can see why Mel keeps her distance from that woman downstairs. That woman is our mother, so show some damn respect. On second thought, 
Just shut the hell up and mind your own damn business. Adam takes a step to Jason. I step between them and put a hand to Adam's chest. My wife is my business. What part of that don't you get, Dr. Genius? And I know she upsets my wife every single time they see each other. And now I know you always side with mommy. Adam taunts. Enough, I yell, turning to Jason. Don't you say another rude word to Adam. Just stop. And for the record, you left for college, and I was left with her for four years, dealing with her disappointment and criticism every time I fell short of measuring up to her perfect son. Everything I did was met with Jason did it better. It was always Jason, Jason, Jason. You are her perfect child, and you have no idea what it's like for me. You're not going to come up here and make me feel bad because I chose my peace of mind. Jason stands there, hands on his hips, while he takes shallow breaths. I reach for Adam and let him wrap me in his strong arms. I bury my face in his chest and breathe him in, each breath bringing me closer and closer to peace. Adam rubs my back and murmurs soothing words, and the entire time I can feel him scowling at Jason, who now remains quiet. The door bursts open and Alex waddles in. Jason Dupree, I warned you. Let's go home. Addison needs a fresh diaper. She grabs Jason's hand. Adam and I follow them out and watch as they pack up the rest of their food, say a quick goodbye, and leave. Ananda soon follows, mouthing sorry to me while she runs out the door, leaving us alone with Molly. That looked tense. Molly pulls me from Adam and takes me in her arms. I didn't know how I didn't pick up on it before. Your mom's not sick, darling. I shake my head at her, confirming her theory. It's a complicated relationship, I tell her. My mother and I wrote the book on that. I've only scratched the surface of what I told you, so I understand. The thing you must remember, darling, is that it's your relationship, and you have to navigate it however is best for you, whatever you're comfortable with. But please make sure you don't do anything you'll regret when she's gone. She hugs both of us before leaving. When it's just me and Adam, he cradles my face and searches my eyes. He only relaxes when I smile at him. Wanting his comfort, I wrap my arms around him and stick my face in the middle of his chest. He lifts me off the ground and takes me to Lola. Once I'm comfortable on his lap, I soak up his warmth. I'm sorry Jason treats you that way. He only does it because of the things I said in the beginning. That's on me. I'll fix it. Mel, I don't care about how Jason treats me, as long as you don't treat me like that. Never. A sudden wave of emotion hits. I let out a choked sob and hide my face in the crook of Adam's neck and sob. His hands pause on my back, and I sense the confusion rolling off him. Oh, I'm sorry, love. I can go downstairs and beat your brother's face in. Just say the word. This isn't about Jason. An involuntary sob catches me off guard, and more tears fall. I pull myself together enough to look into his eyes. His brows are furrowed, and I think he's stopped breathing. No, Mel... Don't tell me you've changed your mind about us. You promised. Shh. I put a finger to his lips. I haven't. His relief is immediate. He lets out a rushed breath and it caresses my cheek. And I won't. I take a deep breath while I ponder my next words. But I'm so afraid, Adam. I'm so afraid that you'll be the one who changes your mind about us. Unable to take the look in his eyes, I lower my gaze and focus on his chest. Mel, how can you believe that after I've chased you for two years? I'm exactly where I want to be. His words are reassuring, but my heart won't stop thumping. I like this. I like what we have, and I don't want to lose that. I've always felt less than, not good enough, it's hard when your own mother treats you as if you're unimportant. I've always been so afraid that when people get to know me, they'll see what she sees. But I don't want to be that scared person anymore. 
I'm all in, Adam. I'm going to rock this marriage thing. He leans down and graces me with soft kisses. He presses his forehead on mine, and when he closes his eyes, his eyelashes tickle my forehead, and I giggle at the sensation. Promise me you'll never take it back, Adam says. Promise me that you'll honor our vows, that we're in this until death do us part. I open my eyes, look deep into his blue orbs, and say, Didn't you hear me? I'm going to grab marriage by the balls. I don't know what that means, but it sounds kind of painful, love, he says with a laugh. It means I'm going to be the world's best wife. So, I promise. Maybe this thing we have, this obsession. Deep down, I've always recognized your feelings about not being good enough. Your issues with your mom and mine with my father. He never bothered with me, and it hurt. It still hurts, Mel. Even now as an adult, I still struggle with it. In my head, I know it's not my fault, and that he was a selfish man. But my heart is another story. We share the same pain, love. We do. And your father missed out, Adam. It was his loss. And now he's gone, and will never know the amazing son he created. He rests his forehead on mine. Thank you for saying that. You don't know how much that helps. Molly raised a great man. His soft lips land on my forehead. I'm sorry about before. Shh. I don't care about before. I only care about now and tomorrow. Tomorrow looks bright, he tells me. Let me say this, please. When he nods, I continue. I'm sorry for leaving you in Vegas and for freaking out those first few days when we got back. You didn't deserve that, and I was a scared fool. And yes, tomorrow does look bright, even though we might be living in a cardboard box because this wedding is so expensive. I sigh. Oh, well, you feel another spreadsheet in our near future. I hop off his lap and he slaps my ass. I let out a yelp and run to the bedroom for my laptop. When I return, I pull out several receipts from my purse and update the document. So, apparently, seven months is not a long time to plan a wedding, and we're paying extra to have things expedited. Do you know it can take up to nine to twelve months to get a wedding dress? He does a fake gasp and puts both hands to his cheeks and says, Really? The wedding industry is shameful. I playfully slap him upside his head the same way his mother does. So, I had to pay extra to get my dress in time for alterations if needed. I hope the flowers won't cost too much and... Love, don't worry about it. Just use the credit card. Don't stress out about the cost. Yes, but I really want to be a homeowner. I guess I can dip into my emergency savings, and since we both have incomes, we can still buy something. But now we'll need something bigger than just the starter house I was going to get on my own. Oh, I need to know exactly how much you make, and maybe we can get joint accounts. 30. Adam. She wasn't kidding about being all in. That's everything I want to hear, and my worst nightmare rolled into one. But I clear my throat and put a smile on my face and hope she can't smell my fear. <clears throat> we can merge checking accounts. I can transfer to yours or you to mine. I've never been so happy to have accounts at two different banks before than I am right at this moment. She smiles at my suggestion and nods. Okay, we can figure that out later. But we need to figure out how we're going to budget these added expenses. We can't have any late credit card payments. She talks some more and I do my best to pay attention while I move money around on my banking app. She asks me how much I make and I tell her without meeting her eyes. Okay, she smiles, showing off all her teeth. That makes us equal. She claps her hands together as if she just discovered some great secret. I close the banking app and put my phone away. I thought you said you made more than me. I do, but we're in the same bracket. I look at her and raise my eyebrows. She tells me her salary and says, You know the box you check for your salary range? We're in the same box. 
So, yes, I do make more, but we're in the same income bracket, which makes us equals. She reaches over and runs her fingers through my hair and kisses my cheek. And that's important to you. Very. I want to be on equal footing. I know things can happen, but I want us to at least start at the same level. I sigh and lean back in my chair. I don't see why that matters. It wouldn't bother me if you made twice as much as me. She looks at me and smiles while she shakes her head as if I just missed the point. It's different for me, she says. Jason makes about nine times as much as Alex. I'd hate that. You don't think they're equal, Mel? You're right. They're not. She runs the man, I chuckle. But if anyone is beneath anyone, it's him. And, I tell her, grabbing her chin, unless you're getting another husband, you don't have to worry about that. I'd never treat you that way. She looks down and I wait for her to speak again. I know she's considering her next words. You don't understand. It's about me, not anyone else. I was always the unimportant one growing up, and I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to be capable. I want to be a true partner to you, and that means contributing financially. It's important to me. If we're going to build an empire, we're going to do it together. So if you found out I was a secret millionaire, you'd bolt. I do my best to sound playful, but my heart is beating so fast I'm worried she'll hear it. Oh, really? She gives me the most exaggerated eye roll. How many millions are we talking about? Fifty, give or take. I give her a noncommittal shrug. She throws her head back and her laughter fills the kitchen. She's unguarded and beautiful, and I can't help but reach over, pick her up, and put her on my lap. It's freaky how strong you are, but I'd be worried if you had fifty million dollars and chose to rent this place from my brother. And you lived like a broke frat boy before I came up here and rescued you. Mm-hmm. I nibble the side of her neck. She leans away, giving me better access. I brush her hair aside and bite her skin. I suck right at the base of her neck, uncaring about leaving any marks. Think about it, Mel. No more spreadsheets. No more stress about what we spend for the wedding or what house we can afford. You can quit your job and go to law school full-time. I leave wet kisses on her neck, but my wife has stopped reacting to me. I pull my lips away and she slowly turns to face me. I like it this way better with both of us contributing. It's moot, stud. You probably don't even have fifty dollars in your wallet right now. Never mind fifty million. I reach into my back pocket, pull out, and open my wallet. She looks in it, only to give me a smug smile when I pull out two five-dollar bills. Damn. I guess you're right, love. Then she straddles me and kisses me deep. She starts to grind and pull my shirt over my head and I break the kiss long enough for her to take the shirt off. All that talk about equality has made me horny. She whispers against my mouth. I stand and she wraps her legs around me. I'm going to give you fifty million orgasms. Oh, my poor, broke and delusional husband. I'll settle for two. The instant we get in the bedroom and I slam the door shut with my foot, I toss her on the bed and dive on top of her. She screams and laughs at the same time until I silence her with my mouth. 31. Melly. Don't let Addie see that or she'll never leave you alone about it, Alex says. I take the bridal magazine from her and admire the miniature dress. It's similar to mine, so she'll match her auntie. I hope she doesn't experience a bout of shyness. She gets like that sometimes. Yeah, but it will be a small wedding, 80 people at the absolute most. I hate to break it to you, Melly, but 80 people at a wedding is not exactly small. Alex's smile drops. She lifts her heavy bulk and inches closer to me. Are you planning on inviting your mother? She whispers. She looks around, likely ensuring that my mother's not hovering. Of course I am, I tell her. Don't start with me, Alex, okay? Things got ugly with Jason a few days ago. I lean back on the couch and drop the magazine on the coffee table. It's not fair that she gets to come here and cause all this drama. I sigh loudly and close my eyes. You know I'm always Team Melly. 
I know. I'm sorry. I just don't need another guilt trip from your husband. He's stuck in the middle. He loves both of you. I'm not asking him to choose. I'm not asking him to take sides. I am going to tell him off if he tries to pull some shit like he did the other day again. I want to focus on the wedding. Too bad you can't come test the food with us. Ananda's meeting us there Saturday afternoon. Thank goodness for Molly, I say with a sigh, just as my mother walks into the living room. The pinched look on her face must mean she heard what I said about Adam's mother. She comes over, sits on the end of the couch, and picks up my bridal magazine. She reaches for the reading glasses sitting on top of her head and puts them on. Oh, Alex, I got Addie to sleep. She put up a hard fight. She flips the pages and says, Is your dress in here, Melanie? This is the first time I've seen her since last week. She looks thinner and her crow's feet are more pronounced, but I keep my mouth shut. Maybe she's tired from running after a two-year-old all day. I lift my hand and gesture for the magazine back. I flip through until I come to the marked page. Something like this, I tell her. It's the same designer. That's not the exact dress, but it's very similar. She lifts the magazine and studies the dress. I wait for her to say something negative like she always does. I look at Alex, and it looks like she's holding her breath. It's pretty, she says, surprising me. I knew you wouldn't care for the frilly stuff. This will look good on you. My mother's face spreads into a genuine smile. Thank you. I take the magazine and flip to the back. This is what Addison is going to wear. She has a poofy version of my dress. Molly wants to know if you want to get dark blue dresses to offset the light blue that Alex and Ananda are wearing. Her smile dips as soon as she hears the name Molly. She purses her lips and takes her reading glasses off her face. Alex stands up, her stomach protruding. She places a hand on it and wobbles away, telling us that the baby is sitting on her bladder. I suppose that means I'm invited to my daughter's wedding then. I honestly wasn't sure until now. I guess I should be grateful. Deciding not to take the bait, I say, I was always going to invite you. I stand and take the magazine. Let's not do this. Running away again. That stops me in my tracks. Adam telling me that I'm a runner comes to mind. So I stand my ground and turn to face her. Every time I come near you, you flee. I stand there in stony silence and wait for her to say more. I'm your mother. We should be able to have a conversation, Melanie. I'm not perfect, but I never laid a hand on you. I've always loved you and wanted the best for you. I still do. You have a funny way of showing it. Why? Because I pushed you? Because I had high expectations? Because you spent my entire life making me feel less than when I couldn't meet the expectations that you set. Because on one of the most important days of my life, I heard you tell my aunt that you wish you had stopped having kids after you had Jason and that I was nothing but trouble and difficult to be around. I thought you'd appreciate my absence. Anyway, she says, as if she didn't hear a word I just said, I wish I could have been there with you last Saturday, just like I was when you went prom dress shopping. Yeah, I remember that. I was so excited about junior prom, but you hated the dress I wanted, so much so that you walked out of the store and refused to pay for it. I think you said that I had already wasted your time, but I was not going to waste your money. Remember that? Once was enough for me. I learned a lesson that day, so I should thank you. What? That you can go around me to your father to get what you want? She stands, too, all attempts of making nice gone. He told me he loved the dress, but that's not the lesson I'm talking about. But it did help because he kind of resented you, even then. No, I learned that I'd have to make my own money and make my own decisions. I had a job and bought my own dress for senior prom. When I see the hurt look in her eyes, I regret my words about Dad resenting her. 
I meant what I said. It's not my intention to hurt her, but every time she pulls at an old scab, my instinct is to strike back. Yes, I'm the terrible mother who ruined all your moments and doomed to pay for it for all eternity. I throw my hands up in defeat. This is why I leave when you're around. You push all my buttons. You want me to take half the blame because you were a shitty mother to me, and I refuse to do that. You're doing it again. You're pitting me against Jason, but I won't let you do it this time. I'm his mother, just like I'm yours. Manicure, shopping, and wedding planning with Molly won't change that. This is absurd, even for you, mother. I walk around her and stand on the opposite side of the room. I visibly exhale in relief when Alex returns. I'm going upstairs, Alex. Do you need anything before I go? Already? Is Adam back? I shake my head and remind her that Adam is helping Uncle Finn with something. Well then, a smile lights up her face and she hooks an arm through mine. We're going to eat strawberry ice cream and watch reruns of the Golden Girls. Please. She bats her eyelashes and I relent. Go sit down. I'll get the ice cream. She waddles away, grabs the TV remote, and sits on the couch. Are you going to have some, Diane? Alex asks my mother. We have vanilla almond Swiss and butter pecan if you prefer. I grab bowls and pull out the unopened pint of strawberry and silently pray that mother will decide to go to her room early. But once again, I'm forsaken. Strawberry for me, Melanie. Our love for strawberry-flavored desserts is the one thing that we all have in common. We always had strawberry ice cream at home growing up. After bringing three bowls topped with whipped cream, Alex turns on our favorite old sitcom. She had never watched the show before she met me. In fact, my mother would watch reruns of it when I was a child, and I'd watch too. Most of the jokes went over my head, but now it's one of my favorite shows. Two episodes later, Adam knocks on the door and Alex asks him to come in. He pulls me on his lap and kisses me senseless in front of everybody. He finally pulls away when my mother loudly clears her throat. It turns out Molly loves this show too and Adam has seen every episode. So, for the next hour, the three of us sit together and laugh. He even shares my second bowl of ice cream with me. Everything okay? He asks me when we get upstairs to our apartment. Did she do something to upset you? I get on my toes and wrap my arms around his neck. Adam, I say, doing my best Uncle Finn impersonation. I missed you. Is Uncle Finn okay? He's fine. I'm the one who's meshugger enough for dealing with his ass all night. He tricked me. He said he had some paperwork he wanted me to look at but he really asked me over there to help him look through a bunch of dating profiles. He's been swiping right all night. 32. Adam. February brought crazy weather that included two blizzards and an ice storm, but the crazier the weather got, the calmer the drama became. There was no more bickering between Mel and her mom and zero confrontations between me and Jason. Even the phone calls have waned. I wish they would stop completely, but at least they are limited to only the mornings now. According to Mel and my mom, they've taken care of all the big items for the wedding. Mel's got her dress. We have a church, food, and flowers. The only big detail left is the cake, but since Mel knows the owner of the bakery and the type of cake she wants, she's not stressing about it. In fact, she has an appointment to go cake tasting next month. We even got the joint bank accounts so Mel can track every penny we spend. Unfortunately for Mel, she has no idea about my other accounts, but that's okay for now. I'll just need to find the right time to tell her. Maybe when we get back from our honeymoon. February not only brought crazy weather, but fun times too. Alex's baby shower is being hosted by Jason's best friend and his wife. Melanie and Ananda helped Sandy plan, and on the morning of the shower, we were met with dry but bitter cold temperatures and biting winds. It reminded me that my wife will need a new car before next winter. 
It is also the first time, other than when her mother blew into town, that she's needed me. Hey, wife, I say a couple of hours after she left to go get set up. Don't worry, I won't forget to bring your clothes. She was in such a hurry she forgot to bring her change of clothes. Or the gift you left here, I snicker. Thanks, Dad. I smile at my nickname. What are you doing? Laying in the middle of our bed. All alone, I might add. You'd better be alone. I can hear a hard edge to her voice, and I smile at her sudden bout of jealousy. Yes, dear. Put those claws away. Can you come now, Adam? We need help. Alex is one of my best friends, so I only complained a little about going to a baby shower. Going there hours early doesn't exactly sound great, but Mel does sound a little stressed. We just need help with setting up the decorations and stuff. Please? Before she said please, I was already out of bed and digging through our closet for clothes. Sure, love. Text me the address and I'll be there soon. Five minutes later, I'm downstairs and just about to make my exit out the back door when Diane pokes her head out. Are you leaving for the shower now? Her voice is tentative and small. Jason pokes his head out, too. Mel needs help, is all I say. Jason and I haven't talked since I got in his face almost a month ago. Would you mind if I ride with you? I'm a nervous driver in the snow, and I'd like to help, too. I stare at her, unsure of how to respond. Let me call Mel and see how much help she needs. She purses her lips, crosses her arms, and waits. Mel must be inundated because she doesn't balk at her mother coming, so I spend the next fifteen minutes in my car with my passenger. Neither one of us said a word the entire time. The instant we arrive, Ananda grabs Diane and takes her into the kitchen to set up the food. It's like a pink explosion when I get there. I'm not sure if it's because Alex is having a girl or because Jake's wife is obsessed with the color, but I've never seen so much pink in my life, including the pink shirt my wife said I had to wear. It took everyone three hours to get the house decorated and set up for the shower. It didn't help that Jake and Sandy's seven-month-old son was attempting to crawl all over the place. I ended up strapping him to my chest while we worked. By the time the guests start to arrive, I'm no longer needed to do manual labor and am left to enjoy the party. If those two spent less time kissing, we would have been done hours ago, Mel whispers to me. Our hosts are in a corner of the kitchen and Jake has his wife pinned to the wall while he grazes her neck. She lets out a shaky laugh and pushes him away. Their son, Jackson, smiles at me. He's a curly-haired, tanned version of his father. Even though he's only seven months old, he has a head full of dark curls. He laughs and drool runs down his chin. I wipe it with his bib and he sticks a chubby hand in my hair and pulls. I put an arm around my wife and pull her close. You having fun? I ask her. Are you going to take a turn doing that? I jerk my chin toward Ananda, who is wrapping a long piece of toilet paper around Alex's stomach. Whatever the hell that is. The baby in my arms grabs my nose and starts to bounce, laughing and gurgling. He likes you. Mel tries to reach for him, but he pushes her hand away and lays his head on my shoulder. Back in Dublin, I was the Bairn Whisperer. I embellish my brogue, and I don't miss how my wife licks her lips and looks at my mouth. We lean against the wall and look in the living room as everyone laughs and talks at once. You know, love, I'd like nothing more than for us to find an empty room upstairs and bend you over. I lower my head close to her ear, letting my mouth tickle her earlobe. I didn't get a chance to give that pussy a pounding this morning. I lick her earlobe and she jumps in shock. Jackson claps and drools a big glob of spit on my head. She hooks her free arm with mine and rests her chin on my bicep. I lean down and kiss the top of her head. I got a tour of the house before you got here. She lets out a loud whistle. <whistles> it's gorgeous. The master bedroom is almost as big as our apartment. They have a pool, too. That's so impractical here, isn't it? We only get a couple of months of summer, but I would love a pool. Honestly, their old house is like my dream house. Life's unfair sometimes, isn't it? She sighs wistfully. A tinge of guilt hits and I open my mouth to tell her everything. But someone in the other room laughs and I realize this is not the time or the place. You want to buy their old house? I ask her instead. She lets out an undignified snort. <laughs> it's not for sale, but we couldn't afford it even if it were. Besides, I like the city. We might have to find a fixer-upper. 
That wouldn't be so bad since you're good with your hands. She puts her face on my bicep and kisses it. Jackson reaches for Mel's hair and gives it a good tug. I remove his little hand and he whacks me on the nose and laughs. Our little bubble is interrupted when Addie comes running to us with her grandma behind her. She seems irritated when she sees me holding another baby. She raises both her hands and tries to climb my legs. My Uncle Ada, she says. Diane picks her up and when Mel drops my arm, she puts Addison in my free arm. She kisses my cheek and rests her head on my shoulder. Told you, Mel. I wink at my wife and she rolls her eyes. I bounce both kids. So, Diane says, making no moves to walk away. I see you're comfortable with kids, Adam. You're an only child, right? Mel goes completely rigid. The only child of a single mother, I tell her, weighing my words carefully. But my ma comes from a large family, and I have cousins back in Dublin. Maybe I can take you for a visit next year, love, I say to Mel. She gives me a doubtful look. For once, I'm happy to have her mother nearby. There's no way she'll go on a tirade about how we can't afford European vacations with her mother around. I can practically hear her doing the calculations in her head. Maybe, she says, but I know she's only saying that for the sake of our audience. When Diane turns away, Mel shakes her head no. Ireland, her mother says. Melly's never been out of the country. Well, we're going to Paris this summer, I tell her. I remember when Melly's idea of a vacation was going to the Jersey Shore for the weekend. You always had big dreams. Much bigger than your pocketbook. You should have found yourself a doctor at the hospital where you work. Mel bristles and so do I. But before I can put her in her place, my wife speaks. Did you give Jason this same speech? Last time I checked, his wife and I do the exact same thing. Her mother waves her off and looks over at her son and daughter-in-law. Her face lights up when she sees them, which is something that never happens when she looks at her daughter. It's different. Men take care of us. I'm just saying that a teacher can't afford to give you that champagne lifestyle. Maybe beer. But I guess you made your choice. She smiles then, almost as if she just said something nice. I take care of my wife just fine, and she takes care of me. Don't worry about us, mother. Aren't you the one living with your son now? You can't afford Adam's apartment, and I'm sure Jason will give you quite the discount when you finally move. Adam and I will be fine. Don't spend a single minute worrying about us. Jesus, why are you two so thin-skinned? We can't even have a conversation without one of you taking it the wrong way. 33. Melly. Not even my mother's toxicity could bring me down today. After cleaning up and putting the bulk of the presents in Adam's truck, we finally make it back home. My mother rode with Jason, and by the time we drop the gifts off, she's already in her room. The second we close the door behind us, Adam pins me to the wall and kisses the breath out of me. We leave a trail of discarded clothes on the way to the bedroom, and by the time we burst through the door, we're both naked and hungry for each other. I drop to my knees in front of him and take his hard dick in my mouth. I take him deep enough to make him stumble and mutter a curse. His brogue is thick with lust. He tastes so good in my mouth that I moan like a horny slut. He holds my head and fucks my mouth. Oh, I've dreamed of your lips wrapped around my dick for years, Mel. Take it, love. Take all of it. All of it is a lot. Way too much for my mouth and I gag. After catching my breath, he shoves his cock in my mouth again, and this time, I'm ready for him. I relax and take him almost to the base. Yeah, just like that, with you on your knees pleasing your husband. You love that, don't you, Mel? I mumble a yes and nod my head, but he pulls himself out. No, I whine. Put it back. I open my mouth and reach for him, but he steps back. Adam! I whine again. He grabs my wrist and lifts me to my feet as if I weigh nothing more than a feather. He spins me around and slaps me hard on the ass. Once he's pinned me to the wall, his broad, hard chest on my back, he grinds that big cock on my ass. Tell me you love it. 
He puts my earlobe in his mouth and sucks. Tell me how much you love fucking me. I love it. I always knew I would. He kisses the side of my neck and runs his tongue along my hot skin at the exact moment he spreads my legs apart. He grabs my hips and pulls my ass closer to his body. His hot, wet mouth leaves kisses down my neck and along my spine, all the way to my ass. He slaps me again, harder this time, catching me off guard, and I bite my lip at the deliciousness of it. Do it again, I order. Oi, call the shots in here. He puts both of his large hands on mine and raises them above my head, practically pinning me to the wall. You want to count every penny we spend? I don't care. You fill my apartment with girly shit and plants? Fine. But in here, I own you. I whimper again, and the woman inside of me, the one who would never let a man speak to her like this, is gone. At least for now. This is my husband, my Adam, and I'll give him this. I'm talking to you. He growls right before he roughly bites my shoulder. I know there'll be a mark there, but I don't care. You own this pussy, I tell him. I already know that. I want to own you. Say it. He grinds into me. His arousal triggers mine, and some of my moisture runs down my thighs. I moan like a whore and spread my legs further apart, far enough apart that he could slip right in, only he doesn't. He slaps me again. You own me, I surrender, and I don't care. I wave the white flag. I capitulate and gladly wave goodbye to feminist Melly. Slutty Melly is here now. Instead of giving me his hard cock, he gets on his knees, kisses both ass cheeks, spreads my lips apart, and eats my pussy from the back. Two thick fingers find their way inside of me while his hot tongue caresses my clit. I throw my head back, relishing the feel of him and the sounds he makes while he pleasures me. He teases, sucks, and bites my inner thighs. He finds the right spot. It's the perfect friction with his tongue and fingers, but just as I start to fall over the edge, he abruptly stops and steps away. I stumble to the side, nearly falling, but he catches me. He lifts me as if I'm no more than a paper doll and tosses me on the bed. The breath comes out of me, and I try to move on the bed, but he dives on top of me, bends my legs, and spreads them open. Where are you going, love? I told you I'm in charge here. He positions his big body between my thighs, and with no warning, he fills me. Adam, I moan. I grind underneath him, waiting for him to give me more. Adam! I reach behind him and slap his ass. Something changes in his eyes. They go from blue to almost black, and he grabs my hands again. He lifts them above my head, pulls his dick almost all the way out, and slams back into me. I told you, I'm in charge. You're going to learn, Melanie Flynn, that this body is mine. Gentle kisses tickle my collarbone, and I giggle at my husband. The same bossy, growly bear from an hour ago has turned into a kitten. He kisses the love bites while his hand caresses my hip, but I don't complain. I love it. I snuggle closer to him. After two rounds of lovemaking, we're underneath the bedspread and my hands can't stop touching his chiseled body. Your body is just insane. My hands travel up his taut stomach to the wall of his chest. Oh, I'm glad you like it. I love it. But if we woke up tomorrow and you were fat, I'd love that too. I'll take any version of you. He pulls me closer and kisses my temple. As long as this and this are still the same. I put my hand above his beating heart, then I touch his temple. That's the most beautiful thing anyone has ever said to me, love. Tell me something no one else knows, he says. This has become our nightly tradition. At night, when we're alone and naked, we share our secrets. I'm deathly afraid of frogs, 
If I see one, I'll freak out. I was about nine when a boy put a frog down my shirt. I can still feel how slimy it was. I make a face and start to scratch my body. He stares at me before he bursts into laughter. I swat his chest. It's not funny. Jason had one when we were kids. I could barely sleep that first night. Your turn. Oi had a frog, too. My snake ate it. I put them in the same tank. Oi was only about ten and thought they could be friends. I asked Uncle Finn to help me look for it. His name was Jumper. When I told him I'd put them in the same tank, he whacked me upside the head and told me my snake ate my frog. I felt so guilty. I put a hand to my mouth and feel the bile rising in the back of my throat. After making a few gagging sounds, he rolls his eyes and says, You're such a girl. At least I'm not a frog murderer. And the idea that your mother let you have a frog and a snake? Disgusting. She's not a wimp like you. I'm going to need ice cream to help me recover from your snake and frog drama. I extricate myself from his side, but he pulls my wrist and I fall on his chest. He gently tilts my face to his and kisses my lips. He reaches for my ass and caresses it while I walk away. I grab my short silk robe on the way out of the door. After filling a bowl with ice cream, I return to my husband. Adam is sitting up in the bed with his back leaning against the headboard. I straddle him and sit on his lap. He pulls me closer and I wrap my legs around him. He unties my robe, leaving my body completely exposed. Where did you go to college? I ask him, suddenly eager to learn everything about my husband. Brown University, he says, without meeting my eyes. The spoon of ice cream freezes halfway to my mouth, and I let out a loud whistle. The Ivy League. I'm impressed. I suddenly understand why he's not too worried about debt. He got a scholarship. You majored in education? On economics, he says. Oh, I have a master's degree in economics, too. What about you? Where did you go? Rutgers University. Confession time. Tell me something. It can be anything. I try to eat a spoon of ice cream, but he steals it and puts it in his own mouth. Um, he looks at the ceiling while he thinks. Oh, I don't like bananas. I shove more ice cream in his mouth and roll my eyes. That's lame, Adam. You said anything. Something profound, something life-altering. I'm building up to something here. He slides his hand under my robe and cups my ass, pushing me closer to him. I have something you can sit on, wife. My sexy as fuck wife. He sucks on the base of my neck, and I sigh at the sensation. He lifts and places me on top of his hard cock, and I sink down in it. Okay, life-altering events. Here we go. I slowly start to grind on top of him. I'm already sore, and he's stretching me fully. My grandma asked me to join the priesthood. She was on her deathbed, so I told her I would do it as soon as I was old enough. I lied to a dying woman, Mel. I had zero intentions of ever becoming a priest. I put my bowl of ice cream down and focus on the man in front of me. I put both hands behind his head and take him in a deep kiss. I ride his cock while his rough hands grab my ass. You're a bad boy, Adam Flynn. I should get out my ruler and spank that deliciously tight ass of yours. If anyone is doing the spanking in our bedroom, it's going to be me, Mrs. Flynn and he smacks my ass to prove his point. Your turn, love. Tell me something profound. His hands maneuver my hips. He lowers his head and sucks a nipple into his mouth. His lips are cold from the ice cream, and the sensation causes me to shiver. Eyes on me, I tell him. He lets go of my nipple, and his eyes clash with mine. I hold my breath and say, This moment, right here, is the most profound of my life. Why? Because you're making love to your husband? He kisses me again, his soft lips driving me so crazy I almost forget what he asked. 
Eyes on me, Adam. He complies. He holds his breath and waits for me to speak. Because I'm in love with my husband. His breathing stops. I lean in for a kiss and he moves his head back. Large hands cradle my face and blue eyes lock with my brown. Say that again. His voice is soft, barely just a whisper. I'm in love with my husband. I love you, Adam. No words come out of him. He stares into my eyes. Then I feel him convulse underneath me. His cock pulses inside of me, and I know he's just found his release. Tell me you mean it. He closes his eyes and rests his forehead on mine. You can't take this back, Mel. It will kill me if you wake up tomorrow and pretend you don't remember. Promise me you won't take this back. I glide my hands in his hair and caress his skull. I kiss his lips before I look into his eyes again. I'll never take it back. When I'm old and on my deathbed, I'll think of this moment as I take my last breath. I love you, Adam Finnegan Flynn, my husband. And I love you, Melanie Elise Flynn, my wife. I think I always have. We were made for each other, love. Do you have any siblings on your father's side? We made love again after my confession. Hours later, we're still in bed. This is my favorite part. This is when I learn things about my husband that few people know. I can tell he stopped breathing. I look into his face, but he looks away. Oh, I'm happy being my mother's only child, he says. Oh, I don't like talking about him, Mel. He leans back and closes his eyes. I've talked about him more with you these past few weeks than I have in years. Did you want any growing up? I ask, changing the subject away from his father. We have cousins. We never really thought of it. My mom's family is big, and I've never been lonely. Tell me something you want. Something money could buy if we had the funds. But it has to be a want, not a need. I lean on his body and think... I've never been rich, and I've been practically on my own since I was 18, so money has always been an issue for me. I think I'd like to travel, buy first-class plane tickets, and fly off to Bali or Tahiti on a whim. I'd love to own a vacation home, someplace like Myrtle Beach, stuff like that. What about you? He reaches over and pushes a piece of hair off my forehead. I'd like to give you everything you want. Do I have you? Till my last breath. Then I have everything I want and need. So do I, love. 34. Adam. My legs feel like lead by the time I hop off my bike Monday morning. I'm drenched with sweat and tiptoe into the bathroom to shower. I meant to go to the gym this morning, but I didn't want to be away from Mel any earlier than I had to. We spent Sunday alone in our apartment talking and making plans for our future. Truth be told, I never wanted to go to Las Vegas. I was worried she would meet someone there, but that trip was the best thing that could have happened. She married me, and despite a rocky start, she's still here. Not only that, she's in love with me. Eager to kiss her one more time before I leave for work, I rush through my shower. But she's no longer in bed when I get to the bedroom. Mel! I leave the room with only the towel draped around my waist. Mel! I stop short when I find her in the kitchen wearing nothing but her short robe. Why are you up so early? The smell of fresh coffee hits my nose, but she's also pulled out several containers of food from the fridge. Do you know that you spent $79 on lunches last week? And that doesn't include the extra $23 you spent at Starbucks. She grabs a Tupperware bowl from the cabinet and starts filling it with leftovers from last night's dinner. I sigh loudly and run a hand through my damp hair. <sighs> I like my coffee, and I'm a growing boy. I gotta eat lunch. I turn my back and roll my eye to the ceiling. I love this about her, but it's fucking annoying. I'm making you coffee, and I bought you a to-go mug the other day. I'm also going to be packing your lunch from now on. 
She crosses the room and stands in front of me. I smile when I see the appreciative gleam in her eyes. But don't worry, you can get coffee and buy lunch on Fridays. I huff and twist my mouth. <laughs> That's not necessary, Mel. We're fine. I know, but you'll thank me when we own our own home. It's just a small sacrifice, Adam. She moves closer and wraps her arms around my damp body. And I'll make sure you have enough coffee and lunch, just from home. Does this mean you'll stop spending money on nail polish? Every time you go out, you buy more. She purses her lips and I smile in victory. At least food and coffee are necessities. I add that just to twist the knife. She pinches my side in retaliation but nods. Fine. She looks less happy than I do. Thanks, love, for looking out for our future. I bend down and kiss her cheek and she smiles happily. Who knew I married such a cheapskate? Cheapskate Melly is very responsible. Right now, 1950s Melly is going to pack you lunch. Tonight, slutty Melly will rock your world. She walks away and pours coffee in a black to-go mug. Who knew there were so many of you in there? Maybe I should have you committed. Very funny. If you do that, you'll miss out on slutty Melly. I wouldn't want to do that. I love you, she yells to my retreating back. Love you too, cheapskate. And do you think 1950s Melly can make me breakfast? 35. Melly. Oh, you have something to show you, love, Adam says. His facial expression gives nothing away. His blue eyes are clear as always. But my husband does not offer me a smile. He doesn't give me his trademark playful smirk either. I minimize my spreadsheet and close my laptop. My eyes follow Adam while he walks to the bedroom. I get up to follow him, but only make it halfway down the hall until he comes out carrying my old tote bag. My eyes widen in shock when I see it, and I reach for it, but Adam pulls it away. Uh-uh, love, he says. Your days with this bag of dicks are over. A laugh escapes, and I cover my mouth with my hand, but Adam doesn't laugh back. In fact, he looks irritated. Something flashes in his eyes, and his jaw ticks. He opens the bag, but I lunge for it. He takes one step back and holds the bag over his head, making it impossible for me to get to it. He pulls out an unopened box and peels off a sticky note from it. Let's hope this one does a better job of getting out the cobwebs than what's-his-name did the other night. Ananda. He crumples the note in his hand and tosses it on the floor before he slowly pulls the long, purple dildo out of the bag. Care to explain, wife? His voice is low, almost deadly, and I inadvertently take a step back. I cross my arms and meet his hard stare. Care to explain why you're going through my stuff, husband? He smiles, showing off his perfect white teeth. I like it when you call me husband, and no, I don't care to explain, not beyond finding this bag shoved in the back of the closet. Neither do I. I cross my arms and stare in his face. He waves the dildo around and says, Explain. I think a dildo is pretty self-explanatory. Oh, so you're going to be a smart ass. We mean the note, damn it. He grinds his teeth and his jaws tick again. I don't answer, and he speaks. My imagination is running wild, Mel. If I'm reading between the lines, Ananda got you a dildo because you fucked some guy who didn't know how to satisfy you. Is that right? I leave this question unanswered and walk to the fridge. I pull out a cold bottle of water and pray that he drops the subject. It won't matter to him that this happened way before we got married, before we were anything. I curse myself for not hiding the bag better. I finally close the fridge door and turn around, only to practically collide with his chest. I walk around him and sit on the couch. As soon as I do, he approaches and sits so close to me, our thighs touch. He rummages through the bag and pulls everything out. Look at this one. He turns it on and the pink vibrator starts to shake. On this one. He turns on the switch and the vibrating tongue starts to dart in and out. And this is my personal favorite. He holds the dildo Ananda gave me in the air. 
This is the one that came with the note. I shrug and put the bottle of water to my lips. He inches closer, throws an arm across my shoulders, and kisses my cheek. It's kind of funny, love. I'm not mad. I mean, if you needed to get off, all you had to do was knock on my door. He smiles at me, and I relax, laying my head on his shoulder. I haven't used that stuff in months. Oh, I do a good job of keeping you satisfied. I laugh at his arrogance. He bends down and kisses my temple, and I sigh. You do. You're the best at it. Oh, I guess whoever forced Ananda to get you this purple beauty couldn't get the job done. He laughs out loud, and so do I. I'm so relieved that he's not being irrational about it. I say, not even close. I let out another laugh. Adam doesn't say anything back, but I sigh at the feel of his fingertips on my arm. It was over in record time. It was all a big nothing, not memorable at all. When? One word, but that single word makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The gentle touch on my arm stops, and he's gone completely rigid. When? He repeats again, when I don't answer. Over two years ago. It was maybe a month after you moved in here. We weren't anything. I'd only seen you maybe twice at that point. You could hear a pin drop in the living room. He stands abruptly, grabs the bag, and starts to walk away. Adam, come on. I start to follow him, but I jump in surprise when he punches a wall. You went out and fucked a guy, Mel? I've wanted you since the moment I laid eyes on you, and you go out and do this? He runs a hand through his hair and starts to pace. Adam, we weren't together. We weren't anything. And don't yell at me. I lunge for the bag, but he sidesteps me and holds the bag over his head. My argument does nothing to calm him down. He closes the space between us and looms in front of me. I put my hands on my hips and stare in his face. His blue eyes are like a storm. His nostrils flare. He takes an abrupt step back and yanks the door open. Where are you going? Oh, I'm going to get rid of this shit. He points to the bag. What? Why? A lot of couples use sex toys together. What's the big deal? You think I'm going to fuck you with a plastic dick? He storms out and slams the door behind him. I stand there, stunned, and rest my head in my hand. I didn't even remember that time. Damn Ananda and her stupid fucking note. A rational person wouldn't be upset, but Adam's not rational. At least not when it comes to me and another man. It takes him 20 minutes to come back. I'm still standing in the middle of the living room when he bursts through the front door and says, Boy drove it somewhere and dumped it. You'll never see that tote bag again. I roll my eyes to the ceiling and turn away from him, not sure how to handle the raving madman in front of me right now. I only make it two steps before I feel his hand on my elbow. He spins me around and lifts me off my feet. Let's get a few things straight, wife. He carries me to the bedroom and closes the door behind us. Was that the last time you were with a man who isn't me? Yes, Adam. I cross my arms and wait. No more plastic dicks or vibrating wands. I get you off. Me. These hands. He raises both huge hands up. This mouth and tongue. He comes close and runs his tongue along my bottom lip. He bites it and sucks. My panties instantly moisten. On this dick. He places both my hands on his hard cock. He picks me up again and tosses me on the bed. I'm going to make you come with each of them right now. He lands on top of me and his mouth crashes on mine. He's hungry for me. His kiss is deep. He's kissing me as if this is our first and our last kiss. He leaves my mouth long enough to suck the base of my neck. I curse at the sensation, and I mentally prepare myself to wear a scarf around my neck for the next few days. Off, he mutters that word right before his hand lands on the elastic waist of my yoga pants. I kick the offending pants and underwear off. He jumps off the bed long enough to undress. By the time he's naked, so am I, and I'm spread eagle on the bed, 
eagerly waiting for him. His lips land on mine again, and his hands slide between my legs. Two fingers find their way inside my warm slit. I moan his name and wrap a leg around him. He fucks me with two fingers and rubs my clit with his thumb. He roughly sucks a nipple into his mouth, and I come on his fingers. He traces his tongue up my sternum to my mouth. That's one. He kisses my mouth gently. I get no chance to come down from my high. He licks his way south this time, tracing his tongue all the way to my spread thighs. He teases my pussy until I cry out his name, but he has no mercy on me. He licks and sucks until I come on his tongue. That's two. He rolls me on my side and slides in behind me. Adam, I say breathless, I don't know if I can come again. My heart rate hasn't calmed down, and I'm still riding the high of the second orgasm. He lifts my leg and enters me from behind. You can, love, and you will. Now, tell me who rules this body. He gives me the long, slow, and deep strokes that I love. My eyes roll to the back of my head at the feel of him inside of me. Tell me who owns this pussy. Who? He asks again. You, Adam. Only you. 36. Melly. The balloons bounce along the wall, and my heart thumps so loud, I'm afraid the nurses can hear it. It's been a hell of a day. Alex called me at 10 o'clock in the morning, claiming she was having contractions. Jason was already at work and in the operating room. When I got downstairs, she was leaning over the kitchen table while my mother rubbed her back. Addie was in the middle of the kitchen crying. Her water broke in my car on the way to the hospital. I remember the look on her face and the liquid seeping into the cloth seats and dripping down Alex's leggings. She reached over and grabbed my hand, squeezing it as tears streamed down her reddened cheeks. Things only worsened when we arrived at the hospital. The doctors rushed Alex into the operating room for an emergency C-section when they discovered the baby was breech and her heart rate had dropped. Jason walked in right as they were wheeling Alex away, and I've never seen my brother so afraid before. His knees almost buckled. It was only when I grabbed his hand, pulled him into a hug, and told him everything would be okay that he relaxed. It didn't take long, though. He changed into fresh scrubs and went into the operating room, only this time he wasn't the surgeon. He was the worried husband and father. Even now, knowing that she's out of surgery and in a private room, my heart won't stop thumping. My knees turn to jelly in the middle of the hallway, and my husband stops right along with me. You want me to carry you, love? I look into his blue eyes and wrap my arms around him. The balloons hit him in the face, but he shoves them away and squeezes me in his arms, saying soothing words. I was so scared, Adam, and you weren't there. My eyes fill with tears, but he swipes them away. He cups my face, and I bite my bottom lip and will the tears to stay at bay. We got here as fast as I could, Mel. And he did. He was here thirty minutes after I sent the texts. I don't think I would have made it without him. Despite having Tina, Ananda, and Alex's father here, I was only slightly relaxed when Adam got here and took me into his arms. You did. It's just been an emotional day. I exhale and brush my bangs off my forehead. Let's go meet our niece. He takes my hand in his and leads me this time. He's my pillar of strength, the minute he found me in the waiting room, he pulled me into his arms as if I was the one in distress. We knock on the door, and he slowly pushes it open. He stops walking when I do. I stick my head inside, and when I see Alex in the bed, dressed in her own nightgown, glowing while holding a pink bundle, I sag in relief before walking into the room. Jason hugs me tight, and I feel tears again. They fall freely this time. Thanks for being there, Melly. He kisses my head. Jason's best friend and his wife walk in. He's holding a huge bouquet of pink flowers, and she has a big brown paper bag in her hand. My mother and Addison walk in right behind them. 
Mommy! Edison screams. She pulls her hand from my mother's and starts to run to Alex, but Jason catches her before she can get a chance to jump on the bed. You have to be careful and not jump on Mommy, Jason says to her. He walks to the bed and gently lays Addison next to Alex. So, I'm glad everyone is here. We had a bit of a scare today, but my sister saved the day. All I did was drive her here, Jason, I say. You did more than that. You stayed calm. You had a clear head, and Alex told me you made sure she didn't freak out. Adam puts a hand on my shoulder and gently massages it. So... Now that we have everyone here, we want to introduce you to Baby Dupree. Please tell us you finally gave this baby a name, Jake says. She's always had a name. We just wanted it to be a surprise. Well, tell us, son, my mother orders. What's my new granddaughter's name? Everyone, meet Melanie Christina Dupree. I let go of the balloons and they hit the ceiling, both hands cover my mouth as I look around the room. I look at Alex and she smiles and nods her head. If this is because I drove, we picked this name as soon as we knew she was a girl, Alex says. Melanie after Jason's sister and Christina after mine. It's beautiful, Sandy says. Yes, beautiful, Tina agrees. Melly and Adam, we want you to be the godparents. Jason says. Can I hold her? Alex nods, and I walk to the hospital bed. Adam drags a chair close to the bed, and Alex places the tiny bundle in my arms. 37. Adam. My wife. I'm picking up groceries so I can make dinner. Me. Just hurry up and get here. We can order dinner. My wife. Almost done, already in line, and we need to cut back on ordering out. I toss my phone and sigh in frustration, but I pick it back up when it vibrates against the table. It's a picture of the long line at the grocery store. Of course, the line is long. We're bracing for another snowstorm in late March, and my wife has completely lost her mind. True to her word, she's packed me a lunch every day except Fridays. Between our wedding, honeymoon, and saving for a house, she makes sure every penny is accounted for. The good news is we're due for a warm-up in a few days, so the snow won't last long. But all I want now is for my wife to come home so we can cuddle on the couch and ride out the storm together. It's barely three in the afternoon, but the skies have turned gray and flurries are already falling. Instead of looking outside and waiting for my wife, I decide to take care of the rainforest she's brought into this apartment. I water the string of pearls hanging above the kitchen window and check the soil of the English ivy and the aloe. I watered the ones in the bathroom earlier, so I know they're okay. I sit on the couch and cross my arms, desperately missing Mel. We spent almost the entire night downstairs. Jason had to go into work due to a car accident, and little Mel spent the entire night crying. We all took turns rocking her to sleep. Now I'm sleepy, but can't fall asleep without my wife in my arms. Who knew being married could be so amazing? Even the nights that we spend on the couch watching TV or talking are better than anything I've ever experienced. To kill some time, I leave the couch and busy myself straightening our bedroom and bathroom. I've never been a slob, but Mel likes everything to be extremely neat. Fifteen minutes later, I cheer in excitement when I hear a knock on the door. Expecting to find my wife on the other side holding several grocery bags, I yank the door open without bothering to look through the peephole. The smile on my face slips as soon as I look into the familiar blue eyes. I see those eyes every time I look in the mirror and every time I see a picture of my father. And now here they are, in the flesh. I push the door closed, but he grabs it and steps inside. I didn't invite you in, I say through clenched teeth. I take a step closer and enjoy the fact that even though we look so much alike, I still have about an inch of height on him. It's barely an inch, but I'm still taller. And broader, though I can tell he keeps in good shape. And yet, here I am. The voice makes me cringe. He sounds just like our dead father. Leave my apartment. I step back, not wanting to get any closer to him. I've told you that I'm not interested in whatever it is you're after. 
And if you think I'm after money... He holds a hand up, indicating for me to stop talking, and I seethe. Don't silence me, I warn. Why would I think you're after money? You've made it clear that you're not, and Dad left you plenty. He did a good job of hiding it, but the money trail led us straight to you. Is this what this is about? You want the money? The joke's on you, asshole, because I never wanted it. But I'll give it all to charity or burn it before I'd his brows furrow and he takes an angry step closer. I can feel the rage radiating from his body, and at this moment I don't care. In fact, I want him to throw a punch so I can take all my anger out on him. But it's not his fist that he uses. It's his eyes. He stands still and examines my face. I feel like a specimen under his gaze. I turn my back to him, unable to stand his stares any longer. He even smells like our father. I told you I'd be here. His voice sounds less smug than it did over the phone, but there's still a hint of arrogance. You're taller than I thought you would be. The tinge of amusement in his voice surprises me. Not willing to be cowed in my own home, I turn to him. You're exactly like I thought you'd be. So, you've thought of me then. I don't know if you're aware, but there's going to be a snowstorm tonight. You should just go wherever the hell you came from before traffic in this city comes to a standstill. I walk past him and open the door. You've seen me. You want to take a picture for your sister? She's your sister, too. She's the one who found you. Found me. I wasn't lost. He makes no move to leave. In fact, he walks around the place, running his hands over the furniture. He even arches an eyebrow when he sees Lola. Why are you so hostile? Why can't you take a hint? I ask. Your voice is just like his, he says. No, that's you. There's a picture we have at the house in Montauk of father when he was around your age. You're a spitting image. Can you be more offensive? I ask him. You think I want to be like that asshole? You think I want to be some rich prick who takes advantage of and lies to women much younger than he is? You think I'm the type of guy who would cheat on his wife and stash another family out of sight? Hide us like we're some dirty little secret. But it's okay, right? Because he has all the cash in the world and can write any check. I can feel the color creeping up my neck. The last time I got this angry was when I was woke up to find my wife had abandoned me the morning after our wedding. I punched the wall then, and right now I'd really like to punch him in the face. No. I don't imagine you would. That's all he says. Nothing more, and I find his lacking response has mollified my anger. At least for the time being. You're stubborn like him, too. And that gets me to take a step closer to him, ready to push him against the wall and unleash all my anger. You don't intimidate me. I'm the same size as you. I'm taller, I hiss. I get the fuck out of my apartment before I throw you out the damn window. I just got here, and I'm not leaving until we have a conversation. I told you I'd come to you. I gave you every opportunity to control the situation. You gave me. I don't need you to give me shit. You might run that damn company. You might be the mighty fucking Ethan Henry Bradford III. But you're not shit to me. I'm your brother, he says, as if that should resolve everything. We share a father. We share DNA. We share a sister who has been losing sleep for months over you. You were never our dirty little secret, only the little brother we never had a chance to know. I'm going to say it again. We just want a chance to get to know you. You can make that as easy or as difficult as you want, but we're not going away. The asshole finally steps away from me, walks into my kitchen, and opens my fridge. The ball's on this guy. He very audaciously pulls out the half-finished bottle of that disgustingly sweet wine that Mel drinks. What the hell are you doing? I ask him. Well, you didn't offer me anything to drink. It's probably not a bad thing, considering your terrible taste in wine. Don't worry. Big brother to the rescue. I'll send you a case of the best stuff. He puts the wine back and pulls out a bottle of water. After drinking half of it, he puts it down and starts to unbutton his coat. 
I'm half a second away from grabbing him by the collar and throwing him out when I hear the keys jingling in the front door. My stomach drops at the prospect of Mel walking in on this. Of all the ways I imagined her finding out, this didn't make the list. The plan was to sit her down and tell her, but after we returned from our honeymoon. I look around and consider throwing him in the closet, but it's too late. The door opens and then shuts. Adam! She does that thing where she mimics the way Uncle Finn says my name. The grocery store was a disaster, but 1950s Millie's gonna make a delicious dinner. Slutty Millie will take over for the dessert portion of the evening and let you have your way with her. Remember that thing you did the other night when you threw my leg over? I know exactly what she's talking about, and my mouth goes completely dry at the exact moment she sees our guest. She gasps and stops short at the sight of him. I run to her and take the bags out of her hands. I didn't know we had company. She looks from me to him, likely waiting for me to make an introduction, but I have no idea what to say. Then something clicks on her face. Her brows furrow and she takes a step closer to him. She looks from him to me and her mouth opens in shock. Adam, who is this and why is he a clone of you? I stare at her and do my best to come up with a reasonable explanation. Why the hell is there a clone of you in our kitchen? She asks again. Well, I'm older, so he would be a clone of me, the jerk says. I'm Ethan Bradford, and your husband is my little brother. He offers Mel his hand and she takes it. Her hand goes limp and she continues to look back and forth at us. Ethan Bradford? The Bradco CEO? The CEO of the world's biggest discount chain? That Ethan Bradford? The bag in my hand drops to the floor. You know who Ethan Bradford is, I ask, when I finally regain my ability to speak. Yeah, I used to... Whatever she was going to say got lost, and she shakes her head as if trying to make sense of something. Did Ethan Bradford just say that you and he are brothers? But you're an only child. I'm my mother's only child. I stubbornly maintain my position. Well, unfortunately for your husband, we share a father. You do understand you have two sides to your family, right? Can you shut up and get the hell out of here? He has the nerve to smirk at me, but when I take two small steps in his direction, Mel grabs my wrist and stops my advance. She pulls me into the corner opposite Ethan. Did you just find out about him? That he's your brother? She lowers her voice and points a finger at my unwanted guest. He stands there watching us and craning his neck. I can't meet his gaze, and my silence is all the answer she needs. I see she whispers. He's nothing to me. I reach for her, but she takes a step back. But you knew. I asked you, Adam. She looks at Ethan again, taking her time studying him. Part of me wants to turn her around so she can look at me, not him. When she finally turns to me again, I know she's noting the similarities between us. I knew there was a resemblance from the few pictures I've seen, but I didn't realize how many similarities there are until he knocked on the door. There's no denying that we are closely related. I told you he doesn't matter. Well, that hurts, considering we've been calling you for months, he says. We? And I guess I know who that New York number belongs to. We have a sister, Ethan says. Her name is Elizabeth, he adds. Will you shut up? I yell. Mel steps between us, places a hand on my chest and holds me in place. I feel a sense of comfort from her touch, but when I try and hold her hand, she drops it. I need to speak to my husband alone for a minute, she says to Ethan. She doesn't hold my hand like she does each time we go to the bedroom. She's ready for bed before me every night, but she never wants to go to bed alone. She always offers me her hand, and I'll lead her to the bedroom. It's become our nightly tradition. But right now, she's avoiding my touch. And I don't like it. 38. Adam. This kind of explains a lot, she says the minute she closes the door behind us. Your lackadaisical attitude about money. The American Express. 
she says, lowering her voice as if she's telling me some secret. This. She holds up her left hand and points at her diamond ring. She starts to take it off, but I grab her hand in mine. Don't you dare take that off, wife. She stares at me, eyes wide, almost as if she's taken aback by my audacity. But I don't back down. I won't ever back down when it comes to her wearing the ring I put on her finger. Don't you dare pull that shit. Not when you've been lying to me the entire time. <sighs> I've lied about nothing, I say with a derisive snort. I don't give a shit about that guy out there and want nothing to do with him. I'm Molly Flynn's son, her only child. That's the goddamn truth. So you're a billionaire now? The entire time you were living here like a frat boy as if it was some kind of rebellion. Is that what I am? Are you using me to make them mad? I picture ten different ways I'm going to make that guy pay as soon as we leave this bedroom. Each one more painful than the last. I'm not a Bradford. I'm a Flynn. And no, I'm not a billionaire. And honestly, Mel, I don't know what you mean when you accuse me of using you. This, I say, pointing to the door. That guy out there. It changes absolutely nothing. She wraps her arms around herself, and I'd give anything to have her in my arms right now. But she's not making any move to walk closer to me. I don't even know you. She sits on the bed and puts her face in both hands. Don't be so damn dramatic. My tone comes out sharper than I intend. Yes, I should feel contrite because I can spin this any way I want. But the truth is, I lied. I'm the same person I was before he showed up here. Why is he here now? I sit next to her, but she moves so our bodies don't touch. I let out a loud breath, roll my eyes to the ceiling, and realize I have no choice but to tell her everything. <sighs> I've always known about them. For as long as I can remember, I've known. She turns to me, her face shocked at my confession. But they only found out about me last year. I guess one of them did some digging on our dead father and found a money trail to my mother. I told you he's always taken care of me financially. He paid for expensive private schools and college. The call started last May. So, almost a year ago. I nod. I answered the first call. It was a shock, really. I remember not knowing what to say. It wasn't him that called. It was the girl. I find myself unable to utter her name or our connection. You mean your sister, Elizabeth, Mel clarifies. Whatever she is, she called. I told her I wasn't interested and not to call again. Then he called and left a message. There were daily calls, multiple calls per day. Letters, text messages, even a letter from their lawyer. A few months ago, he called. It was after we got married and you were in bed. I answered and told him to fuck off. That was the first time we ever talked. He texted a few days later saying he'd be in Boston this month and wanted to meet. I texted back no. The calls weren't as frequent, but they continued right up until he showed up here this afternoon. She nods but stays quiet. Needing to touch her, I run the back of my hand on her cheek. She doesn't move away, but I don't get the reaction I want. Why didn't you tell me? She searches my face as if I'm a stranger she's trying to get to know. I take her hand and put it on my chest. I don't like to talk about my father, and they are a part of him. You're a part of him, too. I said I don't like to talk about him. She gasps at my loud tone and pulls away from me. I stand up abruptly and start to pace the room. The topic is off limits. Always. I've told you as much as I'm willing to share. She stands too, but she doesn't cower. She closes the distance and points her index finger in my chest. Well, the part of your life that's off limits is in our kitchen. She turns her back to me then, and I imagine she's trying to gather her thoughts. I know her. I know this is far from over. Where did you get this? She asks, pointing at the ring. Tiffany's in Las Vegas. So it's real. You think I would put a fake diamond on your finger? How much did it cost? I'm not going to dignify that with a response. I can look it up, she threatens. 
then look it up. But I'm not going to be the one who tells you. That's obvious. You don't tell me a lot of things. If you're not part of the Bradford fortune, how did you pay for this ring? And don't tell me some bullshit about having a job. I take a deep breath and say, He left me money when he died. I didn't want it. Still don't. I was going to give it all to charity, but Ma begged me not to. She said if I didn't use it for myself, then save it for my children. I used some of the money to buy your ring. It was the first time I ever spent a penny of it. The room is eerily quiet after my admission. I open my eyes and she's staring into my face as if she doesn't even know me. Let me guess, she finally says. Fifty million dollars. When I nod, she walks around me, opens the door and walks out. I run behind her, but she runs down the hall and opens the front door. I'm getting out of here. Don't follow me. I don't want to hear another word out of your lying mouth. She grabs her purse from the floor, steps out, and slams the door so hard the paintings on the wall shake. Mel! I open the door, but she's already at the bottom of the stairwell. With the snow falling, I know she won't go any farther than the apartment below. In fact, I'm convinced of it when I see her car keys on the floor. I slowly close the door and turn to face my unwanted guest. He's no longer standing in the kitchen. He's sitting on the sectional, flipping through one of Mel's bridal magazines. You need to go. I need to go find my wife. I stand as far away from him as possible. I can feel the monster inside of me scratching to get out, and if I lay a hand on him, I might not be able to stop. He might be almost as tall, but I'm a trained fighter and I'm sure he's probably never thrown a punch in his entire rich, pampered life. You people are all the same. Do you know that? I don't hide the bitterness in my voice. He stands, but luckily for him, he keeps his distance. You're my brother, so you do realize you're talking about yourself, right? I don't force myself on people who have made it clear they don't want to be bothered with me. Have you ever considered that it's not always about you? Hell, it's not even about me. There are other people involved. People who have gotten hurt too much by your asshole father. Leave us alone. For the first time since he barged in here, the smug arrogance slides off his face. I don't see contrition, but it does humanize him a little bit. He takes a step closer and pulls a card out of his pocket. He writes something on it and puts it on the coffee table. Believe it or not... I didn't come here to cause trouble. We really want to know our brother. That's it. I'm here until Sunday. He picks up the card and points to it. The address is there. I really hope to see you. He puts on his coat, but he doesn't walk to the door. He stands in front of me and I study his face. It's unsettling how we can look so much like our father. He stands the same way I do. He even has the same black mole beneath his left eye like me. Unable to look any more, I avert my gaze. We're a small family. I have my sister, son, and a cousin on the West Coast we have no relationship with. That's basically all our blood relatives. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, we're your family. He has the nerve to tap me on the shoulder on his way out the front door. 39. Melly. It takes longer than usual for Alex to open the door. As soon as she does, I walk past her and go straight to her kitchen. The only alcohol in their fridge is that fancy German beer they like to drink and a bottle of champagne. Since I can't stand the taste of beer, I reach for the champagne. I don't ask if they're saving it for a special occasion before I pop it open and drink straight from the bottle. Where's your mother-in-law? I ask, lowering my voice so no one else can hear. She's in her room. Where's Addie? She's in the bedroom watching cartoons with Jason. What's wrong? She signals for me to follow her. I walk behind her until she reaches the laundry room. She pulls a bunch of tiny pink clothes out of the dryer and fills a laundry basket with them. I grab the basket from her and we return to the living room. Adam is a big fat liar. I hiss. Turns out, I know absolutely nothing about the man I stupidly married. I bet I can get an annulment now. He's a fraud. 
Alex holds a pink onesie in the air, seemingly frozen. Adam? You're Adam? What the hell are you talking about? She raises her eyebrows to the middle of her forehead, and for a split second, I debate telling her. Her hair's a mess, and it looks like she has spit up on her shoulder. She's in gray sweats that have clearly seen better days. There are also bags under her eyes. Don't stop now. What do you mean he's a fraud? She probes. He's been keeping an entire part of his life from me. Honestly, Alex, I don't know how I can ever believe a word he says. You'll never guess what. My words die in my throat when the door opens and shuts. From the heavy footsteps, I know it can only be one person. They continue until they reach the kitchen. His eyes find me immediately, and even though I don't look up and busy myself with folding tiny baby clothes, I can feel his eyes on me. Hey, Alex, he says, as if this is just another visit. How's little Mel? Other than having her days and nights mixed up, she's great. Let's go home, Big Mel. You promised me dinner, and I'm hungry. Before I can tell him to get lost, I hear a door open. I keep my mouth shut but breathe a sigh of relief when Jason, and not my mother, shows up. Hey, guys, you staying for dinner? I ordered Chinese, and there's going to be plenty. He goes to the fridge and takes out a beer. He offers one to Adam, who surprises me by accepting it. Mel's cooking, Adam says. Don't speak for me. I don't miss the look exchanged between Jason and Alex at my sharp retort. We need to talk, love, and I'd rather not do it here. There's an edge to his voice, one I've only ever heard today, and I don't like it. I no longer believe a word that comes out of your mouth, I say back, my tone just as harsh. Mel, we're not going to do this here in front of your brother and Alex, Stop running to Jason every damn time there's something wrong. Your place is upstairs with me. Jason looks at me, takes a seat at the table, and drains his beer. He looks tired, which isn't surprising since he was at work last night, and I know little Mel hasn't been an easy baby so far. What the hell is going on now? Jason asks. Can't we go five damn minutes without any drama in this family? It's between me and my wife, Dupree. Stay out of it for once, Adam says. I can see the muscle in his cheek tick. I live here. If you want me to stay out of it, don't bring it to my house, Jason says. You're absolutely right. Let's go, Big Mel. Since when do I take orders from you, Adam? Never. I don't know why you're putting on this caveman act now, but then again, maybe that's who you are. It's not like I ever really knew you anyway. He slams the beer down so hard, some of it spills out. Are you still on that? He asks, and I look up and meet his eyes. That's bullshit, and you know it. If you come upstairs, I'll explain, and we can move the hell on. He offers me his hand, but I scrape my chair back, further away from him. You're going to tell me more lies? Oi, never fucking Lloyd. He doesn't yell, but the words are louder than they need to be. In fact... I blame him for the fact that my mother walks into the kitchen. She puts a hand on her chest as if she's surprised to see us. Goodness, I had no idea everyone was here. What's all the fuss about? Of course, she looks at me when she asks the question. Just here to get my wife, Adam says. You do that a lot, don't you? I remember you were looking for her my first night here. His body goes rigid and his footsteps stall. He turns slowly and faces my mother. His jaw ticks again, and I know he's holding back. I can feel his anger from here. Whether it's because I left, or because of his unwanted guests, or a combination of both, his simmering rage is close to eruption. What's your point, lady? He asks quietly, way too quiet for the anger oozing out of him. Don't get smart with my mom, Flynn, Jason says. As long as she minds her business, I won't, Adam says back. It's my business. This is my family. Melanie is my daughter. Oh, please, I say to my mother. I stand between her and my husband. Your fake concern is giving me a cavity. It's not fake, Melanie. Something is off with the two of you. I'm not blind. 
It's time someone tells me what the hell is going on here, but I know you won't. Jason, what's the truth? I cut my eyes at my brother, and he looks like a deer in headlights. He slowly sets his beard down and rubs the back of his head. If you want to ask Melly about something, she's right there, Mom. Jason picks up the beer again and drains it. My mom opens her mouth as if she's in shock by Jason's rebuke. She looks at me again, and her eyes narrow when she sees my smirk. Proud that you've managed to turn your brother against me? Really? How the hell did I do that? I didn't realize I had that much power. I stand up this time, ready to take my rage and frustration out on her. Jason must sense it because he stands up too. He's going along with this farce of a marriage or wedding or whatever the hell you want to call what you two are doing. What we're doing is minding our own damn business, lady, Adam says. He stands next to me and wraps a protective arm around me. Sounds to me like you have enough of your own problems to worry about. Don't worry about my wife. She's fine. Flynn, I told you to shut up. Jason walks over and stands in front of Adam. Tell her to shut up, Adam says back. Melanie, I'm not the least bit surprised that you would end up with someone as disrespectful as him. She points to Adam as if saying his name is beneath her. You two are a farce. When this all blows up, I won't be around to pick up the pieces. Adam drops his hand and takes a step closer to her, but I stand between them. Mom, that's enough. Jason warns. When have you ever been around to pick up the pieces for me? To pick them apart? Sure. To criticize and lay blame? Yeah, all day, every day. But to actually offer me a shoulder and understanding? That only extends to your son. She gasps and steps back as if struck. I don't need or want anything from you, mother. Least of all your fake concern. Melly, enough. Don't say something you'll regret. Jason warns. The only thing I regret is that she moved here, and she's doing it again. She's slowly coming between us just like she did when we were kids with the constant favoritism. I'm not doing it anymore. I can no longer live here, and I honestly don't want anything to do with you, I say, pointing at our mother. You've always been and will always be toxic where I'm concerned. Oh, where are you going to go? With this wedding nonsense and the new furniture, you can't afford to go anywhere. He gave you a fake diamond ring. He couldn't even afford to furnish his own damn apartment. You had to do it for him. And on your dime, I bet. A few years ago, I would have unshed tears in my eyes at her dismissal, but not today. Today, I let out a laugh. I hold out my hand and admire my rings. How do you always manage to get everything wrong where I'm concerned? The question throws my mother off, and she looks around the kitchen as if confused. Don't disparage my husband. He has a job, and so do I. Jason and Alex asked me to be here, unlike you who just barged in. Thank goodness for your son, the only child you ever wanted, because if it were up to me, you'd be living in your car. Melly. That's unfair, Jason says. She never said I was the only kid she's ever wanted. I know you two have your issues, but... Dupree, for a supposedly brilliant doctor, you're either dumb or blind. Maybe both, Adam says. Shut up, Melanie. Just shut your damn mouth, my mother hisses. She looks around the kitchen like a cornered animal. Make me shut up, mother. I dare you. She takes a step back and looks to Jason for help. I walk to my brother, point to him, and say, We have our issues, Jason? You're giving me part of the blame for this fucked-up relationship? Really? It's my fault that I've never been good enough for her? It's my fault that all she ever does is hurt me? My voice turns to venom when I look at Jason in the eye, and all those years of resentment that I thought had buried resurface. Some things never change. You've succeeded, Mother. Congratulations. I practically yell. I'm out of here as soon as we can find another place to live. I'll sleep in the goddamn train station before I live under the same roof as you. Don't you people ever stop? 
Alex yells. All you do is fight. Diane, do you have to take every opportunity to antagonize Melly? It's such a waste. You have two amazing kids. If you took your head out of Jason's ass long enough, you'd realize it. She spins on her heels and walks out of the kitchen. My mother is stunned silent by Alex's rant. She looks around the room, her chin jutted out in defiance. What are you talking about, mother? What is it that you don't want Melly to tell me? Jason demands to know. My mother visibly pales. She even stumbles a little bit and holds onto the table for support, but she's not down for long before she straightens up and says, I don't know. She's just making trouble as per usual, she says. I scoff and toss my hands in the air. Adam is not so gracious. You're a goddamn liar, lady. He takes a step closer to my mother. But I think this time your precious Jason will finally see you for who you really are. Tell him, Mel. I grab Adam's hand and say, Adam, it doesn't matter. He needs to know, Mel, because if he defends her one more time, I don't know if I'll be able to stop myself from ripping him apart. Tell me what, Jason says, moving closer to our mother. Whatever it is, I want to hear it from you, Mom. Jason takes her elbow to keep her in place when she tries to walk out of the kitchen. Right now. You need to tell me right the hell now. I don't know what she's talking about. Her voice trembles, but she casts her eyes down, almost as if she is too ashamed to look at Jason. The doorbell rings, and we all look around, stunned at the interruption. Alex returns and gets the food from the delivery man. Addie comes and starts to climb on her high chair. Adam picks her up and puts her in it. If you people don't mind, I want to feed my daughter dinner. Alex slams the bag on the table and grabs plates from the cabinet. I've lost my appetite, I say, and I need to talk to my mother. Jason takes hold of our mother's elbow and marches her down the hall. We hear a door slam. I'm so damn sick of all of this, Alex says. So sick of all the fighting. Everything was great until she showed up. Alex rubs a shaky hand to her forehead. She opens her mouth to say more, but the shouting from the back of the apartment shuts her up. How the hell could you say something like that? What is the matter with you? Loud weeping follows Jason's bellow. No, don't touch me. A door opens and slams, then heavy footsteps fill the hall. Jason's eyes are red with rage, something I've never seen from him before. He pulls open the coat closet and grabs his jacket and says, I need some air. He walks out the front door and slams it behind him so hard, the walls shake. My mother comes running down the hall, tears staining her face. She stops short when she sees us, but only long enough to wipe her tears and run to her room. Addie starts to cry, and Alex picks her up. It's a total fucking shit show around here. I'm so damn sick of it. 40. Melly. I'm sorry, Alex. She ignores me while she balances Addison in her arms. I walk out of the kitchen through the living room and out the front door. I barely make it halfway up the stairs before Adam catches up to me. He tries to grab my hand, but I pull away when I barge through the front door. I take a quick look out the window while I walk to the bedroom. It's completely dark now, but right by the streetlight, I can see the snow falling out of the sky. The cars below are covered, as is the sidewalk, but I don't care. I burst through the bedroom, the door hitting the wall so hard, I know it will leave a dent. I bend down and pull out the suitcase I keep under the bed. When I get to the dresser, I open a drawer, pull out all the clothes, and toss them in the bag. Before I can do the same with another drawer, Adam snatches the bag from me and tosses it across the room. It bangs against the wall and lands on the hardwood floor with a hard crash. You're not leaving me, Mel. His voice is low, almost quiet, but I don't miss the danger simmering underneath. I need to clear my head for the night. I don't want to be under the same roof as you, I tell him. Too bad. Your days of running away when things get hard or uncomfortable are over. We're going to deal with this right now. What are you going to do? Hold me hostage in this bedroom? 
No, I'm going to cook dinner, and when you're done acting like a child, you can come out so we can talk like adults. I open my mouth to respond to his condescending tone, but he opens the door, walks out, and closes it behind him. I don't stay in the room for long. Just as he slams a skillet on the oven burner, I approach. Don't you dare turn this around on me when you're the one who lied. I stand next to him, suddenly itching for a fight. Oh, I didn't lie. I told you I'm my mother's only child. She's the only parent who loves me. She's the one who has taken care of me my entire life. I don't know those people, and I barely knew my father when he was alive. And I already told you, I don't like talking about it. Drop it. For no reason at all, he picks up the skillet and slams it down again. He walks to the fridge and yanks it open so hard, I'm afraid he'll damage the hinges. I told you all the shit with my mother, Adam. I told you about the most hurtful thing she's ever done. You lied to me every time I asked you about the New York number and you told me that your father had no kids. And all this time, you let me believe you were struggling financially. You never once... Hold on there, Melanie. Hold on one goddamn minute. I know you're having a pity party of one, but I never told you I had no siblings. I told you I was my mother's only child. That's the truth. And I never said I was struggling financially. Not once. You came to that conclusion on your own. And when the hell was I supposed to tell you? Before or after you did one of your spreadsheets? Before or after you told me you were looking for equality in this marriage? Before or after you figured out we're in the same bracket? Whatever the fuck that means. We're equal because we say we are. Not because of how much money we bring in. You're the one with the ridiculous ideas in your head. And look in the mirror, sweetheart. If you want to talk about liars... My head rolls back as if slapped. I take a deep breath and slowly approach him. His back is still to me while he rummages through the fridge. Excuse me? Now I'm the liar? Stunned by his accusation, I stand behind him and wait for an explanation. You've always been the liar. He closes the fridge door, turns to me and says, Look at me in the eye and tell me you were drunk the night we got married. My mouth opens, but suddenly it feels like it's filled with cotton. I lick my lips and stare into my husband's eyes. I... I take another deep breath. I... Nothing comes out. You what? You can't say it, can you? The minute you woke up, you ran like a scared rabbit and lied to your family. Said that I got you drunk and tricked you into marriage, when the truth is... You're the one who asked me to marry you. A newsflash, wife, you weren't drunk. I refuse to acknowledge the truth of his words. You're not going to turn this around on me. And for the record, Adam, the answer is before. You should have told me that you're a millionaire before I did the spreadsheets, before I talked about being equal, and before I started waking up at the butt-ass crack of dawn to make you lunch so we can save for a house. You've made such a damn fool of me. Oh, I'm done talking about it. Now you know. That asshole did me a favor. Now I can stop tiptoeing around the money issue. And I love those things about you, Mel. I love cheapskate Mel because she's willing to sacrifice for our future. I'm crazy about 1950s Mel, who always leaves a sweet little note in my lunch. And I can't keep my hands off slutty Mel. I loved learning about you that way. I shake my head, too far gone in my anger to listen to his reasoning. Whatever, Adam. What's the real reason you kept this from me? Did you think I would be after your money? Oh, for fuck's sake, Melanie Flynn. He slams the skillet again. I married you without a prenup. You want the damn money? Take it. Oh, I don't give a shit about it. He opens the fridge again and looks inside. After a few minutes, where the only sound is the rapid beating of my heart, he looks at me and asks, Do you want chicken or beef for dinner? His tone is back to normal, signaling that he's done with this conversation. I don't respond. I turn on my heels, return to the bedroom, and slam the door behind me, locking it this time. Forty-five minutes later, while I'm lying on the bed staring at the ceiling, he turns the knob. When met with the lock... He pounds one of his massive fists on the door. Dinner's ready. Open the fucking door.
I ignore him. In fact, I turn on the TV and turn the volume on full blast, but that does little to drown out the pounding. He stops a few seconds later, and just when I think he's gone, he knocks the door off its hinges. He stands in the middle of the room, looking like a man possessed. I try to scoot off the bed, but he reaches for me and grabs my hands. Once he's pulled me up, he throws me over his shoulder as if I'm nothing more than a bag of dirty laundry and carries me to the kitchen. He sits down, puts me on his lap, and wraps an arm around my waist to keep me in place. He reaches for my plate and puts it in front of me. Boy made steak since you don't like the way I cook chicken, is all he says. He eats his vegetables and sweet potatoes with one hand, but when it's time to eat a steak, instead of letting me go so he can use a knife and fork, he picks up the steak with his free hand and eats it like a caveman. My stomach growls. I haven't eaten since breakfast. Tonight was supposed to be a romantic night of being snowed in with my husband. I was supposed to make him dinner, and we were going to spend the night making love either on the couch or in the bedroom. Some nights, he'll spread a blanket out on the rug in front of the TV, and we'll make love on the floor. But today has turned into a complete shit show. My stomach growls again. I sigh, reach for my fork, and eat. He only lets me go after I take my last bite. I clear the table and clean up. He doesn't try to talk to me again. While I straighten the kitchen, he sits on the couch and turns on the news. While the weatherman talks about the storm, I walk away and take a shower, hoping it will clear my mind. It doesn't. By the time I come out and put on pajamas, I'm more hurt and confused than when I went in. I'm supposed to meet with the baker on Saturday to sample the different cakes. Last weekend, when I looked at flowers with Molly and Ananda, I cheapened out because I had to pay extra for my wedding dress. Now, I just feel like a damn fool with my budgeting and penny-pinching. I open one of the spreadsheets and look at what we've already spent compared to expected expenses. I slam the laptop shut just as he walks in. He's in nothing but a green towel wrapped around his waist. Water glistens on his bare chest and droplets fall out of his damp hair. When he drops the towel, I turn away from his semi-hard cock. Still giving me the soylent treatment, huh? Okay. When he goes to the drawer to look for his clothes, I grab an extra blanket and pillow from the top of the closet. You are sleeping in our bed, he orders. My bed. When I first moved in here, you said the bed was mine. You're the one who is sleeping on the couch. You can sleep on your weight bench for all I care. I slam the blanket and pillow on his chest, and he looks at me dumbfounded. Not happening. He tosses them across the room and gets on his side of the bed. Since there's no way I'm sleeping with him, I grab the pillow and blanket and leave. I'd slam the door, but it's already hanging off the hinges. I barely have time to get situated on the couch before he comes stomping. You're so damn immature, he says. Come back to bed. I'm fine out here. Fine. Take the damn bed. I'll sleep out here. I hop off the couch and run to the bedroom before the words are fully out of his mouth. He doesn't follow, and I miss having his big body to cuddle with. Most nights, I end up lying right on top of him before falling asleep. As hard as his body is, He's so comfortable to sleep on. It's still relatively early, barely 10 o'clock, and instead of being wrapped around my husband, I'm alone on the massive bed. I don't know how long it takes me to fall asleep, but I know I watch television until my eyes become heavy. When I wake up hours later, my legs are spread open, and I feel something between them, warm lips and a hot tongue on my clit, I reach down and feel thick, soft hair beneath my fingertips. He spreads my legs wider and kisses the inside of my thighs. Hot, wet, opened-mouthed kisses. He bites the sensitive flesh softly, and I let out a moan. Two fingers slide inside my wet pussy, and I bite my lip at the sensation. Adam, I moan. That's right, love. Say your husband's name. 
I couldn't say his name again, even if I wanted to. His tongue swirls around my entrance right before he bites softly on my clit, and I groan loudly. It doesn't take long for me to come on his mouth. I can feel my juices oozing out. His wet lips finally leave my pussy and kiss the inside of each thigh. My heart is racing while I come down to earth. Adam's still between my legs, but when he starts to climb on top of me, I put a foot on his chest, stopping him. I purposely spread my legs wider, and he moans at the sight. He rubs the back of his knuckles along my pussy lips and pushes my leg off his chest. I can see how hard his dick is. It hits my thigh, and it's like a piece of steel. Uh-uh, I don't think so. Couch. He falls back on his naked ass and looks at me as if I'm speaking a foreign language. You're going to leave me like this? He points at his hard cock, and I admit it's huge and looking straight at me. It wouldn't take him long to explode, either inside of me or in my mouth. I do my best not to look like I'm ready to pounce in the next five seconds. I start to bite my lip, but I stop and stare at the ceiling instead. After you just came on my mouth? Thanks for that. I'll really be able to sleep now. And remember your rule, Adam. The only thing that makes that dick come is me. I lean back on my elbows and look into his face. There's a sheen of sweat on his forehead despite the cool temperatures. These hands. I raise both hands to make my point. This mouth and tongue. I slowly run my tongue over my lower lip, and he groans. This pussy. I open my legs just wide enough for him to see. And this ass. I lay on my side and run a hand down my hip and to the curve of my ass. None of which you're getting tonight. I cover myself with the comforter, shielding my naked body from his greedy eyes. He stands and his dick sticks straight out, just as hard as it was when he was trying to climb on top of me. You're a jerk. Do you know that, Mel? He stomps to the broken down door, and I can't help but admire his tight ass. I use all my willpower not to beg him to come back to bed so I can grab that ass. He punches the wall by the door, shocking me so much I let out a gasp. I'd rather be a jerk than a liar, I yell after him. You're the biggest damn liar I've ever met. You lie to yourself and everyone else. Yeah, I'm the one who lied about having $50 million. That's me, all right. I'm the Bradford heir. I hear another thud against the wall. He either punched it or kicked it. Go ahead and break your hand. I'm sure the ER nurse will love to stick a big fat needle in it. The name's Flynn, sweetheart. Same as yours, he yells. And fuck the Bradfords. 41. Melly. He didn't bother to turn off the light. I was in a sound sleep when he barged into the bedroom, turned on the light, and made a commotion of rummaging through the closet. Since the door is off the hinges, he decided to punch the wall again. That punch took me by surprise, and I stuck my head out from under the covers, only to see his naked backside walking out. I exhale and lie on my back. I hear the shower come on, and I run a hand over my messy head of hair. I didn't even bother wrapping it last night. I was too angry. I'm so not used to fighting with my husband that I've been completely off kilter since I walked into this apartment and found Ethan Bradford standing in the kitchen. And then to find out my husband is sitting on millions and is connected to one of the wealthiest families in the country— the entire fucking time I was listing all our expenses on spreadsheets and twisting myself like a pretzel to keep this wedding under a certain amount, he was keeping this secret. Each night when we would bear our souls to each other, he kept this from me. Now he's trying to turn the tables on me and make me the liar in the situation. I scoff at the thought. He makes it sound as if I wanted to have a drunken wedding in Las Vegas. Is he wrong, though, Melanie? For months, I've done my best to suppress the memory and not acknowledge it. But the truth is, I remember everything, and I always have. 
every single detail leading up to our vows. A few months earlier, Let's order another round, I announced to Ananda, Dennis, and Ananda's sister, Leah. Leah reaches over and gives me a high five. I flag down the waiter and ask for another pitcher of whatever it was that we had. He gives me a friendly nod and walks away. Dennis kisses the base of Ananda's neck, and she giggles. She holds up her hand, and her wedding ring sparkles in the light. Leah picks up her glass and makes a toast to the happy couple. I'm so happy for my little sister and Dennis, she says, slurring her words. According to Ananda, Leah hardly gets a chance to get out. She married at 20, and now at 40, she's recently divorced and co-parents two teenagers with her ex-husband. Most men suck. Mine cheated on me with my co-worker, but I'm sure Dennis is different. She hiccups. Ananda rolls her eyes at her sister. Leah, she warns, but this isn't about me. Or your hatred for men, Ananda mumbles. You made a beautiful bride, little sister, she says. The waiter brings back our drinks, and Leah pours herself a tall glass. Speaking of men, I say to Ananda and Dennis, check him out over there. I take a sip of my fresh drink and turn and gaze at the fine man sitting at the bar. He raises his glass to me in a salute. I smile at him, the alcohol making me feel brave enough to flirt. You know Adam's on his way down, right? Dennis asks. Psst! Adam is not my man, I tell them. Girl, bye. If that guy gets within two feet of you, Adam's going to beat his ass. Ananda lets out a loud cackle and high-fives her new husband. You think it's funny that a man thinks he owns me? I ask my friend. Ho, oh, you think you own him too. You two are weird. Remember that girl who was flirting with him last night? You walked over there and told her to fuck off. I only did that to get back at him. The night before, while I was talking to a very handsome man at the casino... Adam interrupted, claiming I was his girlfriend. I don't know why you had to invite him. I only met Ananda because of him, Dennis says. I wave him off. Ananda was over one Saturday for a backyard barbecue, and Dennis was visiting Adam. Alex invited them to join us, and Ananda and Dennis have been inseparable since. That was less than a year ago. As if he knows he's the subject of our conversation— his shadow falls on our table. I know it's him. I can smell him from across the room. And vacation Adam is sexier than at-home Adam. He's been in shorts the past few days. Shorts and T-shirts that drape across his strong chest and back just right. His biceps are practically too big for his shirts. And I must stop myself from reaching over and laying a hand on his skin just like I did last night when I pretended to trip so he could save me. He didn't disappoint. You okay, Mel? He had whispered in my ear while one of his muscled arms was wrapped around my waist. His Irish brogue always makes my skin tingle. It's not so thick that I can't understand him, but it's enough to make me want to hear more. Even now, he takes the empty seat next to me and inches closer, closing the space between us. His cologne hits, and I involuntarily lick my lips. What are you drinking, love? He takes my glass and lifts it to his lips. It's strong. Do you think you can handle that? His blue eyes sparkle, and his full lips turn into a playful smile. I'm a big girl. I can take it. To prove my point, I take the glass from his hand. He lets it go, but he makes sure to run a finger along my hand. His eyes hold mine when I raise the glass to my lips. At the exact same spot where he had put his, he bites his bottom lip while I drink, and the entire time, he never looks away. My goodness, it's gotten hot in here, I hear Ananda's voice, but I don't bother to look up and give her a scathing look. Footsteps approach, and the cute guy from the bar stands at our table. He doesn't get a word in. Adam stands up and blocks him from my sight. Can I help you? Adam asks the guy. 
His voice is gruff, and the playfulness from just a few seconds ago is gone. Just thought I'd see if the pretty lady wants to join me at the bar for a drink. The guy's voice is deep, and in any other situation, I'd find it commanding. But next to Adam, he sounds like a child. Oh, he can get her all the drinks she wants, Adam says. Ananda cackles, and I stand up. Excuse me, I say to Adam. Don't speak for me. I think there's a misunderstanding, the guy says. I'm interested in this pretty lady. He puts a hand on Leah's shoulder. Adam instantly relaxes, and Leah and the man start conversing. He pulls my chair out for me and gestures for me to sit. When I do, I turn to face him. On that note, my husband and I are going to have dinner in our room and do what people do on their honeymoon. Dennis and Ananda say goodbye, and Leah and the guy from the bar leave. When we're alone, Adam leans back in his chair and gives me that sexy smile again. He refills my glass, and I drain it. Once I'm done, he offers me a glass of water. I'm not your property, Flynn, I tell him. Not yet. He smiles at me, showing off his perfectly straight white teeth. My stomach does a somersault. Not ever. We'll see, he says with a shrug. He leans closer, and his scent invades my senses, driving me almost insane. It's like every time I'm near him, the feelings are more intense. He takes his index finger and slides it along my cheek. You feel that, love? My heart nearly flies out of my chest, and my greedy pussy is begging for that finger to leave my cheek and travel south. Feel what? I lie. Don't do that, Mel. Don't lie. Why would I lie? He reaches for my face and strokes my cheek. I become so lost in his eyes that I stop breathing. Time stands still. Everything and everyone else ceases to exist. I can feel myself flush under his gaze, and I suddenly feel exposed. The feelings in the pit of my stomach become so much that I finally break our stare. Because you're afraid, but you want me. I know it. You know it. Everybody knows it. He leans over and runs his nose along my neck. He chuckles when he feels me tremble. Let's get out of here, he whispers right in my ear. Let me guess. You want to take me back to your room? I push against his chest, but it's like a fly trying to push an elephant. You like to touch me, huh? He teases. Well, I do want you to spend the night with me. He stands and offers me his hand. Let me show you around Vegas. I stare at his hand, and I itch to take it, intertwine our fingers, and walk out of this casino together. Images of us at a cozy restaurant feeding each other flash through my mind. I can practically feel him nuzzling the side of my neck while telling me how beautiful he thinks I am. Those big, strong hands holding my waist while we dance closely. And I lick my lips at the thought of his lips touching mine, just like they did a few days ago on New Year's Eve. But just like every other time I thought I had something good— it would end. He'd realize I wasn't worth it, and he'd walk away. Or worse, this entire thing between us would have been about the chase. And the minute I give in, he'd claim victory and disappear, leaving me a defeated mess. Let's go, Mel. His command takes me out of my own head, and I stare at his face again. Last chance. What's that supposed to mean? Are you giving me an ultimatum? I stand. This I can do. I can fight, I can argue, but I don't do vulnerability. I don't like to be seen, and no one can look at me the way that Adam does with those incredible ocean blue eyes. It means if you don't want me, someone else will. Well, I've been chasing you for two years, Mel. He looks into my eyes and down at his hand again. I don't do well with ultimatums. What did you think? I'd want to jump into bed with you now that we're in Vegas? He drops his hand and sighs in disappointment. Oh, I'm asking you to spend time with me, not fuck me. For the first time since we've met, he sounds agitated. 
That puts me off balance, and I don't know how to react to it. I purse my lips and stare into his eyes, not saying a word. I take the extra step of crossing my arms. Fine. Have a good night, Mel. He walks away from the table, and I take the seat Ananda vacated, giving me a clear view of the bar. I expect him to walk out. I imagine he'll leave only to come on stronger tomorrow, but he only gets as far as the bar. He turns away from me to order a drink. I can't help but stare at his broad back standing there, taller than anyone else. I smile, knowing that he's only getting a drink and will be back. No way will he leave me sitting here by myself. But when he gets his drink, he doesn't return. He doesn't turn around. He leans against the bar, and I must will myself not to go over there and put my hand on his ass. And what an ass it is. I remember grabbing it on New Year's Eve, just as the clock struck midnight and his mouth landed on mine. A tall platinum blonde in a skin-tight leather dress squeezes between him and the bar. She pretends to trip and ends up pressing her fake boobs to his chest. I can't hear them, but I can see her exaggerated smile from here. I hold my breath and wait for him to look at me and walk away from her, walk right back here to our table, but he doesn't do any of that. He flags down the bartender, and the blonde bimbo orders something. A few seconds later, she's handed a glass of white wine. She holds her drink up, and Adam has the fucking nerve to clink his beer with her glass. My nostrils flare, and my stomach practically drops to the floor. She leans into him, and he bends down so she can whisper something in his ear. Whatever she says makes him smile, and like the predator she is... She moves closer and presses her body to his. Her hand lands on his chest, and he says something that makes her throw back her head and laugh. I pray her hair extensions fall out. She starts to feel his pecs, and from my seat, I can see the bastard flexing for her. But that's not even the worst thing he does. He puts a free hand on one of her bony hips. That's when I've had enough. I stand up so abruptly, my chair almost falls to the floor. Without thinking about it, I stomp across the restaurant to the bar. I know he knows I'm there, but he doesn't look at me. Excuse me, I say. He says something to the bimbo, and she giggles like a hyena on acid. She whispers something back to him, and he raises his hand and puts a piece of her bottled, dyed hair behind her ear. I imagine snatching her by her hair extensions, but I grab Adam's hand instead. I said, excuse me. I try to pull him away from her, but of course, the giant won't move. Hey, the bimbo says, eyeing me up and down. She holds her empty wine glass and waves it in front of my face. Can you get me another? She dismisses me and turns back to Adam. Do I look like I work here? I take a step closer. She pretends as if she's just now seeing me for the first time. No way did this bitch mistake me for a waitress. They're all dressed the same, and I'm in distressed jeans, heels, and a kimono top. And get your skanky whore hands off him. Who is this, Adam? She pouts and pretends to wipe some non-existent lint from his pristine white polo. That's just Melanie. He never calls me Melanie. It's always been Mel, even though I've told him a million times that nobody calls me that. Bimbo eyes me again, chuckles, and turns back to Adam. Why don't we get out of here? She closes the sliver of space between them and whispers something in his ear. When she's done, she pulls away, looks him in the eye, and seductively bites her bottom lip. I said get your skanky hands off him. I step between them, and she's forced to take a step back, bumping into the man behind her. Adam reacts and quickly grabs her to prevent her skinny ass from hitting the linoleum floor. As soon as his hands make contact, I pull them off. What the fuck is your problem? Bimbo asks. Have some class. She crosses her arms and looks at me up and down again. Of course, I wouldn't expect someone like you to know how to act in public. She puts a hand on my shoulder and digs her fake fingernails into my skin. I pull away and elbow her in the ribs. She stumbles and bumps her body on the bar. Bitch, 
she hisses. Did you see what this horde did to me? She asks Adam. Adam starts to say something, but I hold a hand to his face, silencing him. Not another word out of you, Adam, I hiss, before turning back to the unwanted guest. All you need to know about me is that I'm the one who's going to take him from you. This time, when I take Adam's hand and start to walk away, he follows. I don't stop until we walk through the lobby, out of the front door, and into the dry heat of Las Vegas. When I stop and turn to him, he crosses his arms and arches an eyebrow. What the fuck was that? You and that casino cunt? Language, Mel, he says with a laugh. Her name's Cassidy. I'm Mel again, and I don't give a damn what her name is. I turn to catch my breath. He moves closer to me, and the look he gives me reaches all the way inside my soul. Now that we're outside, I don't know what to do with him. I start to pant as if I just ran a marathon. And all this time, I've only seen him with one woman. I wanted to hurt her, too, until I found out she was his cousin. What are we doing, Mel? He asks. How does it feel, hmm? How does it feel to have someone act like they own you? I cross my arms and wait for him to answer. It feels great, but only because it's you. Just as I'm getting my thoughts together, another blonde walks up to him and smiles. He smiles back, but not for long, because I step between them and say, Back off! She huffs and eye fucks him one more time before she slithers away. I should have known you'd like blondes. He shakes his head sadly and says, You should know better than that, Mel. I want you. I've made that obvious. The difference is, when I chase a man away from you, I've made it clear that I want to be your man. What are you going to do now? It's your move. Hey, handsome. This time, it's a long-legged brunette who has the audacity to slide her arm across his torso. Hey, Gort. Before the word is out of his mouth, I tell her to move along. Adam's eyes light up in mischief, and that just fuels my irritation. I wrap my hand around his wrist and drag him under the awning of the casino and pin him to the wall. He stands there, staring into my eyes. He flashes me that crooked smile, and his blue eyes practically sparkle. I get a vision of him smiling like that for another woman, and a boiling rage like I've never felt before consumes me. The day will come when he'll lose interest and move on to someone else, someone who will willingly be with him. The very idea makes me want to stand in the middle of the sidewalk and scream like a raving lunatic. His smile turns into a smirk, almost as if he's privy to these very thoughts. Shut up, Flynn! He arches his eyebrows and opens his mouth to speak, but I don't give him a chance. I step closer and press my body to his. His eyes widen in shock. Without giving it another thought, I get on my tippy toes and take those firm lips into a toe-curling kiss right there on the public street. His massive arms wrap around me instantly, and he lifts me off my feet. This is just like our New Year's Eve kiss, and I ask myself why it's taken me this long to taste his lips again. I slide my fingers into his thick hair and lose myself in the taste and smell of him. His scent invades my senses, nearly driving me wild with lust and something else. Possession. There is no way I would be able to handle it if he looked at someone else the way he looks at me. I forget where I am and start to wrap my legs around him, but he puts me down. Let's go to my room, he says, his voice hoarse. I look down and see the bulge in his pants and can't help but lick my lips. A night in his room won't stop him from kissing or touching another woman the way he just did with me. That won't be enough, I start to pant. I put both hands on my knees while I do my best to gather my thoughts, but that does nothing to calm the erratic beating of my heart. Wait until you see it, love. I promise it will be enough. He runs a hand down the curve of my body and cups my ass. The feel of his hands belongs to me. The kisses we shared are mine. I'd die if he gives what belongs to me to someone else. That's not what I mean. 
fucking you won't be enough. I should drag your ass to a chapel and marry you. Maybe that's what it will take, because I swear to God, if you ever look at or touch another woman... I leave the thought unfinished. Saying the words out loud would only make me angrier, and I need to control right now. Is that what you've come up with? Well, I don't think you have the guts to do it. I warned you on New Year's Eve not to put ideas in my head, so don't push me, Adam. Hush! I'm trying to figure out what to do with you. I run a hand through my hair, and because there's a group of girls walking toward us, I grab his hand and intertwine our fingers. I should marry you, I threaten. That way, when these casino cunts come near you, you'll have no choice but to tell them you're taken. Oh, I'm not taken, but all you have to do is ask me, love. Ask you what? Ask me to be your husband. Why should I have to ask you? Because I don't want you to wake up tomorrow and say I tricked you. I do a dramatic eye roll. I'm a liberated woman, Adam, a feminist. No one, man or woman, can trick me into doing anything. I do what I want, and I do it when I want. This ain't the 1950s, love. I say love with the worst Irish brogue in the history of the world. Liberated women happen to be my favorite kind, love. As a liberated woman, ask me to marry you. Hell, tell me to do it. But you should know one thing, Mel. If we do this... I'm not going to let you go. There's nowhere on this earth you can run. I'll always find you and bring you back to me. What makes you think I'd run? Just a feeling. I put a hand on his broad chest and push, but he doesn't budge. In fact, he flexes underneath my hand. Adam, you would let me go. You'll finally get what you want and you'd get bored. I'm not that special. You have no idea how wrong you are, love. So ask me, and I'll prove to you by never letting you go. You'll marry me right here? Tonight. You'll never do it. I put a hand on his shoulder and smile into his face. It's all fun and games until someone proposes. No one's proposed. Ask me. I dare you. You're not crazy enough to marry me. Ask me. Okay. Adam Flynn, will you marry me? I give him a smug look, knowing he'll never do it. This is it. This is when he runs away and calls me nuts. But he doesn't. He leans closer and whispers, Yes. Right, I say, rolling my eyes. You can have all the casino cunts you want. Why do you think you want me? This is insane. I should run as fast and as far away from Adam and this crazy idea as I can, but I don't make a single move to flee. I look into his eyes and almost drown in the look he's giving me. It's more addictive than drugs, and I'll burn down the entire fucking world before another woman will get that look. I don't think I want you, Mel. I've known it since I first heard your voice. He offers me his hand this time, and I take it. Am I supposed to get you a ring? A nervous giggle escapes. Look at me. And I do. Promise me you won't regret this in the morning. And if you do, well, I'm still not going to let you go. He picks up my left hand and places a kiss on my ring finger. But first, you need a big fat diamond ring on that finger. You can't afford a big fat diamond. He barges into the room, jolting me out of my daydream. He's fully dressed, but his hair is still damp. There's only one hour delay for school, so I have to go. I stare at him and shrug. Still giving me the silent treatment, I see. Really mature. I thought I married a grown woman, but I guess not. He stomps out of the room before I can respond. By the time I shower and dress, he's still in the kitchen plating two dishes of food. He slams them on the table and says, Eat it or not, we don't care. But I know he cares. His cheeks turn red, and he doesn't take a seat until I do. We eat without either of us saying a word. I study my husband. His face is redder than I've ever seen, and he eats his omelet in stony silence. When he's done... He just gets up, leaving his dirty plate on the table. No problem. I'll clean up after you.
I yell to his retreating back. He doesn't dignify my tantrum with a response. He pulls on his coat, puts on his boots, and shuts the coat closet door. He comes back to the table and kisses my cheek. He walks out of the apartment and slams the door behind him without a word. I open the door to my two best friends, and they burst in without an invitation. I had no idea they were coming here today. Alex is still on maternity leave, and Ananda is on vacation for the next week. She's leaving for a trip to Barbados tomorrow. I was at home packing for my trip with my new husband when Alex called me over here. Hurry up. My flight leaves at 7 tomorrow morning. I got shit to do. Ananda takes a seat on Lola and crosses her arms. Yeah, what the hell were you about to tell me last night? And by the way, it's Armageddon downstairs. Jason refuses to talk to your mom, and I can barely stand to be in the same room with her. She keeps crying, and that upsets my daughter. I wish she never came here. I sigh and sink on the couch next to Alex. For the next 15 minutes, I tell my two best friends the new information I learned about my husband and the fight we've been having since last night. When I'm done, Alex and Ananda stare at each other. It's almost as if they are trying to gauge whether I'm telling the truth. I knew it, Ananda says. Alex and I look at each other, and we both roll our eyes. You knew Adam was sitting on $50 million, Nand? Really? Alex sighs in disbelief. No, not the specifics, but I always knew he was different. He's good friends with my husband, so I've spent time with him without you two. He's just always carried himself differently, you know? He's not a snob, but he's always been above certain shit. I don't know how to explain it, but I'm not the least bit surprised, Ananda says. Well, I'm glad one of us isn't surprised. I was blindsided. I married a liar and a manipulator. He's been acting like the injured party, like he hasn't lied to my face repeatedly, had the nerve to yell at me and say he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. The fucking audacity of men. I plop myself down on the sofa after my speech and cover my eyes with my hands. Rich men, Alex clarifies. Ananda reaches over and high-fives her. I sit up and stare at my best friends, not impressed at all by their reaction. Okay, Alex raises both hands in surrender. Did you ask him why he didn't tell you? Of course I did. He played the caveman part and said he was done talking about it. He punched a wall, Alex. I lower my voice and whisper my outrage at his violent reaction. Alex and Ananda look at each other and then at me, neither of them reacting the way I expected. Ananda goes so far as to laugh. You find this funny? I ask. I find you funny, Melly. I open my mouth to address her, but she cuts me off. I only have one question to ask before we dive any further into this discussion. What? I cross my arms and brace myself for whatever she's going to say next. Are you still going to sample wedding cakes on Saturday with Molly? She arches one perfectly shaped eyebrow. Alex holds her breath while she waits for my answer. Yes or no. I don't need a song and dance or another long speech. What does that have anything to do with it? Yes or no. I stare into Ananda's eyes and finally say, Yes. Both of my friends smirk, but Alex reaches over and hugs me. So you're not leaving him over this? Ananda asks. My shoulders slump, but I answer my friend and say, No, I'm not going to leave him. That thought never once crossed my mind. I love him. Alex lets out a loud shriek, wraps her arms around me, and squeezes me close. It's about time. I've known you loved his ass since your little housewarming party. I just wanted to get you to admit it. You're married to him, and you love him. It's obvious he adores you, so what's the problem? And you better not say the money is a problem, because if so, I'll be happy to take all $50 million off your hands, Ananda says. As always, she's taken the fight right out of me. Had it been just Alex, she'd hug me and tell me what I want to hear. Ananda's too blunt for that. He lied to me, Nand. She opens her mouth to argue, but I raise a hand to silence her. 
Listen to me before you tell me I'm being dramatic. Things have been really good since the housewarming party. Really amazing. Just downright perfect. We have these late night chats where we tell each other things that nobody else knows. I've told him things I've never said out loud to another human being. And the entire time, he's kept this from me. I asked him if he had any siblings on his father's side. And you want to know what he said? Both of my friends nod, and I continue. He said, I'm my mother's only child. Then he reminded me last night that's not technically a lie. Alex holds one of my hands, squeezes it, and puts my palm to her cheek. Even Ananda reaches over and rests a hand on my shoulder. You're one dramatic chick, Ananda smiles when she says it. You're lucky we both love your ass. He messed up. Forgive him. See, I solved your problem. Give the guy a break. Or some head, Alex says with a high giggle. Anal if you're really sorry, Ananda adds while she reaches over and gives Alex a high five. Forget Ananda. I focus on Alex, and Ananda gives us both the middle finger, but she keeps her mouth shut. And I disagree. I don't think Adam messed up. I opened my mouth to argue, but she talks over me and says, Hear me out. I was in a similar situation, as you both know. I knew who my father was for years and never told a soul. Never told Ananda, and even after falling hard for your brother, I never breathed a word to him either. And he asked me if I knew my father. You know what I said? I said I'd never met him. It wasn't a lie, but it wasn't exactly the truth either. But you know what? None of it was about Jason. None. My reasons were about me, my fears, and my insecurities. So whatever Adam's reasons are, Melly, they have nothing to do with you. Don't get offended by it. Calm down and talk to him without making it about your hurt feelings. He's human. He has fears like all of us. Give him a chance to explain, and whatever his reasons are, be there for him. Alex smiles at me while nodding. Overcome with emotion, I nod back and swipe away at my falling tears. Alex grabs a tissue and dabs my face, saying soothing words to me the entire time. Jesus, this girl is crying now. Ananda doesn't bother with a napkin. She swipes the tears away with her finger. Just tell him you're sorry, you overreacted, and drop to your knees. I push her hand away, but she reaches over, messes my hair, and starts to laugh. I'm awful. I put my face in my hands and let reality wash over me. All I thought about was me. I went on the attack instead of seeing it from his perspective. The tears fall again, and I'm unable to stop them this time. Both girls take me in their arms, and the three of us do a group hug. They hold me until the tears subside, and I'm able to catch my breath. First, this happened less than 24 hours ago. Second, you're human. Third, he'll forgive you. And yes, you're a drama queen, but he should have told you. I'm sure he has his reasons, though, Melly. He loves you, so give him a break. Stop freaking out and be there for your husband. Ananda squeezes me tight before she finally lets me go. I nod at them, but I absentmindedly pick at the tablecloth. I stand and look out the window. The snowstorm never really developed. After only three inches fell, it turned to rain. The rain continues, turning the entire city gray and morose. Both of my friends come and stand on either side of me. Let's hear it, Ananda taps her shoulder with mine. It's nothing, I wave them off. Let's hear it anyway, Alex says. Okay, I take a deep breath and continue. Other than yesterday, things have been really great between us, I freaked out those first few days, but I love being married to him. There isn't a single thing that I don't love, but that's when I thought we were equals, both of us working together, joining our bank accounts, and making plans for the future. We're by no means struggling, but I wanted us to share everything, build together, you know what I mean? 
They both nod in understanding. Now, that's not the case anymore, and I don't know where or if I fit in. His family is kind of out of my league. I've spent the entire morning Googling them. Adam is way out of my league now. Melly, he's still Adam, the guy who didn't have matching dishes and ugly furniture, the guy with the nice mom and crazy uncle. He's still the same guy who's been waiting for you to fall in love with him. And girl, you good enough? I know that's what this is really about. You are enough. You're smart enough, successful enough, beautiful enough. Ananda snakes an arm around my waist. I don't make friends with basic bitches. You slay, Melly. She grabs both my shoulders and gives me a shake. And I understand about wanting to build something together. I get it. But you can still do that. Take that 50 million and help him turn it into 500 million. Yeah, Alex says. What she said. They hug me again, and I let my insecurities go, at least for now. Are you going to feed us? I came all the way over here, and we know you can afford it. Ananda opens my fridge and pulls out three bottles of water. Greedy ho, I say to her, while I grab all the takeout menus out of a drawer. 42. Adam. Instead of going home to talk to Mel once school let out, I drive in the opposite direction. Straight down Commonwealth Avenue. I honk my horn at a guy wearing a Boston University hoodie who decides to run in front of my truck while I have the green light. Impatient little asshole. The heavy rain slows traffic down and it takes me twice as long before I turn down Batov Street. Of course, this is where he would be. One of the most ostentatious neighborhoods in the city. I haphazardly park my car in front of the brownstone, the biggest one on this street. I take the stairs two at a time until I reach his door and pound my fist on the hardwood, ready to kick the fucking thing in if someone doesn't answer soon. I thought if I slept on it, I'd be less angry when I woke up this morning. I was wrong. The anger only festered overnight. It ate at me. Add in sexual frustration and you have a perfect storm. I check my phone and there are no messages from Mel. She was there physically last night and this morning but she's withdrawn completely. She barely ate the breakfast I made for her, and I can't read her mind, but I can read her expressions. She barely looked at me this morning, and despite how comfortable the couch is and how easily I can fall asleep, I spent the entire night awake, staring at the ceiling and missing my wife's warm body next to mine. I pound on the door again. I look around the quiet street and notice there isn't a single person outside. Not even a jogger or a nanny pushing the stroller of a trust fund baby. When no one answers the door, I kick it, and right before my foot strikes for the second time, it swings open. I push my way inside and slam the door so hard the fucking townhouse rattles. The asshole who wrecked my life stands in front of me. The temper I've barely held at bay boils over. I grab him by his collar and push him against the wall so hard the pictures shake. He stands there, making no moves to push me away from him. He arches his eyebrows as if he's waiting for me to either strike or talk. I plan on doing both. I fucking told you I didn't want anything to do with you, I hiss. I don't let him go, but I take a small step back to give him enough space to throw a punch. I can't find it in me to look into those familiar eyes, so I look past his shoulder and wait for him to hit me first. All he has to do is throw one punch to give me an excuse to unleash my rage. I told you I didn't accept that. I make a fist and he chuckles. The fucking asshole has the nerve to laugh at me. I don't care whether you accept it or not. It's not about what you want. I'm not a shiny new toy for you and your sister to play with. I'm a real person. And you don't walk into my life and blow it up. I've always known about you and I've never reached out. What does that tell you? This time he shoves me away and I stumble back. I don't stumble for long. I step closer and punch the wall so hard I know I've either broken a knuckle or at the very least bruised it. It tells me you thought we wouldn't want anything to do with you, so you decided to reject us first. His calm voice takes the wind out of my sails, but I still refuse to acknowledge the partial truth to his words. Stay away from me and my wife, I say. 
or I swear to God I will pound your fucking face through that wall. Try it, he taunts. I step back and he shoves my chest, almost daring me to hit him. You don't get to walk into my life and blow it up. She kicked me out of the fucking bedroom after your impromptu visit. You think it's been fun walking around with blue balls all fucking day? I don't know what prompted me to say that, and I wish I could take the words back. No part of me wants to give this guy even the tiniest glimpse into my personal life. A small laugh escapes him, and he does his best to wipe the smile off his face, but can't. First, I don't have anything to do with your balls. Second, I told you I was coming. But if you came here to fight, do it. Hit me. What are you waiting for? He's tall, but I have about an inch on him. He's fit, but I'm younger and I'm trained. It wouldn't take much. I doubt he could get a punch in. But his face and voice remind me so much of my father, I take a step back. I was completely unprepared for that. Our father's been dead for five years, but I hadn't seen him for three years before he passed away. Despite being in his seventies the last time I saw him, Ethan is his spitting image, only younger. I step closer and push him against the wall again. He stands there, much too calm for the situation. I came here looking for a fight, I tell him. I know. Give me one. You look so much like him I'm dying to rearrange your fucking face. Say something. Do something to make me hit you. There's no denying that we're both his sons, he says. I'm nothing like him. Neither am I. Not in any way that matters. Back away, a feminine voice says from behind me. She's a short black woman, the same one I saw photos of online, but she's prettier in person. Despite her smaller stature, something about her reminds me of Mel. I ignore her and focus on the prick in front of me instead. I said back away, she says again. Tara, it's fine. Just having a chat with my brother, he says. There's a hint of a smile on his face and I wrap my hand around his jaw to shut him up. Tara pulls on my arm and I let out a humorless laugh. I don't think she weighs much more than 100 pounds, but I drop my arm. She steps between us and puts a hand to my chest as if she's strong enough to push me away. Listen to me. She points an index finger in my face. First, we have a child in this house and we don't do this kind of thing around him. Second... If anyone is going to rearrange my fiancé's face, it's going to be me, not you or anybody else. No one lays a hand on him other than me. Got it? So back all the way off before I rearrange your face. Believe me, I'd love nothing more just for the hell you've put Ethan and Elizabeth through for almost a year. At the mention of a child, I take several steps back. My breathing comes out in short pants and I lay both hands on my thighs to try and calm down. By the way, that face that you want to rearrange looks just like yours. Deal with it. You have siblings, and they want a relationship with you. There are worse things in life, so grow the hell up, she adds. She crosses her arms and stands next to Ethan, almost as if she's daring me to talk back. I'm only here to tell him to his face to leave me alone, I turn back to Ethan. I'm serious. Whatever it is you're after, I'm not interested. You're causing problems in my marriage. Tara arches her eyebrows and she looks at Ethan for confirmation. All he does is shrug. Right, the blue balls, Ethan says with a playful grin. Of all the things I imagined on the drive over here, playfulness wasn't one of them. The what? Tara asks. I don't know how I could have done that, but it was obvious yesterday that you never told her about us. If that's the case, that's on you, not me he says. I didn't tell her about you because you don't matter to me. Hey, don't say something you'll regret. You're here, so why don't we sit down and talk? Tara suddenly smiles at me, throwing me off kilter by her sudden bout of friendliness. I can get us some drinks. I've said all I'm going to say. I'm talking to her, but my eyes are locked on him, willing him to get my meaning. But I met with a smug look that suggests he's not ready to hear me yet. I'm not going to say it again. Stop with the phone calls and the surprise visits. You almost break my door, push me against the wall, and threaten to rearrange my face. I'm sure you have plenty more to say, so sit down and say it. I look around the room now, 
unwilling to look in anyone's face, but I can feel the woman's eyes boring into me. I turn my back to them and reach for the door. But just as I put my hand on the doorknob, I hear footsteps. More than one set. It sounds like several sets of little feet are running on the hardwood floors. Can we go now? A little voice says. There's a loud bark that follows his question. For some reason, I can't just walk away. I turn around to find a little boy in wire-rimmed glasses and a three-legged dog. The dog walks to me, sniffs my hand, and licks it. I can't help myself and rub behind the ears of the chocolate lab. That's Ralph, the little boy says. I've seen pictures of him. Vincent Bradford, my six-year-old nephew, I guess. Hey there, Ralph. I drop to my knees and Ralph licks my face. I'm Vincent. He approaches and looks at me tentatively. He looks at his dad, who nods at him, and he walks closer. Hi, Vincent. I'm Adam. I offer him my hand. He takes it and gives me a firm handshake. I know. You're my uncle, and my dad and Aunt Liz have been calling you, but you never answer. Unsure of how to respond, I look at Ethan and narrow my eyes at him. Are you coming with us to the aquarium? I want to see the snakes. Tara's scared of them. We had animals at my last birthday party, and when the guy brought out the snakes, she screamed and ran out of the room. She wouldn't come back out until Dad told her they were gone. Tara makes a face and moves closer to Ethan. He puts an arm around her and kisses her temple. If only I had a snake in my office that day you barged in, Ethan whispers. That gets a laugh out of Tara. I had a pet snake when I was a little bit older than you. I don't know what possesses me to keep talking. I should be walking out of this house and away from these people. Vincent widens his eyes and smiles. That's when I notice his two front teeth are missing. I can't help myself. I put my hand on his head and make a mess of his dirty blonde hair. He must look more like his mother than his father, but his eyes are just like his. And like mine. Your mom let you have one? No, she didn't. But my Uncle Finn did. He's the best. He acts like a big kid, which is great when you're little. Is he my uncle, too? Maybe he'll get me one. He'd better not, Tara says. No, he's not your uncle, but I bet he'd get you one anyway. Not going to happen, Ethan says. The kid grabs my hand and I wrap mine around his. I'll show you my room here. I think the house is haunted because the stairs are creaky. Evan thinks there's a ghost. Evan? I ask. He's my best friend. He'll be here on Thursday so you can meet him. Come on. He tries to pull me to the stairs, but I don't budge. Get him, Ralph. Ralph growls, bites on my pant leg, and tries to pull me to the stairs. I look towards Ethan and Tara for help, and they both shrug. The alarm to the house beeps, indicating the back door has opened. Loud clacking of high heels hit the hardwood. I finally made it, a female voice says. Ethan? Tara? In here, Elizabeth. Ethan's eyes lock with mine when he says her name. I was thinking about what you said, how we said there are other people involved. It just dawned on me that we've completely forgotten about his mother. I think she might be the problem and the cause for his... The words die in her throat when she sees me. Her eyes widen and the carry-on suitcase she was pulling falls on the floor. She gasps loudly and puts both hands to her mouth. I've seen pictures of her. She looks more like her mother than our father, but she has the same nose as Ethan. And me. Whose mother are you talking about? I ask her. For your sake, I hope you're not talking about mine. She has never been, nor will ever be, a problem. She drops her hands, but I don't miss the tears pooled in her eyes. She flies across the room and wraps herself around me, burying her face in my chest while she sobs loudly. Vincent drops my hand and Elizabeth hugs me. My arms hang at my side and I stand there like a statue. I look over her shoulder and lock eyes with Ethan and mouth help. Elizabeth finally pulls away, roughly grabs my face and looks into my eyes. I look away, unable to meet her gaze. Her hands are warm on my face and not at all unpleasant. Her eyes are friendly, and when tears start to run down her face again, something inside me starts to thaw. I can't stand a crying woman. Not only can I not stand it, I can't take it either. 
Her hands run through my hair again, and a sob escapes before she hugs me. My hands awkwardly pat her shoulders in a lame attempt to soothe her. When she pulls away, she smiles and lays a hand on top of mine. I find myself smiling back. You look and sound just like Ethan and Dad. Oh my God, Ethan, I finally have a little brother. The tears fall, and she hugs me again. Ethan does nothing to help, but Vincent does. He was coming to see my room, Aunt Liz. He sounds a little annoyed at her, and he pushes his way between us and takes my hand again. You're staying? She asks, her face still buried in my chest. Stay, please. She finally pulls her face away, but she doesn't leave my space. Come on. Vincent gives me another tug, and he pushes his aunt out of the way. Ralph bites my pants again and starts to pull. Tara, help me pick out bunk beds for when Evan gets here. I'll show you my room, and then you can come to the aquarium with us. Elizabeth finally moves away, and I know I should pull my hand from the kids and walk out the door. Maybe go home, get Mel, and fly somewhere far, far away. But I refuse to be the one who hurts this little boy's feelings, and I'm pretty sure the dog would bite me if I tried to leave. So I let him lead me farther into the house, and when he runs up the stairs, I follow. This step is the creakiest one, he says. He jumps on top of it, and when I land there, he gestures for me to jump too. So I do, and the wood practically moans underneath my weight. See, I told you. I think the ghost lives underneath there. Come on. We arrive on the second floor. It has vaulted ceilings and skylights throughout. Unlike downstairs, the upstairs looks pretty empty, and I can't escape the smell of fresh paint. I sneak a peek at a few of the rooms while I follow Vincent, and most of them are empty. I step inside Vincent's room and the place is pristine, much too clean for a five-year-old boy with a dog. The beds are perfectly made and there's a vase of fresh flowers on his dresser. The room is a nautical theme and painted in various shades of blue. Hey, buddy, I say as I look around the room. There are so many questions I want to ask, but I won't use a child for information. This is a nice room. He smiles proudly at me, putting his missing two front teeth on display. Daddy says we'll be spending time here with you from now on. He says whether you like it or not. He prattles on while he opens a chest and pulls out a bunch of toys. You want to play? My favorite memories as a kid involve playing action figures with my Uncle Finn. He is the only father figure I've ever had, and I don't remember a single time when he didn't make time for me. I'm not here to play uncle, but when I look down at him, he smiles. So, it's that smile that forces me to sit on the floor and reach for an action figure. The dog comes and lies next to me while we play. My wife. Where are you? We need to talk. My heart starts to beat erratically at the text. We need to talk is never a good sign. But I meant what I said that night in Vegas. I'm not letting her go. And there's nowhere on earth she can run and hide from me. Me. I'll be home soon. I love you. My wife. I love you too. I miss you so hurry. All the tension leaves after reading her last text, and I reach over and mess Vincent's hair. I have to go, Vincent, but I had fun playing with you. He jumps up and I do the same. He takes my hand and we walk downstairs. The three other adults in the house are in the exact same spot at the bottom of the stairs. Stay for dinner, please. Elizabeth says. She comes over to me and runs her hands through my hair and strokes my face again. I step back, grab her hands and put them down. What are we having? She asks, looking at Tara. I'll order something, Tara offers. Or we can go out if you'd be more comfortable at a restaurant. I can't. I need to get home to my wife. I'll send the car for her, Ethan offers. I need to go, I say to them again. We'll be here until Sunday, Ethan says. The dinner invitation stands, or you can barge in any time. I nod, but before I can walk out, Vincent comes and wraps his arms around my legs. Bye, Uncle Adam. Will you come back so we can play with my Legos and meet Evan? His big blue eyes bore into mine while he waits for an answer. All I do is give him a firm nod before pulling away and walking out the door. Mel! I yell out the minute I burst through the door. I open it with so much force that it crashes against the wall. 
She comes running, still in the same yoga pants she had on this morning, only with bare feet this time. I smile at her yellow toenails. She runs to me and I open my arms just in time for me to wrap them around her. I lift her off the ground and kiss her temple. This is the first time today that I've been completely at ease. I'm sorry, she says before I can offer my own apology. I was a bad wife. I lift her off her feet, walk over to Lola and sit down with her in my lap. What are you talking about, Mel? You can never be a bad wife. I stick my face in the side of her neck and kiss her. I was. I made everything about me when it's not. It's about you. I mean, I do wish you had shared it with me, but I shouldn't have made it about me. And I shouldn't have kicked you out of the bedroom. Can you forgive me? I stroke the nape of her neck and kiss her temple. Forgive you? For what? I should have told you. But honestly, I figured it would be another wall you'd put up between us. Another reason why we couldn't be together. You moved in here and all you talked about were spreadsheets, brackets, and being equal with your partner. I was afraid of losing you, Mel. She closes her eyes almost as if pained by my words. A stray tear seeps out and I wipe it. And I'm sorry I ever made you feel that way, Adam. I'm sorry I made you feel like you had to walk on eggshells because you're afraid of losing me. You're not going to. Not ever. I love you and I need you too much to ever walk away. I know I never say it, but I love being married to you. And yes, I was scared after I woke up in Vegas. But do you know how long it took for me to realize how much I love being Mrs. Flynn? About two days. Marrying you is the best thing I've ever done. And I lied too, she says. She looks down and I grab her chin and force her eyes back on me. I've been lying for months about not remembering what happened in Vegas. I remember it all and I always have. I wanted to marry you and I had a little liquid courage, but I wasn't drunk. I wasn't anywhere close to being drunk. I'm the one who dragged you to the chapel. I got scared when I woke up the next morning. I convinced myself you'd realize you made a mistake, so I took off. But that was because of my insecurities. It had nothing to do with you. I couldn't face being rejected by you and ran, but Adam, I'm done running. I put my forehead to hers and close my eyes, so relieved at her words that I want to yell in happiness. She takes my hands, lifts them to her lips, kisses them, and then puts them on her warm face. It took you two whole days, I deadpan. When she lets out a laugh, I say, I'm happy to hear that, love. So damn happy. I nod and wait for her to continue. It's true. I'm really sorry, Adam, for all the lies and for... I put a finger to her lips. It's okay, Mel. We're here now, and you're not going to run again, right? Right. But I have two questions. Were you ever going to tell me? Of course I was, right after our honeymoon. I kiss her knuckles and adjust her on my lap. And this ring? That's the one thing I don't remember. I remember getting your ring and a simple band from me, but when I woke up, I had this giant diamond on my finger. She holds her left hand up and points at it. Money talks, love. I made a phone call after you fell asleep. She nods and playfully punches my chest. Once she's situated on my lap, she asks, Why are you avoiding your brother and sister? I bristle at their titles. They've been calling for months. Why not give them a chance and get to know them? At least have one conversation. I pull her closer and ponder my next words. I don't want anything to do with my father, and that includes them. She runs a hand through my hair and asks, But why? They're not your father. I lay my head back on Lola and close my eyes. I can still feel Mel's eyes on me, but I can't look at her. Not right now. I feel her hand on my cheek as she softly strokes my face. That's where I was when you texted me, I say. The gentle stroking stops. Where? He left the address when he was here yesterday. I was so angry at him for showing up, and I blamed him for our fight. I drove over there in a blind rage and pushed him against the wall, punched a hole through it, too. 
Her mouth hangs open at my confession. She examines my hands for any damage. I'm fine, I tell her. I didn't hit him. His fiance came in. That's it. You went over there, threatened him, and left? No. His kid and the three-legged dog came out, and the kid asked me to go see his room. Then the sister came home. She saw me and hugged me, kept touching my face and hair, said I look and sound like their father and that Ethan guy, which is absolutely the worst thing anyone can say to me. I went and saw the kid's room, played with him for a bit, and left. But when the sister came in before she saw me, she started talking shit about Ma. Mel stiffens on top of me, but I don't miss the flash of anger in her eyes. What the hell did she say? That maybe my mother is the reason I won't talk to them. Mel looks into my face and lets out a deep breath. <sighs> is she right, Adam? I've been thinking about this all day, and I had that thought, too. I throw an arm over my eyes, but Mel pokes my stomach until I put my arm down. He hurt us both, but I don't think she ever recovered. She never got married, hardly dated at all. I think she felt guilty about being with a married man, even though he lied to her, and she had no idea he was married until after she had me. But through it all, she never said a cross word about him to me. I hate him for what he did to us, and I don't want to bring all that shit back. He's dead, and I'd rather he stayed buried. I sigh when she strokes my hair. But, Adam, she says softly, he made you. If you don't want anything to do with them because that's what you want, I'll support that. I'll always support you. But if there's any part of you that wants to get to know them, you owe it to yourself to do it. You are allowed to do something for you. And I've gotten to know your mom, and you're her favorite person on earth. She would not be upset with you for wanting to get to know your siblings and your nephew. And you're not the type of guy who shuts people out. You're the opposite of that. You're loving and welcoming and so amazing. The fact that you haven't punched Jason yet is testament to that. I let out a laugh. The kid is pretty cute. You should see him with his little glasses and his three-legged dog. I smile at the memory of Ralph biting my pants and pulling me toward the stairs. Mel gets up from my lap, offers me her hand, and helps pull me up. Let's have an early dinner, and then we're going to see your mom. We're going to clear the air because I have a feeling that you've never talked about it. You assume she feels one way when you've never broached the subject. Did she ever shy away from talking about your father with you? Never. She's never lied to me or tried to change the subject when I did ask things. But I stopped talking about him years ago. I told her once that I never wanted to hear his name again, so she never brings him up. She puts an arm around my waist and walks us into the kitchen. It's then that I notice the table's been set. A mouth-watering aroma hits my nose and I realize how hungry I am. I start to walk to the stove, but she pulls my arm and points at the chair, ordering me to sit. So I do. We need a do-over from yesterday, she tells me. Sit down and let me take care of you. I love 1950s, Mel. There's more, love. She pulls something out of the oven, and while she has her back turned, I admire her ass. I'm listening. So, about that inheritance? I take a deep breath and run a hand over my face. She puts chicken pieces on a serving platter and places it on the table in front of me. She sits directly across and waits for me to talk. I pat my lap, and she sits on my thigh. When I have my arms wrapped securely around her, I say, I don't want to keep anything else from you. He didn't only leave money. There's property. I clear my throat. <clears throat> Several properties, in fact. The house my ma lives on is mine. There's also commercial real estate, shares in companies, artwork. He invested in a few startups and left those shares to me. I take a big, relieved breath after getting that off my chest. Mel remains silent. She looks at the floor, and I wait for her to respond to the new information. Okay. She gets up and takes out a covered dish from the microwave. Okay. That's it. My stomach grumbles while my wife puts baked chicken and sweet potatoes on my plate. I don't know what to say, Adam. 
But whether you're rich or poor, you're stuck with me. I pull her back on my lap and rest my chin on her shoulder. Maybe it's time I figure out how much all that other shit is worth. Whatever you want to do, we'll do it together. But do you really not know what any of it is worth? I shrug at her and say, I never wanted money. I wanted a father's love. The inheritance has been nothing but a slap in the face. It's like he's trying to buy his way out of being a father to me, and I'm not for sale. She kisses my temple and caresses my face. I'm sorry you never had a father in your life. You deserved that. She cups my face with her hands and looks in my eyes. But you have a wife's love. A wife who would burn down this entire world for you. I close my eyes and pull her close. We don't speak for several minutes. I simply hold on to her and absorb her warmth and her strength. Then that's all I need, love, I say minutes later. While we eat the delicious dinner she prepared, she runs a hand soothingly down my thigh. How about this, she says between bites of food. We go see your mom, and if she's okay with this, which I'm positive she will be because she's awesome, we'll give them one dinner. We can have them here or go out. If I get even the whiff of assholery, we're out. I reach over and kiss her greasy lips. A smile, touch that she thinks so highly of my mother. Because, she continues, I think it counts for something that they've tried for so long, Adam. I think family is important to them. If they're jerks, we'll know soon enough. I'll know in the first five minutes. But you owe it to yourself to find out. I think you want to. I don't want to if it's going to upset Ma and make you pull away from me like you did last night. It's not worth it if I end up losing the two most important people in my life. She smiles at me, but her smile is sad. She puts a soft hand on my cheek and looks me in the eyes. You are allowed to do something for you. They are your family, and they want to get to know you so much that they are here, even though you've been telling them to get lost for almost a year. Maybe they don't want to be anything like your father either. And maybe he was a shitty father to them, too. She grabs both of my hands and says, Your mom loves you more than anything on this earth, Adam. She's a wonderful mother who always puts you first. She will want this for you. As for me, I'm not going anywhere. I love you too much. You're my husband and my best friend. I don't care what we fight about. I'll always come back to you. I'm done putting up walls, and there's nothing that can ever make me walk away. You make me happier than I've ever been. Let me help you through this. We'll do it together. I smile at my wife, and she smiles back at me, holding my stare. I put a finger in the little dimple in her cheek. I run a hand over her head and tug at her ponytail. Something inside of me bursts. I love her. I've always loved her, but right now, with her taking care of me, I realize I need her just as much. If you think so, Mel, that's what we'll do. I trust you. She beams at my words and kisses my cheek. I make a face and wipe the greasy spot. She bunches her napkin and throws it at me. Let's change the subject to a more important topic. How many more hours until I can strip you naked and climb between your legs? You're so going to pay for what you did to me last night. My balls still haven't recovered. 43. Melly. Just like I predicted, Molly was stunned when we told her about Adam's siblings tracking him down. See, I told you she'd be upset. Adam shouts when she starts to cry in front of us. He runs to her and puts an arm around her. Oh, you won't see them ever, he assures her. Oh, Adam, you big, sweet, lovable idiot. She reaches up and hits him upside his head. I'm just relieved that they want to get to know you. I always wanted to give you siblings, but I never met anyone I loved enough to settle down with. She grabs his hand and points to the couch. She does the same to me, and when I take my place next to my husband and join our hands, she smiles. For years, 
Why he felt so guilty about not just sleeping with another woman's husband, but having a child. Not that I regret you, Adam. Not ever. Not for a second. But I couldn't give you the traditional family you deserved. And even though he came around sometimes, your father never really took an interest in you. But I'm grateful he took care of you financially. That's the one thing he did right. But son, listen to me. Part of being a good parent is wanting the best for your child, and that's what I want for you. If you want to get to know them, I would never try to stop you. I want that for you, and I hope they are everything your father was not, everything you deserve. She pulls him into a tight hug, and when she pulls away, tears are streaking down her cheeks. The three of us hug on the couch until the front door opens and we hear footsteps. Adam! Is that you? It's my car, Uncle Finn. Who else would it be? Adam yells so loud, I almost jump off the couch. Bar? How do you know I went to a bar? Uncle Finn comes strolling into the living room, wearing dark blue skinny jeans he has no business wearing, and a button-down shirt that has the buttons straining over his considerable belly. What happened to your date? Molly yells. My mate? Nothing gonna happen. She smells like cot piss. Got the hell out of there real quick. What do the kids say? Oi, had to GTFO. What's going on here? He leans down and kisses my cheek right before he messes Adam's hair. Am I getting a grand niece or nephew? He surprises me when he reaches down and touches my stomach. Nope, that womb is bare. Adam, are you shooting blanks? He cackles, runs to the kitchen, and comes back with a beer. Adam tells him the news about his siblings, and Uncle Finn almost drops his beer. He lowers his hefty bulk onto the love seat instead. Are you all Meshugana? No, I don't like this at all. Adam, no, you're not to see them, do you hear me? Oi, forbid it. Oi met your father once. An arrogant prick is what he was. Oi almost punched him in the nose. Adam drives slower than usual tonight. The traffic on Commonwealth Avenue is unusually light for a Thursday night. His hand squeezes my thigh so tight it's almost painful, but when I lay a hand on top of his, he loosens his grip. The calls continued the past two days. He answered this morning and agreed to come to dinner. I've never known Adam to be nervous. All these years, he's been nothing but sure of himself whenever we interact, but he's been too quiet. Five minutes, I tell him. If anyone says anything out of line in the first five minutes, we're gone. We'll bring Uncle Finn back and let him deal with them. I jerk my thumb backwards to prove my point, but I don't get a laugh out of him like I normally would. All I get is a nod. He pulls onto a quiet side street lined with nothing but million-dollar brownstones, for the middle of the city, the street is like one you might find in the suburbs. Clear, quiet, and void of passing traffic. He pulls over and parks in front of the largest brownstone on the street. This place? I ask, and he nods. Jesus, are they renting it? It must be at least fifteen grand a month. At least. I let out a loud whistle at the sight of the house. It's all brick with a huge black door. The front looks newly done, and there are big flower pots on each of the front steps leading to the door. My guess is they bought it, Adam whispers, like we're not the only two people in the car. I whistle again. At the very least, that's a $10 million brownstone. I've researched them. Well, I've researched your brother's fiance. Do you know that she's black? I ask. I saw her two days ago, Mel. And why are we whispering? We're the only ones in the car. I playfully punch his shoulder. She has an MBA from Columbia, and she met him when he bought her family's toy store chain. Rumor has it they have no prenup, and they are planning a multi-million dollar wedding. This time, it's Adam who lets out a loud whistle. Can you imagine how long their wedding spreadsheet is? They might have more than one. He laughs when I pinch his side. Well, I'm not getting rid of my spreadsheets, so don't get any ideas. We're still keeping track of every penny, and I'm still going to pack you a lunch because I like to do it. 
And if you tell anybody I like packing your lunch, I'll deny it. He leans over and gives me a soft peck on the lips. I wouldn't change a thing about you, Melanie Elise Flynn. Not a single thing. And nobody would believe you, my little liar. Jason will, I taunt. Probably. That's why I don't ever want to hear about how smart doctors are. He opens his door and hops out. By the time I get my own door open, he's already at my side. Not sure how to dress for the occasion, I went with a pair of fitted black pants and a purple top. Adam intertwines our fingers, and before we reach the first step of the house, the front door swings open. Ethan, they're here, a young woman yells. As soon as we step over the threshold, she wraps herself around Adam in a tight hug. His arms hang to the side, and he looks straight ahead. She pulls away and grabs his face. She runs her hands on his skin, almost as if she's trying to make sure that he's really here and not just a figment of her imagination. This is my wife, Mel, Adam says slowly, while he extricates himself from his sister. They look alike, but not as much as Adam and Ethan. She looks away from Adam and offers me a genuine smile. I relax and smile back. Ethan's frame fills the entryway. There's a little boy hiding behind his legs and poking his head out. The three-legged dog Adam told me about comes shuffling through and starts to sniff my hand. That's Ralph, the little boy says. I offer him a smile, but he ducks behind his father's legs. Hi, Uncle Adam, I hear him say. Hey, buddy, Adam says. Melanie, so nice to meet you. I'm Elizabeth. She takes me in a bone-crushing hug while Adam offers Ethan his hand. Ethan shakes it, but pulls Adam into a hug, too. Come in the kitchen. Tara and Vincent have been cooking all day, Ethan says. That's when I notice the little boy is wearing an apron over his clothes. We follow them down a long hallway. The house is beautifully decorated and inviting, the walls are lined with family pictures, and in the middle, there's a picture of Vincent, Ethan, and Tara. They're all wearing matching shirts and smiling happily. He's here, Tara says, when we step into the kitchen. I'm Tara, and you must be Melanie. She hugs me and turns to Adam. She puts her fist up and playfully punches his arms. Keep your hands to yourself unless you're cruising for a bruising, she jokes. A laugh escapes and some of the tension leaves. Adam raises both hands in surrender and smiles for the first time in hours. You guys didn't have to go through all this trouble, Adam says, looking around. The island is covered with food, and the smells coming from the kitchen make my stomach growl. No trouble, Tara says. I love to cook, and I have my little sous chef and a bonus chef, and we're really happy you two are here. We've been looking forward to getting to know you both. As soon as the words are out of Tara's mouth, another little boy wearing an apron comes running into the kitchen. He doesn't stop until he bumps into Vincent, and they both start to giggle. This is Evan. He's staying with us until we go back to New York on Sunday, she says. Evan is Vincent's best friend, and he and his father live in their building. Evan's dad is a basketball player for the Manhattan Mischiefs and is on a series of away games. Can we go watch my dad play? When Tara tells them yes, both boys take off their aprons and run out of the kitchen. Loud silence follows once the kids are gone and the five adults stand awkwardly in the kitchen. Adam throws an arm casually over my shoulders while everyone looks at us. How about some wine? Tara asks. Ethan, wine! She snaps her fingers at him while she laughs. Ethan takes a predatory step closer to her, but she stands to her full height. I'm not scared of you, she says. He leans down and gives her a loud kiss on the cheek before going to the fridge. He pulls out two bottles of white wine and grabs a bottle of red from the wine rack above the fridge. After pouring white for me and Tara and red for everyone else, we all stand and look around the kitchen. Adam, who's never been much of a drinker, downs his wine in one large gulp and pours himself a second. Tara, do you need any help? I ask to try and break the tension. 
Whatever you're cooking smells amazing. Tara sips her wine while she contemplates what to say. She puts the glass down and offers me a smile that lights up her face. You know what? Yes, I do. You're not a guest. You're family. So I'm going to put you to work. She walks to the pantry and comes back with an apron for me. And Ethan is useless in the kitchen and never ask Elizabeth to help. All she does is taste and drink wine. That's not the room I excel in, baby. Now go make my dinner. To prove his point, Ethan slaps her ass before he pulls her close and kisses her lips. He then grabs the bottle of red and fills his own glass before refilling Adam's. The similarities are undeniable. Adam's a little bit taller, but Ethan is still an incredibly tall man. Ethan might be a little leaner, but their body types are the same. They even stand the same. The only difference other than the height is a touch of gray at Ethan's temples. But they're even dressed alike. Both are wearing a blue button-down shirt with gray pants. Has anyone else noticed that Ethan and Adam are dressed alike? I ask, talking louder than usual. It's been a long day and I skipped lunch. The second glass of wine has gone straight to my head. Everyone laughs. Even Adam lets out a chuckle as he runs his hand over his shirt. I think I wear it best, Adam says. I look at him, stunned at his joke. When he catches my eye, I blow him a kiss and he winks at me. I turn to the feast Tara's prepared. There are several different dishes, from chicken to pot roast and pan-seared salmon. My stomach growls and Tara pulls out a platter of cheese and crackers from the fridge. I listen in while Adam makes polite conversation with Ethan and Elizabeth. Despite his earlier joke, I can tell he feels ill at ease around his new family. His voice is lacking its usual playfulness and confidence. Ethan leaves him alone long enough to grab the plates, but Tara shakes her head no and tells him she's got it. I don't miss his grateful smile and quick but heated kiss he gives her. While she puts the food on the table, I set the dishes and silverware. The kids ask to eat in the living room so they can watch basketball, leaving the adults alone in the massive kitchen. I can see why she loves to cook in here. She has a dual range, pristine white cabinets, and stainless steel appliances. The kitchen island alone can sit eight. The countertops are marble. It's beautiful enough to be in a magazine. The table is quiet, but I'm too busy enjoying my salmon to think much about it. But then Adam puts one of his massive hands on my thigh. I lay a hand on top of his and squeeze it. This is a beautiful house. I do my best to erase some of the tension. I love this kitchen. Thanks, Tara says. We're still in the decorating phase. We had to move quickly when this became available. Oh, I ask, fishing for information. Knowing exactly what I'm doing, Adam squeezes my thigh. I assumed you were only renting this for the week. Nope, it's ours, Ethan says but he doesn't offer any more information. So, I say, clearing my throat and changing the subject, how did you two meet? Tara looks at Ethan, and they both burst into laughter. It was the best day of her life, Ethan says. Worst day of mine. She's made my life hell from the moment I introduced myself. Elizabeth rolls her eyes. Don't listen to them. They can't go five minutes without kissing. It's sick. My dad had a chain of toy stores. Brad Cole bought us out, putting me out of a job, Tara says. False. She had a job at Brad Cole, but she turned it down. She was a brat from the moment I laid eyes on her. I had no choice but to make her fall in love with me, Ethan says. What about you two? We were neighbors. He was a nuisance, but when we went to Vegas for a mutual friend's wedding... I looked at him, and I just knew. Elizabeth and Tara swoon. It was the opposite for us. He got me in trouble with my dad, and I wanted to end his life, Tara tells us. You got yourself in trouble with your dad for acting like a brat. Tara makes a fist at Ethan, and he waves her off. What do you do for a living, Melanie? 
Elizabeth takes the focus off Ethan and Tara and puts me on the spot. Everyone calls me Melly, and do you really not know? Part of me believes they did a background check on me as soon as they learned I had married their brother. We don't, Elizabeth assures me. I'm in risk management. In fact, I used to work for Bradco's risk management department before I moved to Boston. I commute from Paramus to Manhattan twice per week and work remotely the rest of the time. I've seen Ethan's picture on the company website, but I never put it together that you two look alike. I'm kicking myself now. Really? Well, I didn't know that. How did you like working there? Ethan asks. I love the company. You pay well and the benefits were amazing. But my department was dysfunctional. It was really an ugly time in my life, to be honest. I can't say I miss it, I tell them. What happened? Ethan asks. It was a lifetime ago. It doesn't matter. I let out a nervous laugh and curse myself for bringing this up. It matters, Mel. What happened? And why am I just now hearing about this dysfunctional department? I arch an eyebrow at Adam, mentally calling him out on his hypocrisy, but he only stares at me right back and waits for my response. It's not often Adam is upset. The first was the night he came back from Vegas, and I denied we were married. The other was two nights ago, when Ethan appeared on our doorstep. I've let it go. Besides, I'm sure everyone wants to hear about you, not me. I clear my throat, grab my drink, and hope they change the subject. I'm really interested in hearing about it, Ethan persists. If a department in my company is dysfunctional, I need to know. Me too, my husband puts down his fork and looks at me. I know from the look in his eyes he won't drop the subject until I tell him everything. I take a deep breath before I start talking. The risk manager there sexually harassed me. We were working late one night, and he touched me, so I hit him. He came after me, and I grabbed a hole puncher and hit him in the face with it. He called the police and said I assaulted him. There was another person working with us, but she backed up his story. I was arrested, and he pressed charges, but they were eventually dropped. I left New Jersey and moved to Boston with my brother and never looked back. Ethan's blue eyes darken at the table, and for a split second, I want to slap myself for telling that story. Of course he won't believe me. This is his company, and I'm a stranger. What's his name? Adam's voice is low, but I can hear the anger brewing. I'm gonna find him and show him what getting assaulted is really like when I shove my foot up his arse. His brogue thickens with each angry word. Oh, Adam, leave it alone. He ignores me and turns to Ethan. Get me his name, he hisses to his brother. And what the hell kind of people do you hire? He fucking put his hands on my wife. I run a hand down his thigh, but that doesn't calm him down. In fact, his face has turned red, so I don't bother reminding him that I wasn't his wife when this happened. Go ruin his life, baby. Tara says, right before Ethan stands up from the table and excuses himself. I sit there, stunned at the turn of events. Guys, it's okay. I'm over it. It's definitely not okay, Elizabeth says. That's not allowed at Bradco, and you're our family now, Melly. We take care of each other. 44. Adam. I seethe sitting next to my wife. Now I understand why she moved from New Jersey. Her bitch mother was only part of the reason. I lift her hand to my lips, excuse myself, and stand. Adam, sit down, Mel says. Come on. His office is down the hall and to the left, Tara says, knowing exactly where I'm going. I get there just as he's ending the call. The door is cracked open and he waves me in. Did you find him? I get straight to the point, and he points an index finger at his computer. I walk around and see a photo of the asshole who dared touch my wife. I need his address, I tell Ethan. Now, I'll take care of it. I'm going to find out as much about him as I can. I'm still going to fuck him up, I say. 
He stands, but I lift my hands. Imagine if it were Tara. A flash of anger crosses his face and his left cheek ticks. I get it. I'd want to rip his throat out, but it will be much more satisfying to ruin his life in other ways. Fire him and make it impossible for him to get another job. I want to be there when you confront him. You'll have to come to New York. Fine, but let's keep that part between us. You can't hit him, he warns. I'm mollified by that, and I let him believe that I agree. I nod, walk out of his office, and return to my wife. Guys, I was just making conversation, not trying to start World War III, Melly says. Mel, either Ethan handles it, or I'll find this guy and kill him with my bare hands. Those are the only options on the table. I lay my hand back on her thigh and give her a reassuring squeeze. Okay, Mel says, raising both hands. She picks up her wine glass, drinks it, and returns to her fish. Since I don't want to have to visit you in prison, we'll let Ethan handle it. Everyone exhales and returns to their food. Tara pats Ethan's cheek and he puts his fork to her lips. You guys really didn't have to go through all this trouble for us, I tell them, suddenly feeling self-conscious. But thank you. It's no trouble, Tara says. We have a chef at home, so I only get to cook on the weekends, and that's only if we don't go out. Oh, she says. Our wedding is Memorial Day weekend, so we want you two there. If you could try to come for a few days before the wedding, we'd love to have you. You're welcome any time, though, but try to come at least by the Wednesday before. And my shower is next month, and we'd love for you to come to that, Melly. It's girls only, so maybe Ethan, Vincent, and Adam can spend some time together. I stiffen. It's one thing if Mel's with me, but being alone with him is another. It's not girls only anymore, Tara. Your dad and brother got to Vicky and we changed it. So, Melly and Adam, you two can stay with me when you come for the shower, Elizabeth orders. Why do they have to stay with you? We have more room, Ethan says. My place is not exactly small, Ethan. You never ever have any food in your fridge. What are you going to feed them? Wilted kale? Ethan rolls his eyes. Elizabeth picks up a dinner roll and throws it at him, but he catches it and takes a bite. Don't listen to him. I have food, Elizabeth assures us. I like kale, I tell them. Elizabeth smiles smugly at Ethan. Ew, I don't, Mel says. Tara catches my eye and she smiles while Ethan and Elizabeth continue to bicker over me. Mel squeezes my thigh. Why, I ask, interrupting their back and forth. I don't mean to be rude, but why do you care about me? Why go through all this effort for your bastard half-brother? A year ago, you had no idea I existed. I guess I just don't understand why you care. I don't like that word. If anyone was a bastard, it was our father. You're our brother, and we want to get to know you. We know you're reluctant, but get to know us before you decide you're not interested. You might like us, Ethan says. <laughs> I don't even like you, Tara snorts. Mel looks at me, and even though she's not talking, I know what she's telling me with her eyes. She wants me to give them a chance. You better like me after all the drama you've brought to my life, Ethan says to his fiance. The drama I've brought to your life, Tara asks, eyes wide while she turns to me and Mel. Meanwhile, I've talked to his ex-wife three times today. Are you two friends? I ask her. No, Tara and Ethan say at once. The therapist is the one who suggested Lindsay contact you about Vincent. Ethan does his best to defend himself. Uh, thank goodness, because I sure as hell don't want to talk to her. So I'm in therapy with my fiancé and his ex-wife. Who do you think brought the drama to who? Whom, Ethan corrects. Well, thank you, Professor. He leans over and kisses her softly. But at least your taste has improved in the wife department. He smiles tenderly down at her before kissing her cheek. It has, hasn't it? He turns from her, looks at us, and says, Just wait until you meet my third wife. He bends to kiss her again, but she moves away. Unable to stop myself, a loud laugh escapes, and I cover my mouth with my hand. Tara pretends to be upset, but she can't stop smiling. Come on, you walked right into that one, Ethan says. You did, Tara, Elizabeth agrees. The meal continues and everyone, including me, relaxes. The kids return, begging for dessert, but Ethan tells them to go finish their dinner first. We're planning a wedding, too, Mel says. 
We're already married, but Adam's mom gave us a guilt trip about seeing her only son married in a church. Adam caved. Ours is the first Saturday of August. I smile at the story, but my heart constricts at the mention of my mother. You'll have to come to ours, too. Tara and Elizabeth both shriek with excitement at the mention of the wedding. Tara jumps up, runs out of the room, and returns with an iPad. They start talking about dresses and floral arrangements. Tara walks around and shoves the iPad in our faces. This is my bridal bouquet. She swipes and shows several different pictures of floral arrangements, which all look the same to me, but I know better than to say that out loud. Ethan was absolutely no help when we looked at flowers, Tara complains. He just sat there and said everything was nice. He actually went with you. Adam hasn't done a single thing, but I have his mom and she's amazing, Mel says. I don't know anything about any damn flowers, Mel, I say in my defense. And you always say my taste is horrible. No, I didn't go to the florist, Ethan says. The florist came to us, and so did the baker and the caterers and the wedding planner and everyone else. The wedding dress designer would have come too, but Tara didn't want me around for that. What was his name again? He was <laughs> interesting, Ethan says with a laugh. When Tara says the name of the designer, Mel drops her fork on the plate. Show off, Tara says. He was willing to come to you, Mel asks. Ethan shrugs and says, Isn't that how it works? Tara elbows him in the ribs. Yes, but I went to him instead. He's designing my wedding dress. Mel's eyes and mouth open at the same time. Wow, is all she says. It turns out no one turns down Ethan Bradford or his fiance. I told you I was powerful that night. You begged me to be your man. Ethan reminds Tara. Oh, please. Tara waves a dismissive hand at Ethan. Someone begged that night, but it wasn't me. Enough, kids, Elizabeth says. Melly, do you have pictures of your dress? Melly jumps up and pulls her phone out of her purse. When I try to look over at it, she twists her body so I can't see. Let's go upstairs, Tara says. You'll have to come to my bachelorette, too. Melly pauses and looks at me. She searches my face, probably wondering if it's okay for her to leave me alone with my brother. I'll, um, show you guys later. She sits down and puts her hand on my lap. Adam needs me. The girls look deflated, and I feel like an ass. I lift her hand to my lips and kiss it. You're only going upstairs, Mel. I promise. I'll be all right. I told you I'd be here for you the entire time, she whispers. I'll yell if I need you. Go talk girly stuff, because you know I'm useless when it comes to that. I have too much testosterone. She stands up, kisses me one last time, and runs out of the room with Tara and Elizabeth, leaving me alone with Ethan for the first time since he barged into my apartment two days ago. But we're not alone for long. The boys come running back with their empty plates and beg for dessert. Ethan gets up and gives them some cookies and ice cream. When the boys take their dessert and run, Elizabeth returns, searching for her cell phone. Instead of going back upstairs, she takes Mel's empty seat next to me. Do you want dessert? Ethan asks, and I shake my head no. So, Tara and Melly seem to be getting along. It looks like it, is all I can say, and then I add, Mel loves all that girly shit. Does that mean you two will come to New York for our wedding and some of the stuff before? Don't know why you'd want me there. I shrug and reach for my water glass. You're our brother, and now I know that I like you. I'm taken aback and look at him, brows furrowed and confused by his admission. Your reaction to Melly's confession. Any man who wants to protect his wife is okay with me. The way you were with Vincent and Ralph when you came here to kick my ass. And whether you like it or not, we're family. We share a father, and I want you in my life. Me too. Elizabeth wraps her arms around mine and lays her head on my shoulder. I ignore their confession, but I say, Was he a good father to you too? He didn't come around much, and when he did, he was never really interested in me. It wasn't until I was older that I realized I was his dirty little secret. Ethan pours himself another glass of wine, drains it, and leans back in his chair. You think that, because we were his legitimate family, he was better to us? When I nod, he continues. He wasn't. He was a philanderer, a gambler, and a liar. I will say that he had moments when he was a good businessman, 
He was a wizard with numbers and could smell a good investment from a mile away, but that's it. In his personal life, he was selfish. The only person he was good to was himself. He viewed me as just an extension of him and not my own person. He never took Elizabeth seriously about her education or her career. Elizabeth lets out a sad laugh and says, His advice to me was to find a rich husband. So, no, he wasn't good to us either. Luckily, our mom was a good woman, but she couldn't be mom and dad. He treated her horribly, too. I'm sorry. Not knowing what else to say, I turn away from Ethan and look down at the table. Neither one of us grew up with a father, Adam, but I had my mother and sister. It sounds like you have a good mother, too. I do. And my ma has a big family, so I always had that, including my crazy Uncle Finn. Yes, the procurer of snakes, Ethan says. Of anything I wanted. Looking back, I think he tried to make up for me not having a father, but he went way overboard and spoiled me. I said I wanted a snake, so he went out and got me a snake. And Ma let me keep it because she felt guilty about me not having a father. Ethan nods at me and seems to be pondering his next words, but I speak again. When I was around 19, I got into some trouble. I got into a fight and was arrested. Ma called our father, and he sent a lawyer who made everything go away. But he never showed up. All I wanted was for him to show up for me. Just once. Elizabeth's arms tighten around mine. I'm not him. Not at all. Neither is Elizabeth. Don't judge us because of something he did. And we don't blame your mother for anything. She's not the only woman he cheated on our mother with. I wish I had known about you twenty years ago. I would have found your mother and begged her to let us know our brother. And had we known about your troubles, we would have come. We would have shown up, Ethan says. I look to the stairs, willing Mel to come down because I don't know what to say to that. I've done everything to forget I had siblings, and when they found out about me, I made it clear I wasn't interested. But they persisted, and they are nothing like I thought they would be. I think I would have liked that. I can see my nine-year-old self being obsessed with my twenty-one-year-old brother. I clear my throat and look up at the ceiling to avoid looking at his face. I wasn't allowed at the funeral. We found out he died when a lawyer showed up on our doorstep a week later. He had already been buried. That's the way he wanted it. Ethan sighs and rubs his face. He nods sadly and says, I'm sorry. I open my mouth to tell him it's not his job to apologize for our father. But I shut up when I hear laughter and footsteps coming down the stairs. When Mel sees me, she stops and looks into my eyes. It's as if she's trying to gauge my mood. I wave her over to me and smile at her. I pat my lap and she sits and presses her warm lips to my temple. You okay? She asks. He's fine, Ethan tells her. I didn't beat him up. <laughs> as if you could, I snort. But I can. Remember what I told you, Tara says, putting up one of her tiny fists. Okay, maybe you can, I concede. She smiles at me and reaches over to take Ethan's hand. The boys come running back, begging for more dessert. Ralph follows them this time, and he puts his one front paw on Mel's lap. When she scratches behind his ears, he puts his head on her knee. My dad already scored 30 points, and it's only halftime, Evan says. Ethan grabs a remote and turns on a flat-screen TV on the wall. The announcers are talking, but the camera is on a young woman who is looking down at her phone, texting. Did you know your sister was there? Ethan asks Tara. I always know where my sister is. Tara's phone lights up as soon as the words leave her mouth. She picks it up and shakes it. Guess who she's texting? My dad says Vicky drives him crazy, Evan says. Yeah, her sister drives me crazy too, Ethan replies. We made the cookies, Vincent says. He and his friend are both standing in front of me. You look just like my dad, he stares at me. He wishes, Ethan says. He sure does, baby, Tara chuckles. Yeah, you would be so lucky to look like me, I say back. I'm taller than he is, and younger, and more fit. Oh, and I box. Show off much, Ethan says. Can you teach us to fight? 
Evan says. Yeah, everyone should know how to defend themselves. Come on. Mel gets up from my lap and the boys follow me to the living room. 45. Melly. Between the dog barking, the boys talking and laughing, and Adam's grunting, the house is alive with activity. Tara and Elizabeth plate cookies and ice cream, and I smile in relief at how amazing tonight has gone. I want this for him, and when I look at Elizabeth, she's wiping tears from her eyes. She did that upstairs, too. It's going great, she says to no one in particular. Tara yells that dessert is ready, and Adam comes walking into the kitchen with a boy hanging off each of his biceps. Little resistance training before I put the sugar in my body. Both boys giggle when Adam uses them as weights. Do you have strawberry for Mel? She's the only person I know who eats strawberry ice cream. I stick my tongue out at him, and he wiggles his eyebrows at me. No, but I'll remember that for when you guys come to New York, Tara says. We'll have a good time, I promise. And we'll be here until Sunday, and we want to see you guys every day until we leave. Adam, you can't avoid us anymore. Elizabeth hands him a plate of cookies and vanilla ice cream. She runs a hand through his hair and caresses his face. This time, he doesn't move away. I would have put a dress on you and forced you to play Barbies with me if we had known about you. The announcement surprises everyone, and we all burst into laughter. Adam blushes and says, As if I would ever wear a dress. You have, I tell the table about how Adam's mom prayed he would be a girl. When he denies ever wearing a dress, I show everyone the picture of a six-month-old Adam in a pink frilly dress, complete with a matching headband. I think the sparkly headband is my favorite part. Tara giggles uncontrollably at the picture, and everyone else laughs, even Adam. Wait until I get my hands on her, he says of his mother. But I do look good in pink. While we enjoy dessert, I rest a hand on Adam's lap. We're having a Fourth of July party in Montauk. Not sure where we'll celebrate Labor Day, but we'll let you know. And Thanksgiving and Christmas, of course. Tara's birthday is at the end of November. Ethan's birthday is on New Year's Eve. And Tara's planning a party. Vincent's birthday is... When is your birthday? Adam asks Elizabeth. She sits there, stunned by the question. Tears pool in her eyes and she croaks. It's September 19th. Will you come? Elizabeth, Adam and Mel have families too, Ethan reminds her. Yes, but we've never had them for any holidays. You can bring all your family. We'd love to meet your mother, Adam. But you're not pushing us away anymore. You have to listen to me. I'm your big sister, she says. She stares at him, almost daring him to contradict her. Is that how it works? Adam says. Yes. Since when? You never listen to me, and I'm your big brother, Ethan says. That's different, Elizabeth impatiently waves him off. I'm not about to let a man tell me what to do, brother or not. Oh, but you can tell Adam what to do? Ethan puts his dessert down and waves Elizabeth off the same way she did him. Yes, he's the baby, Elizabeth says. While they argue about who has the most authority, I grab Adam's face and search his eyes. I relax when he mouths that everything is good. Unable to help myself, I give him a light peck on the lips. I like them, I whisper in his ear. No assholery anywhere in this house, stud. I trust you, he says simply. Thank you for doing this with me. Where else would your wife be? He wraps his arms around me and squeezes me to him. So, Tara says, interrupting our moment. She looks around the room and clears her throat. So, the wedding. You'll come? Adam turns to me, and I nod. Mel says yes. So we'll be there. They all cheer and even Adam cracks a smile. And what we talked about upstairs, Melly. Tara lowers her voice and nervously looks at Adam. I'll send you the dress and shoes for you to try. Let me know what you want to do after that. 
Tara grabs her phone and starts to text. When she's done texting, Adam asks, What other stuff did you guys talk about? Do you mean your shower and bachelorette party? Yes, but since my siblings and Elizabeth will be in the wedding, I thought I'd ask Melly too. Well, he thought you wanted us to be there as guests. Adam turns to Tara, likely for clarification, but I put a piece of cookie to his mouth. I'm relieved when he opens wide and I shove it in. Totally, but Melly fell in love with the dress when I showed her a picture. She'd be doing me a favor because I need someone to escort my brother down the aisle. His eyebrows shoot up to his forehead. I knew Tara was up to something when she insisted on showing me the bridesmaid dress. I offer him a big spoonful of ice cream, but he pushes my spoon away. Let me get this straight. You want my wife to walk down the aisle on the arm of another man? Adam asks. Not if you're in the wedding, too. I mean, I'll just have to find someone else for Alan, Tara says with a secret smile. Adam narrows his eyes at her, but he finally smiles back. Oh, I see what you're doing. When Tara feigns innocence by batting her eyelashes, he says, I need to watch out for you. Tara smiles like she just won a contest. We'll get back to you on the other stuff. We have to look at our schedules. And I don't know if Mel wants to do all of that or if she can get the time off. He turns to me and says, It's up to you, love. I told you I'd trust you with this. I want to do it, I tell him. It will be fun, and I really like everybody here. Our gaze is locked, and I hold my breath, wishing and praying I haven't pushed him too far. I guess we'll be going to New York a lot in the next two months. Elizabeth hugs and kisses his cheek. I get off his lap to give her room. Adam stands, too, and this time he hugs her back. And yes, we'll come for your birthday. Adam says to her. I'm not sure if that's what causes it, but she starts to cry. What? Why Elizabeth's birthday? Mine is New Year's Eve. That's way more fun. Ethan whines. Jesus, yours too, Ethan, Adam says, pretending to be annoyed. He waves Ethan over, and the three share a group hug. Tara looks on with tears in her eyes. She walks around the table and joins the hug, gesturing for me to join them. Group hug, Elizabeth says through her tears. 46. Adam. Love, the minute we step inside, I'm going to spread you open and slide between those thighs, right inside that hot wetness. I put a hand between her legs and squeeze her pussy. She lets out a shameless moan, and I curse the fact that I'm still driving us home from dinner with my brother and sister. Just thinking that feels surreal. I have cousins, all of them in Ireland, but I've never had that sibling bond. Not like the one Mel has with Jason, or Dennis has with Marlo. I'll probably never have that kind of closeness with Ethan and Elizabeth. But tonight was a good start. Better than I ever would have thought. Try faster, Mel murmurs. She runs a hand through my hair and I shiver, right before I curse at stopping for a red light. This is only delaying me getting inside my wife. Her hand in my hair is driving me insane. I take it and put it right on my very hard cock. It's begging to be taken out and played with. Mel bites her lower lip while she strokes me over my pants. Bad idea, I say as I remove her hand. I'll either jizz in my pants like a thirteen-year-old or crash this car. Neither of those is a good thing. I lift her hand to my lips and kiss her knuckles. The light turns green and I pull through the intersection. It's late. We stayed longer than I intended. We stayed a few hours after the boys had gone to bed. We talked about nothing at all, but the conversation flowed and we laughed. Once I agreed to come to the wedding and all the events leading to it, it was like a fog lifted and with it, all the awkwardness slipped away. They aren't what I thought. I was expecting Ethan to be like our father, haughty and dismissive. Father always had the air of being better than everyone else, even me and my mom. But Ethan and Elizabeth aren't like that. They were funny and laid back. Ethan was a single father until he met Tara, and they tease each other mercilessly. I was wrong about them. The rest of the ride home is quiet, 
It's as if the city knows how much I need to get home because we are not impeded by any more red lights. It takes us half the time to get home as it did to go to dinner. By the time I help Mel out of the car, my pants are ready to burst from my need to have her. Without a word of warning, I lift her off her feet, and she wraps her legs around me at the same moment her warm lips meet mine. I devour her, and on instinct, I walk from the detached garage up to the few steps and through the back door. Thankfully, neither Jason, Alex, or my mother-in-law poke their heads out. I wouldn't stop if they did. I can't. My need to have her is greater than my manners. By the time I open and close the front door, I no longer have any control. I break the kiss and put her on her feet only so I can rip her coat off and lift her sweater over her head. The red lacy bra is next. I attack one of her perfect nipples right after, and I sigh in contentment when her fingers go through my hair and caress the nape of my neck. Adam, she whispers, so breathless I can barely hear her. You have on too many clothes. When I pull away to unbutton my coat, she reaches for my belt and zipper, and we leave a trail of clothes and shoes on the way to the bedroom. The door is still off the hinges. We didn't tell the landlord I lost my temper, and I haven't had time to fix it, so the door remains wide open while I push her down on the bed. Her legs hang off the side, and I kneel between them and remove the matching red thong. Don't you ever wear those panties without me around. Once they're off... I kiss her hip bone and trace my tongue to her pussy. I spread her open, and before my mouth reaches her, I can feel the heat coming from her core. I run my hand over her slit, and she moans my name. She's wet. I could slide my dick inside her right now and make her scream in ecstasy, but I need to taste her on my tongue first. I eat her like a starving man who hasn't had a meal in weeks. She's like a ripe peach bursting with sweetness, so much of it that I could eat it for hours, if not days. She trembles underneath me, and with no warning at all, she comes in my mouth, giving me the sweetness that I'm always craving. Adam, she moans. Jesus, I know she wants to say more, but can't. Move to the middle of the bed, I order, and once she does, I remove my boxers and toss them to some far corner of the room. Spread your legs for me, love. I want to see that pussy that just came on my tongue. I take a moment to admire her wet cunt. It's pink, and it glistens with moisture. I ache to taste it again, but my dick will scream in protest if I make it wait any longer, so I don't. I climb on top of my wife and slide inside of her. I slide home. I take her fast. I'm not gentle when I take hold of her hips and keep her in place. I know my handprints will be there in the morning, but I love leaving marks on her otherwise flawless skin. I stick my head in the crook of her neck and suck at her skin. She widens her legs and starts to grind underneath me. I want to squeeze her to make her stay still, worried that any friction she gives me will push me over the edge. But I can't. She feels too good. Her moans drive me crazy, and I pick up my pace, swirling my hips in slow circles while I go deep inside her wet pussy. It doesn't take me long at all to erupt inside of her, washing her walls with my release. I shut her on top, but she grabs my ass, pushing me deeper into her. Once I'm spent and have caught my breath, I roll off her body, and she cuddles to my side. Remember the other night when you said it took you an entire two days to realize you love being married to me? I ask my wife while I run my fingers through her hair. She throws a leg over my body and moves closer. Mm-hmm, she moans. What happened to make you love it? Are you fishing for compliments, Mr. Flynn? She asks with an eye roll. I sure am, Mrs. Flynn. Two years you made me chase you. I've earned every single compliment you give me. She runs a hand over my chest and down to my stomach. I let out a little yelp when she bites my shoulder. I liked being up here with you. I was freaking out, and you were so sweet and patient with me. You took care of me and made me feel wanted. I never felt wanted before. 
and I knew I was the one who made you marry me. So I chose to be in the marriage and to be your wife. I was so afraid. Afraid of letting go, only to lose you in the end. I didn't think you were going to do it. I just knew you'd freak out the instant we stepped inside that chapel, but you surprised me. And, love, you didn't make me marry you. I wanted to. I've always wanted you. I just wish it hadn't taken us all this time. She sighs and lays her head on my chest. I don't think it would have worked any sooner, Adam. I wasn't ready. I had to learn to like myself first. Had we gotten together before that, we would have crashed and burned. I wouldn't have let us. But I'm glad you're ready now because I don't think I can ever let you go, Mal. And thank you for helping me today. You say that I take care of you. But you've been taking care of me, too. Even more so since Ethan barged in. I meant what I said. I trust you. And if you believe they are sincere, then I'll give them a chance. She throws an arm across my torso and hugs me tight as she peppers my face with kisses. I'm happy for you, stud. She climbs on top of me, straddling me and letting that wet pussy coat my lower abdomen. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Now, ride your husband's dick. 47. Adam. I might be home a little late tonight. Mel leans in and I kiss her hard on the lips. I need a good workout. I avoid looking at her, fearing she'll know what I'm about to do, but she gifts me with a smile so beautiful I forget everything else. Okay, I'll make dinner unless you want to go out. If everything goes as planned, I should be back around dinner time. If there's any delay, I'm fucked. Does this mean cheapskate Mel is letting us spend money on eating out this weekend? You didn't protest when I got us coffee. You even ordered a large. I lift my Starbucks cup and shake it at her. It must be some kind of miracle. She lets out a laugh and a blush spreads across her cheeks. Let's stay in. We'll go out tomorrow. Do you think there's a chance that slutty Mel might come out and play tonight? She leans in close again, so close that our lips practically touch. I think that's pretty much a guarantee. She gives me a feather-soft kiss on the lips. I want to deepen it, but I don't have the time. So I hop out of the car, walk to her side, and open her door for her. I'm double-parked and don't have time to walk her inside today. I'm on a tight, tight schedule. I love you. I do have time to pull her into my arms and give her one more kiss. She walks to the revolving door, waves, and disappears inside the hospital. The instant she's no longer in my line of vision, I jump inside my truck and drive through the busy Friday morning traffic. It takes me longer to merge onto I-93 towards Logan International Airport, but I make it and park my car in plenty of time to make my flight. Ethan offered to send me a private plane for the 45-minute flight to New York, but I told him I'd get there on my own. I have no regrets until I squeeze into a middle coach seat between two very hefty older women. They both look at me as if my presence is an imposition, and the person in front of me pushes his seat all the way back, squishing my long legs. The flight is quick, and less than an hour after taking off, the wheels hit the runway. The driver Ethan sent is standing at the luggage claim holding a sign with my name on it. Since I have no luggage, we walk out and into a warm and waiting escalade. So far everything is right on schedule. I'll meet him at his office, do what I came to do and be on a flight back to Boston in a few hours, leaving my wife none the wiser. I close my eyes while the driver takes me to his midtown office. I've only been to this city a few times. I've always disliked New York, probably because this was where my father lived with his other family. My eyes stay shut during the entire ride to the office. I know it's loud and congested. That's enough for me. The traffic is heavy from LaGuardia to Midtown. It takes over 40 minutes for the driver to pull in front of the sleek building. I text him that I've arrived, careful to only text him and not the group text that Elizabeth started the Sunday after they left Boston, where she, Mel, and Tara text constantly. Ethan does too, so much so that I wonder when he has time to run his conglomerate. That was the first message I sent, asking when the hell any of them do any work. I'm surprised they've gone this long without texting, in fact. 
I follow Ethan's directions, take the elevator to the 30th floor, and walk through the double glass doors. Once I get through, a tall man approaches, but he doesn't get a word in before Ethan's office door opens and the man himself walks out. He's in complete contrast with last week's casual attire. He's in a bespoke suit today, and I notice he's gotten a haircut since I saw him five days ago. He offers me his hand and ushers me inside his posh office where I find Elizabeth and Tara. Elizabeth flies into my arms before I can utter so much as a good morning. I hug her back, and when she pulls away, I kiss her cheek. Right on cue, the tears fall, and she walks away in time for Tara to hug me. Well, the prodigal Bradford has finally deigned to come to the Big Apple, the man I saw outside the door says. He offers me his hand and says, I'm Hunter Franco, the man behind the boss. I run everything up here. Ethan rolls his eyes and gestures for Hunter to leave, but he doesn't. He turns to me and says, I have no idea the amount of stress you caused me. Excuse me, I ask. Tara lets out a laugh and so does Elizabeth. The boss has been twisting himself like a pretzel to get to you. It's about time. He crosses his arms and when I turn to Ethan, he smirks at me. You're lucky I didn't come find you myself. Hunter has gotten too comfortable since he not only became friends with Tara, but with Tara's sister. I can't get away from him, Ethan says. I'll see you Sunday for the family brunch, Hunter says to Ethan. Then he points to me and says, And you, play nice with your brother and sister. And with that, he walks out of the office and leaves us alone. I thought we were keeping this between us, I say to Ethan. I knew he was keeping something from me. I've been watching him like a hawk, Elizabeth says. I'm short on time, I announce to the room. Let's do this so I can get back home before Mel finds out I've left the state. Okay, but we're doing lunch, Elizabeth insists. I've already made the reservation, so no arguments. I check my watch and it's barely ten. The man we came to see is only a few floors down. That will give us enough time for an early lunch. I'll get home in plenty of time, especially since I told Mel I'd be going to the gym. Lunch would be nice, I tell her, and she relaxes. Well, I can't do lunch today, so I'll see you in a couple of weeks when you and Melly come for the shower. Tara gives me a hug and grabs her coat. Ethan walks her to the door and kisses her goodbye. Come find me when you two are done, Elizabeth says to Ethan. Unless you want me to come down there. No, I say far too loudly. Ethan narrows his eyes at me, but he doesn't say anything. I mean, we'll come find you when it's time for lunch. That pacifies her. She hugs me again and walks out of the room. Ethan's blue eyes turn to me. He approaches, but I stand my ground and look into his eyes. I force myself not to look away. He looks so much like our father. I'm going to do the talking. I nod in agreement. You can't hit him, remember? He adds. You're the boss. I don't think he buys my quick acquiescence. His eyes narrow again and he takes a step closer, but he nods and gestures for me to follow him to his private elevator. We go down four floors, and the second we step into the suite, the receptionist lets out a loud gasp and drops the phone she had to her ear. She stands and stammers, Mr. Bradford, is there, uh, how can I help you, sir? I had no idea you were stopping by today. She visibly swallows and starts to look at something on her computer screen. What's your name? Ethan asks. Michaela Green, sir. Michaela, I'm here to see Kent James. She looks at her computer screen and says, I don't see anything on his calendar. She's brave, this one. But the look Ethan gives her makes her take a step back. Her eyes dart from Ethan to me. She blinks twice when she sees my face. I don't need to make an appointment, he says. Yes, sir. He's in his office. She points to a door at the end of the long hallway. Ethan doesn't bother to say thank you and I follow him through the rows of cubicles until we get to his office. He bursts through the door without knocking, and the noise startles the asshole so much that he drops his coffee cup in his lap. Fuck! He jumps out of his chair, grabs a stack of napkins, and dabs at his crotch. The hot coffee is the least of his problems. James, Ethan says. He drops the napkins and finally looks up. He swallows and takes an involuntary step back. I look at the fucker. He's about six feet, and he looks like he works out. I picture him trying to intimidate my wife. I look down at his large hands and imagine them on her. 
He's lucky that hole puncher was there because if it wasn't, and he had succeeded in hurting Mel, he'd already be dead. Mel is no coward. She won't let anyone intimidate her. But this asshole is much bigger than she is. He could have easily subdued her, and I don't doubt he would have done just that if she hadn't hit him across the face. Uh, Mr. Bradford? He poses it like a question, but I can sense his nervousness from across the room. He knows something is amiss. He smooths his tie and runs a hand over his face. Is there something I can help you with? I crack my neck. That's strike one. He's already said too much. I'm here about an employee who worked here three years ago, Melanie Dupree. She was a claims specialist in this department. She only worked here two years and reported to you. He swallows again, and a sheen of sweat suddenly coats his large forehead. He walks behind his desk and takes a seat. I watch as he pretends to think about Ethan's question. He has the audacity and the balls to hold a finger up, signaling for us to wait while he searches his computer. Strike two. He looks from Ethan to me and loudly clears his throat. I can see he's trying to figure out who I am and why I'm here. Ah, yes, uh, Ms. Dupree. Flynn, I tell him. He looks up, confused by my statement. Excuse me, he says. Her last name is Flynn. She's a married woman now. And who are you? I'm Adam Flynn. He clears his throat and stares back at his computer. Yes, she was a marginal employee with a temper to boot. After giving her a poor evaluation, she decided she would attack me with a hole puncher. To the face, he adds for emphasis. Mel's a lot of things, but she's no marginal employee. I've seen her work. I've heard her on the phone. She gives that damn job her all. He looks at us and plasters an arrogant smile on his face. I grimace, and the idiot mistakes it for a smile. He visibly relaxes and sticks the final nail in his coffin. He turns the computer around and shows us a smiling picture of a young Mel with a copy of her last evaluation. You know how those types are. They want everything handed to them without doing the work. <laughs> he lets out a laugh, and when neither of us laughs back, he starts to cough to mask his embarrassment. Those types, Ethan asks. Yes, you know what I'm saying. Women. Everything is politically correct these days, but people like us, he says, gesturing between himself and Ethan. Give them a chance, and it's never enough. Strike three. Enough of this bullshit, I say to Ethan. In two quick steps, I cross the room and walk behind the asshole's desk. I pull him out of his chair, lift him off his feet, and slam him so hard against the wall that his diploma falls to the floor the glass shatters. Adam! I ignore Ethan's warning. You stupid lying sack of shit! I let go of his collar long enough to wrap my hand around his throat. He starts to kick, but I'm too close for any of his efforts to matter. His hands go to mine, doing his best to pull them from his neck. I give him just enough pressure to warn him to stop. Lucky for him, he's smart enough to drop his hands. She tells a very different story. One where you sexually harassed her and then put your dirty, filthy fucking hands on her. Who do you think I'm going to believe? I ask him. Who are you? He manages to squeak out. I'm her very pissed-off husband. And my brother. You sexually harassed my sister-in-law, James, Ethan says. He's standing in front of the desk. He crosses his arms, and from my peripheral vision I can see him shaking his head. Welcome to the consequences of your own actions. She came on to me, he lies. This time when I squeeze his neck, I add more than just a little pressure. I squeeze enough for his face to turn purple. When I ease off, he starts to cough, but I don't let him go quite yet. Say one more lie about my wife. I get closer to his face and say, I fucking dare you. I let go of his neck only long enough to grab his jaw and squeeze it with my hand. Say one more thing, I taunt. Now you know what it feels like to be at the mercy of someone bigger and stronger than you. I let him go and he falls to his knees, coughing and sputtering. I grab him and stand him up. I'm like a crazed madman. I can see Mel, 
afraid and doing her best to get away from this predator. I push him against the wall and punch him hard in his stomach. He doubles over, but I stand him up and give him two more solid punches in his ribcage. He cries out like a gutted animal and falls to the ground at my feet. Ethan looks at me and shakes his head. He texts something on his phone and slides it back into his pocket. All right, then. Security will be here to escort you out, James, he says, almost as if he's bored with this conversation. My... <coughs> James says before he starts to cough. Lawyer! He winces and starts to wheeze. He sounds like a wounded bear, and I smile, knowing I broke at least two of his ribs. Yeah, yeah, have your lawyer call my lawyer, but you might want to think twice before you open that door. My sister-in-law isn't your only victim, but it all ends today. You're done, Ethan says. And don't think that this ends here. I'm going to ruin you. He gestures for me to follow him. We walk out of the office together, shoulder to shoulder, while everyone does their best to pretend they're not looking at us. We don't speak until we get back to his office. Once he closes his door, he turns to me, but there's no anger in his eyes. He walks behind his desk, pulls out a bottle of whiskey, and pours each of us a glass. Remember the part about you not touching him? He asks. Two things you should know about me. Nobody fucks with my wife or my mother. I didn't kill him, so I consider that a victory. I down my drink in one swallow. I respect that, he says. I drop myself on the couch in the corner of his office and cover my eyes with my arm. And I suppose I have a sister now, so nobody better mess with her either. Don't tell her I said that, or she'll cry again. I'm definitely telling her, he says. 48. Adam after eating lunch at a fancy Manhattan restaurant with Elizabeth holding my arm for dear life as we walked in and out of the place, a place I never would have stepped foot in on my own or with Mel, we head back to the Bradco headquarters. I laughed when we sat down for lunch. I imagined Mel's eyes bulging out of her head at the prices listed on the menu. I can get a taxi. I'm eager to get out of this city and back home, but nobody seems to be listening to me. I have my driver downstairs, and I can take him to the airport. Elizabeth and Ethan talk about me as if I'm not in the room. I can get some more time with him. Well, I can't go. I have a meeting with the shareholders the rest of the afternoon, Ethan replies. He seems agitated, and he paces back and forth in his office. I don't need you to go, she insists. And I know you have a meeting that you can't get out of. I'm not sure, but she sounds a little smug, as if she just bested him. Oh, why would you get more time with him than me? Ethan asks. He was here with you all morning, not to mention whatever went on with Kent James. Excuse me, I say, finally having enough of this argument. When they ignore me and continue to argue, I go and lean against Ethan's mahogany desk and cross my arms. They argue for a few more minutes before they finally notice me. Are you two done? I ask. I'll grab a taxi, but I need to go now. I walk to the couch and grab my coat, but as soon as I put it on, Elizabeth wraps her arms around mine. Don't be ridiculous. Let's go, she says. I've already taken the rest of the afternoon off. Have fun in your meeting, Ethan. She says the last part like a taunt as she sticks her nose up in the air. Whatever, Ethan says. You act like he's seven. What are you going to do? Take him out for an ice cream cone in the arcade? Elizabeth looks at me almost as if to gauge my reaction to Ethan's suggestion. No to the ice cream, but yes to the arcade. Maybe next time. And I won't get you any ice cream, Ethan. She sticks her tongue out at him as we leave his office, but Ethan follows us to the elevator and hugs me before I get on. Elizabeth wraps her arm around mine again. Neither one of us say a word all the way down or while we cross the lobby and get inside the waiting Maybach. Mel sends a text to let me know that she just got home and will be working remote for the rest of the day. I text back and slide my phone in my pocket. Elizabeth talks for the next ten minutes straight without taking a breath. She tells me about her and Ethan's childhood, but I notice she never mentions our father. It's okay. You can talk about him, I tell her. She nods, but stays quiet. I breathe a sigh of relief at the sign saying that the airport is only two miles away. I miss Mel, and I feel guilty for keeping my whereabouts from her but she wouldn't have wanted me to come. There's a part of me that believes she wanted me to do something, 
Otherwise, she never would have told us this story. And my Mel has had enough bad things happen to her. My flight is scheduled to leave on time, and that will get me home in enough time to get a good workout in. So, technically, I didn't lie to my wife. But instead of exiting the highway, we drive past the exit. I look at Elizabeth, but she's looking straight ahead. She's suddenly much too quiet, and the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Elizabeth? She pretends to be engrossed in whatever she's looking at, but I say her name again. Hmm? She asks. She opens her eyes wide, faking a look of innocence. Why did you drive her past my exit? She licks her lips and reaches out to grab my hands. Hear me out, she says, and I groan. We have a house in Sands Point. It's right on the coast at a beautiful property. It's technically yours, too, since it's a Bradford property. When I start to protest, she puts both hands up. We don't have to talk about that now. You're here. It's a Friday, and I want you to spend the weekend. Please, Adam. <sighs> Elizabeth, I sigh. I put my head back on the headrest and close my eyes. We'll be here in two weeks for the shower or whatever the hell it is. Yeah, but there will be a bunch of people. I'm hosting it with Tara's sister, so I won't get much time with you. She squeezes my hand, and when I look at her, her eyes fill with tears again. I let out a string of curse words in my head. I can't take a crying woman. Please, you have to do it. I'm your big sister. I close my eyes and search for patience. I should have gone with my instincts and taken a taxi. I can't be away from my wife for an entire weekend. It's been hell being this far away from her today. I figured you'd say that. I can have her on the next flight to New York. I have a car on standby waiting to take her to the airport. She can be here in a few hours and we can spend the weekend together. Please, Adam. She squeezes my hand again, and I cave. You're going to get me in so much trouble. She doesn't know I'm here. You want me to call her for you? I smile, but I shake my head no. Let me call her. I pull out my phone, press her name, and put the phone to my ear. Hey, stud, she says. Miss you. Can't wait until you get home. Your mom sent me recipes for all your favorite meals. I'm going to surprise you tonight. Uh, about that, I begin. She goes quiet, and I can imagine her brows furrowing while she waits for me to say more. I'm in New York. When she doesn't speak right away, I pull the phone from my ear to make sure the call hasn't dropped. Adam. Her voice comes out like a resigned statement. I thought you were going to let Ethan handle it. I like it better when you call me Stud. And I did let him handle it. I only watched. Uh-huh. So you didn't hit him? Elizabeth is with me. I think I'd do a pretty good job of changing the subject. She was supposed to take me to the airport, but she wants me to stay for the weekend. Oh, okay. I can hear the disappointment in her voice. I'll miss you, but it would be good for you to spend some time with your brother and sister. Not without you, love. Elizabeth is going to send a car to take you to the airport. If you don't want to come, I'm on the next flight home. I can think of worse ways to spend the weekend. Now I understand why Elizabeth texted, asking me for a list of your favorite foods. Thanks, Mel. Pack me a bag, too. Don't forget my sneakers and workout clothes. I'm going to hand the phone to Elizabeth now. I love you. I have no shame when I blow her a loud kiss through the phone before I hand it to my sister. 49. Adam. Three long hours later, the door to Elizabeth's spacious Manhattan apartment finally opens. Our plans to go to Sands Point imploded. It started with Mel sending a message to the group text confirming the driver had picked her up and she was on her way to the airport. The instant Elizabeth noticed it was a group text, she started cursing. When Ethan called her phone not two minutes later, she ignored it, but when he kept calling, she answered and they had another fight over me. Will you come back to Manhattan? He sounds irritated by his sister. Elizabeth has put him on speakerphone by this point. If he's going to spend the weekend, then he should be with all of us. You can't steal him away and go to Sands Point. Well, this was my idea, Ethan. You didn't ask him to stay. She rolls her eyes to the ceiling and sticks her tongue out at the phone while making a face. That got a loud laugh out of me, which only prompted her to do it again. Elizabeth, 
he says as if he's doing his best to be patient. Vincent is spending the night with his mother tonight for the first time in almost a year. I want to stay close in case something happens, and he wants to come home. Otherwise, we'd all come there. Fine, but they are staying with me. She ends the call and tosses the phone in her purse. Now, finally, the light of my life has walked through the front door and everything is right with my world. I couldn't give a fuck where we stay as long as she's here. I practically sprint to the door and lift her clear off her feet. Her hands automatically go into my hair and her legs wrap around me. She tastes of peppermint and she feels like heaven. God, I've missed you, I say against her mouth. I feel like we've been apart for a month, but it's barely been nine hours. I've missed you too, but you should know I'm going to kill you as soon as I get my fill of kissing you. She kisses me again, and I don't care if we have an audience. I kiss my wife and put both hands on her plump ass. Elizabeth clears her throat and Mel jumps out of my arms. There's a knock on the door and Ethan and Tara walk in without being invited. You, Mel says to Ethan. Come here. She hugs him and gives him a chaste peck on the cheek. Thank you. He nods and then Mel hugs Tara. I don't let go of her hand while she hugs Elizabeth. I can't stop looking at her ass and her tight jeans. Hell, I reach over and put my palm on one of her ass cheeks. We're family, Ethan says. And your husband did most of the work. Oh, really? Mel turns those brown eyes back to me. You didn't hit him, did you, Adam? What if he sues? Let him, Ethan says. I had him investigated. You're not the only one he did this to. He didn't have to be taken out on a gurney, I tell her. I left him well enough to limp out. Mel's eyes widen, but she bites her bottom lip. Oh? She suddenly squeezes her thighs together and her nostrils flare. Yeah, I whisper. I hold my hand out to her, and when she gets close enough to me, she jumps back into my arms and wraps her legs around me. I only punched him in the stomach. Mm-hmm. What else did you do? I bet your muscles bulged. She kisses me deeply and I kiss her right back, completely oblivious to the other people in the room. A throat clears, but we ignore it. I might have cracked a rib or two when I punched him again. He fell to my feet like a rag doll. Oh, Adam, I... I kiss her, silencing her next words. She moans loudly in my mouth. I'm going to show Mel our room, I say to Elizabeth. Without waiting for a response, I walk to the bedroom Elizabeth had shown me earlier. Our dinner reservation is in two hours, someone yells just as I slam the door shut. 50. Melly. I didn't grow up around violence. I avoid violent movies, and until today, I thought I hated it. But hearing my husband tell me how he avenged me has me wound up tighter than a spring coil, I run my hand down his shoulders and upper back and moan at the feel of his hard body. God, this body. That's the first thing I noticed about him way back when I'd watch him work out in the backyard. I wanted to touch it even then. Now, he's my husband, and I can touch him whenever I want. Show me what you did, I whisper in his ear. Without missing a beat, he pins me to the wall, not letting my feet touch the floor. Boy, you had him against the wall like this. He lowers his voice as he inches closer. Then, boy, put my hand around his throat. A massive hand finds its way to my neck, and I let out a loud gasp of surprise. His rough hands are tender, but seeing the feral look in his eyes makes my panties wetter than they were just seconds ago. Boy, squeezed like this. He silently tightens his hand around me, but much harder. I like it hard, I whisper. I'm going to give it to you hard, he promises. And then we let him go. He drops his hand, and I immediately miss his touch. He probably thought it was over, but I caught him off guard and punched him in the stomach like this. He makes a fist and gently rubs it on my stomach. He doubled over but then I pushed him against the wall and gave him two hard hits in the ribs. He slides his hands against my rib cage and savagely sucks the base of my neck. Oh, my, I swoon. 
He lifts both of my hands over my head and ravishes my body while he presses his hard erection against me. And then what happened? He crumpled and fell to my feet like the bag of garbage he is. He captures my mouth, and I jump into his arms and wrap my legs around him. He spins us around the room and drops me on the bed, causing me to bounce. Adam, I'm going to climb you like a tree and ride you like the horniest, sluttiest cowgirl you've ever seen. He lands on top of me and kisses me senseless. Yeah, you will, but only because I say you can. Remember who is in charge in here, Mrs. Flynn. His palm covers a breast and squeezes. I throw a leg around him and start to grind, but he moves off me and orders me to undress. I happily obey, and by the time I'm naked, so is he. I lick my lips at the sight of his hard dick sticking in front of my face. I reach for it, but he grabs my hands and roughly pulls me to my feet. Not yet. He turns me around and pulls my butt on his dick, and I grind against him. I stop when he grabs an ass cheek and squeezes it for dear life. A hand snakes around my waist, and thick fingers spread my pussy lips apart. What do we have here? He whispers against my ear. Mel's hot, dripping wet pussy. Who is it wet for, love? He takes my earlobe between his teeth and bites. Who? For you, I say, nearly breathless. He presses two fingers on my clit and swirls it around. Who am I to you? My husband, I moan. He slaps my ass and bends me down on the bed, leaving my ass in the air. Yeah, I am, and you can roid the stick, but only after I see this ass bounce. And he slides inside of me with one long thrust. He takes me roughly and without apology. His hands hold onto my hips and he grinds behind me, swirling his hips and giving me long, deep strokes, all while he rubs my clit. I grab a pillow and bury my face in it to muffle my moans. Several thrusts later, a slap to the ass, added pressure to my clit, and my orgasm shoots through me like a cannon. I scream my husband's name into the pillow. He gives me no time to recover. He pulls out, slaps my ass again, and climbs on the bed. He points to his hard dick, still glistening from the remnants of my orgasm. I lick my lips and eagerly slide on. We both moan at the sensation. Ride me, cowgirl, he whispers, and I do. I snuggle against Adam's massive chest and sigh in contentment. Like always, he kisses the top of my head. Thank you, Adam, I whisper. For what, love? For coming here and righting a wrong that had been done to me. If you had told me, I would have told you no. But it means so much to me that you did this. It means everything. You don't have to thank me for that, he says. You're my wife, and I love you. I'll always right your wrongs. I melt into him and kiss right above his heart. A sudden wave of emotion hits, and I start to cry. His hands rub at the base of my neck, and I instantly calm down. What is it, love? When it happened, I don't think my mother really believed me. Not until Jason came and said he believed me. She thought I had screwed up again. The lawyer Jason hired somehow got the charges dropped, and I moved on. But you never doubted me for a second. You're my little liar, but you would never lie about something like that. He chuckles, and I bite his chest. And don't act like this is one-sided. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have you, Mel. I would have continued to push them away, but having you by my side through this is the only reason I'm here now. I climb on top of his naked body and look into his eyes. I don't think so, stud. It might have taken you a little bit longer, but Ethan and Elizabeth were never going to give up. They are too much like you in that regard. I really like them, and I'm happy that you're giving them a chance. 
The words are barely out of my mouth when I hear a loud pounding on the door, and Elizabeth yells, Dinner in one hour! Get moving! She pounds one more time, and then I hear her retreating footsteps. She's bossy, too. But I'm glad you convinced me to give them a chance, Adam says. I jump off him, and he pouts, but he climbs out of the bed, too. We'll get our bags while you hop in the shower. And Mel? He grabs my hand and pulls me to his body. That shower is big enough for the both of us. He slaps my ass as I walk into the adjoining bathroom. 51. Melly. It's unseasonably warm for early April. I let out a big yawn and continue to walk home, so eager to get inside, shower, and climb into bed with my husband. I'll put up no resistance if he wants to order out tonight. I'll even agree to eating in bed. We didn't leave New York until early this morning. Neither Elizabeth, Ethan, or Tara would let us leave. We spent the entire weekend either at Elizabeth's place or Ethan and Tara's. When Vincent got home from his mother's on Saturday afternoon, he didn't let his Uncle Adam out of his sight. When I told our hosts we needed to leave for a few hours to go see my dad, they sent a car to pick him up and bring him to Ethan's penthouse. Instead of leaving last night as planned, they put us on their private plane at 6 o'clock this morning. I went straight to the office, and Adam went directly to school. Another yawn escapes at the same time I feel my phone vibrate. My heart rate picks up and my eyes bulge when I see the subject of an incoming email. I quickly open and read it. Adam! I yell as soon as I get the downstairs front door open. Adam! I yell again. The door to my right opens and Jason sticks his head out. There she is, he says before he takes me in a hug. Private plane Millie is what I'm going to call you. I haven't had a conversation with my brother since he came to my office a few days ago. He tried to talk to me Friday afternoon, but I was already leaving for New York. He tries to put me in a headlock, but I dodge him and scream for Adam again. The door upstairs opens, and heavy footsteps come barreling down the stairs. Seconds later, he's standing in front of me, shirtless and sweaty. I get away from Jason and wrap my arms around him. He lifts me off my feet and moves me away from my brother. What happened? he asks. I pull away and see the concern in his eyes. I got in, I whisper. Understanding dawns on him, and he kisses me senseless. Well, I knew you would. He spins me around, and I start to laugh. Got in what? Jason asks. Law school, I tell him. I just got an email saying that I'm in. Northeastern University School of Law. What? I didn't know you were interested in law. He tries to pry me out of Adam's arms, but Adam's grip tightens until I tell him it's okay to let me go. Jason hugs me and kisses my cheek. Or you'll run to the store and get us some champagne, love, Adam says while he pulls me away from Jason and wraps his arm around my waist. I have some here. Jason steps through his front door and waves for us to come in. Neither of us makes a move to go inside. No, Jason. Understanding dawns and he nods. I'll bring it upstairs. I'll bring Alex and the four of us will have dinner. I'll order something. 52. Adam. You sure about this, Mel? I ask my wife. She nods at me, but I shake my head. I have a bad feeling about this. It's just going to be Jason and Alex. It will be fine. She gets on her toes and wraps her arms around my neck. Okay, but I'm out of patience with your brother. I found some houses I want you to look at. It's time for us to move out, and no cheapskate Mel. We're getting your dream house, complete with a swimming pool and hot tub. She nods and buries her face in my bare chest. I kiss the top of her head and bask in the feel of my wife in my arms. I feel like you need cheapskate Mel now more than ever before. I can't help but laugh. She's dead serious. Not when it comes to your dream house, love. You're going to get everything you want. She wraps her arms around my waist and smiles. Go shower. 
You're gross. And I'll look as soon as they leave. We'll curl up on Lola together. I'll even let you feel me up. But what about all the properties your dad left you? I'm going to do a lot more than feel you up. We can look at those too, but they're not in the city. But if you feel like moving to Aspen, Colorado, we have a house there. Her eyes widen in surprise and I shrug my shoulders at her. Are you serious? She asks. There's a heart attack. I've always wanted to learn to ski. She slaps my butt as I walk away to hop in the shower. By the time I return to the living room 15 minutes later, Alex and Jason are already there. The second I join them in the kitchen, Jason pops open the champagne and we toast to Mel. Tell me about your weekend, Alex says several minutes later over the Greek food that was delivered. It was great, Mel answers before I can. Adam's brother and sister are really nice. We spent a lot of time together. They can't get enough of their baby brother. Oh, we saw Dad. She messes my hair the same way Elizabeth did all weekend. She tries to pinch my cheek, but I block her hand. We're going back in two weeks after her bridal shower. Mel pulls out her phone and shows our guests pictures of our weekend. Alex snatches the phone from Mel and starts scrolling through the pictures on her own. Yeah, your dad couldn't wait to tell us about his time in the back of the Maybach or his time at the penthouse. Alex finishes her champagne and refills her glass. I had the phone on speaker and your mom overheard. I swear all her hair turned white when she found out about Adam. She pauses as she looks at a picture of Mel in the bridesmaid dress. Whoa. I don't know how she did it, but she had that dress waiting for me. Fits like a glove, Mel says. Then she lowers her voice and tells the room, It's haute couture. I went from clearance rack chic to haute couture. She and Alex both burst into laughter. You guys aren't moving... You guys aren't moving to New York, are you? Jason asks. His fork stops midway to his mouth while he waits for an answer. No, I tell him. Our life is here. Jason takes a breath and resumes eating, but his eyes keep darting back to Mel. But we are moving out, I tell him. He drops his fork and it clangs on his plate. You two don't need to leave he says. Mom's apartment will be ready in about five more weeks. Yeah, we do, Mel tells him. You know I've always wanted to be a homeowner. But don't worry, big brother. We're not going far. I want something in this neighborhood. Good, Jason appears relieved, and some of my irritation with him vanishes. I like having you around. And Melly, I'm so sorry. Everything that went wrong between us makes sense now. I feel... Mel puts a hand up to silence him, but I speak before she does. We're celebrating Mel. I kiss my wife's temple, pour more champagne in his glass, and hope he'll take the hint and change the subject. It's not your fault, Jason. I never intended for you to find out, but I don't want to talk about it, or her, or that day anymore. I have too many good things happening right now, Mel says. Jason nods, but he doesn't shut up. She's agreed to go to therapy. Mel rolls her eyes, and so do I. Okay, Jason. Maybe we can all go, he suggests. Enough, Mel warns. It can't hurt if Mel says enough, I hiss at him. Drop it. I thought you wanted to celebrate your sister's good news and not plead your mother's case. Flynn, I told you before to stay out of it, Jason says to me. Jason, drop it, Alex says. All I'm saying is, oh my God, just shut up, Jason. Mel stands up and looks down at her brother. Some things never change. And don't come in here and tell my husband to stay out of it. He's the one person who has always been on my side. Always. Every single time. He listens, he cares, and he rights my wrongs. I love him more than anyone and anything. And if you can't accept that and give him the same respect I give your wife, then we have nothing more to say. You don't need to stand up for me at my wedding. I'm so sick of being the villain in this family. Our mother pits us against each other, but I can never win. I'm the perpetual underdog, and you're her savior. I'm not. You are. Because after knowing this, you're still up here making a case for her. She's going to therapy only because of you, not me. Her precious Jason got a glimpse at the ugliness she always saved for me, and she can't handle that. So she placates you by offering to see a shrink. 
Why didn't she go ten years ago? Or five years ago? Or last year? Give me a fucking break. Mel grabs her glass and lifts it. But before she can slam it against the floor, I grab her wrist and take it out of her hand. I put my hand on the base of her neck and gently rub the tension away. Jason stands and approaches us, but I stand in front of my wife and shake my head at him. Enough, I warn. I think dinner's over. You don't need to protect my sister from me. Obviously, I do. Let's go, Jason. Alex stands and grabs her husband's elbow. You've even managed to make me angry tonight. I told you to leave it alone, but you always think you can fix everything. She starts to drag him to the door, but he turns back, only to still find me shielding Mel with my body. She wraps an arm around me and puts her head between my shoulder blades. They open the door, only to find Diane standing on the other side, holding little Mel. Addison walks in and raises both arms, and I pick her up. The baby needs to nurse. Diane hands the fussy baby to Alex. Next time, just text Alex, I tell her. She ignores me and looks around the place. She reaches the table and picks up the empty bottle of champagne. What's going on here? She asks. She puts the bottle down and rubs her hand on her thigh. Celebrating, Diane, Alex tells her. Oh? What are we celebrating? You didn't manage to get yourself pregnant, did you, Melanie? It's like someone putting a pin inside a balloon. The entire room goes quiet. Alex's smile disappears, and Jason rubs a hand over his face. Yeah, I'm celebrating my pregnancy by drinking alcohol, mother, Mel says from behind me. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I ask. Diane looks around the room, and when she's met with nothing but unsmiling faces, she takes a visible step back. I just meant that the two of you are newlyweds. No need to rush anything. I narrow my eyes at her, but I hold Mel in place when she tries to walk around me. When me and Adam decide to start a family is our business, Mel practically growls at her. Not that you ever need to worry about any kids I might have. I catch her stare and nod, confirming what my wife just said. But I don't miss the hurt look on her face. She doesn't stay down for long, though. What the hell do you mean by that, Melanie? You're going to punish me until the day I die, aren't you? You're going to keep my grandchildren from me? Mel manages to step aside and starts to approach Diane, but I reach out and hold on to her wrist. If you think for a second that I will allow you to infect my kids... A hand slams on the table, causing Mel to jump in shock. Can we just have five goddamn minutes without a fight? Jason says. Mother, enough! Melly got into law school, and you're going to be happy for her and not dump any more bullshit on her shoulders. In fact, go back downstairs. When Diane doesn't make a move to leave, Jason points at the door. We'll see you downstairs. She purses her lips and leaves without another word. I'm sorry, Mel. I hold my hand up to him and shake my head. You're done here. Good night. Flynn, I can talk to my sister, he says but his voice is missing the usual malice he keeps just for me. Not tonight, you can't. You've said enough. He nods and holds out his arms for Addison. As soon as he takes her, they leave and Mel breathes a sigh of relief. I pull her into my arms and press kisses on her forehead. I regret telling him about law school. I'm so proud of you, Mel. So fucking proud. She pulls away and looks into my face. You're my person. You're my person, I say back. We've never talked about it, but you do want kids, right? I give her my brightest smile and put a hand on her belly. I'll get you pregnant right now, love. Flood that womb with a potent Flynn sperm. She bites her bottom lip and takes a step closer to me. I didn't offend liberated Mel, did I? She kisses me softly after wrapping her arms around my neck. Quite the opposite. Liberated Mel is very turned on. That actually sounds kind of sexy, but maybe we can practice for the next couple of years. She jumps into my arms and I spin her around. Whatever Liberated Mel wants. Liberated Mel is about to leave the building. Slutty Mel is on her way. She's my favorite. 
Her laugh follows us while I run to the bedroom. 53. Melly. I'm going to fall. My husband ignores my complaint. In fact, he snorts, and I can't imagine his eye roll. He has had his hand firmly on my elbow, and I know there is no way in hell he would let me fall. I reach up to adjust the blindfold, but he swats my hand away. Almost there. Stop trying to peek. I can hear noise and talking while we walk through a room. The enticing aroma of food gives me at least one clue, but I don't know why he would blindfold me just to take me to dinner. And you're killing me in that dress. If a man checks out your ass tonight, he's going to lose an eye. I bite my bottom lip at the thought of Adam losing his shit over someone checking me out. You like the sound of that, don't you, love? His free hand reaches down and cradles an ass cheek. I knew he'd go crazy for this dress. It's a form-fitting black sheath that just touches my knees with a long zipper in the back. It hugs all my curves, showcasing my ass and hips. Right this way, Mr. and Mrs. Flynn. Being called Mrs. Flynn by the strange voice sends shivers down my spine. We've only been married a few months, and I can't remember a time when I wasn't Mrs. Flynn. I don't want to remember. Adam tells me to be careful while we cross a threshold. Then he stands behind me and starts to fiddle with the blindfold. I'm using this on you tonight, he whispers so that only I can hear. He removes the blindfold and orders me to open my eyes. I blink twice before I focus on our family and friends. Everyone stands and shouts congratulations. The next few minutes are a blur of hugs and kisses. Smart ho, Ananda whispers to me when it's her turn to hug me. I told you I didn't make friends with basic bitches. Love you, girl. I hug her tighter and tears stream down my face. Once I've hugged everyone, two servers arrive with trays of champagne and platters of appetizers. Everyone laughs and talks at once. Presents! I jump in excitement and I point to the gift table. We have presents! I rub my hands together in anticipation. You have presents. I didn't get into law school. You look happy, Melly, Jason says, approaching me. I wrap an arm around his and lay my head on his shoulder. The day after our last fight, Jason sent a bouquet of chrysanthemums and hydrangeas. Molly was there when they arrived, and she explained that those flowers represent a sibling bond. Chrysanthemums represent faithfulness, and hydrangeas, emotions for your siblings. He's been busy working long hours, and we haven't had a chance to talk, but the flowers meant a lot. I am, I admit. So was that you playing hard to get with Flynn all this time? I wasn't ready until we went to Vegas, I tell him. Stop giving him shit, Jason. I mean it. If you're happy, I'm happy. That's all I've ever wanted. I'll make things right with Flynn. I can tell he wants to say more, but he closes his mouth once Molly approaches. He says a quick hello to her and leaves to join Alex. I'm so proud of you, Mel. She wraps her arm around mine. You and Adam make me so proud. She adjusts the necklace she gave me. But I still want grandbabies. You'll get them, I promise her. We talk for several more minutes, and we're both on our second glass of champagne when the door to our private room opens and Ethan... Tara and Elizabeth walk in like they own the place. I don't know how they do that, but Ethan and Tara dominate whatever room they walk into. Everyone stops talking as they cross the room and approach. Molly turns, and when she looks in Ethan's face, her mouth flies open and her pale skin turns wider. Her hands fly to her mouth, and I can only imagine she's picturing Adam's father when she looks at Ethan. Adam notices and quickly approach. Surprise, Elizabeth says while she practically jumps into Adam's arms. Ethan shakes his head at his sister, but he and Tara congratulate me. Ma, Adam says, 
This is Ethan, Elizabeth, and Ethan's fiance, Tara. Molly's face is still ashen, but she shakes everyone's hand, even though she never takes her eyes off Ethan. Ethan kisses the back of her hand. Nice to meet you, Miss Flynn, he says. Molly swallows and nods, removes her hand from his, and walks away. Adam's eyes follow his mom, and I gesture for him to follow her. Go talk to her, I whisper to him. He kisses my temple and leaves my side. You guys didn't have to come, I tell Ethan and Elizabeth. We're seeing you next weekend for the shower, and you sent me those beautiful flowers. I told Adam not to make a big deal about this. We kind of like you guys, Ethan says. And Ethan and Elizabeth are obsessed with Adam, Tara jokes. He's all they talk about now, and you too. The surprises don't stop. My dad walks in, and he wraps me in his arms. The room is alive with laughter and chatter. I look around for Molly, and she's back to being relaxed. But it's my turn to be alarmed when I see Molly and my mother engaged in conversation. Adam returns and puts a hand on my waist. Did you invite my mother? I whisper to him. I didn't, but she thanked me for inviting her. Do you think Jason lied and told her she was invited? She didn't come with him, so I don't think so. He better not have. She's just putting on an act, but I don't care. I love my party, so let her stay. I wrap my arms around his neck. He bends down and rubs his nose against mine. And I love my husband. The last word leaves my mouth just as our lips touch. The entire room erupts in cheers and catcalls. I pull away, embarrassed, but Adam doesn't seem to care. He takes my hand and leads us to a table with our siblings and our mothers. Did you plan this party? Ma and Alex helped, and by helped, they did everything, but it was my idea. I love it. He grabs a tray from a passing server and puts a shrimp to my mouth. Hey! A loud voice yells, Adam! Uncle Finn screams as he walks to our table. Uncle Finn is here, Adam. There you are. He comes in holding the hand of a woman who appears to be in her 60s. She's thin and about three inches taller than he is, with long blonde hair that touches her waist. Meet my lady friend, Helen. This one doesn't smell like cot piss. He tries to whisper the last sentence, but he talks loud enough for everyone to hear. Helen blushes, but she shakes hands with everyone at the table. This is my Meshuggah nephew, Adam, and his wife, Mel. He talks to Adam and messes with his hair. Mel is on her way to Supreme Court. Uncle Finn looks around the table. And who are these pretty ladies? He asks of Tara and Elizabeth before kissing both their hands. But when his eyes land on Ethan, his happy demeanor vanishes. To Ethan's credit, he offers Uncle Finn his hand. Oh, I know who you are. Your father was a real son of a bitch. Did you know that? You have some nerve after all the shit he did to my sister and nephew. The entire room goes quiet. Adam jumps out of the chair and grabs Uncle Finn's elbow. Adam, I told you not to speak to these people. I should punch him in the nose. Finn, enough. He's not his father, Molly says. Fire? What fire? Father, he's not his father, Molly yells. Put on your damn hearing aid. She turns to Ethan and says, oh, I'm sorry about my brother. I'm really happy Adam has a relationship with his siblings. You just look a lot like him, you know? She pats Ethan's hand. So does Adam, Ethan says. Yeah, but half of him belongs to my sister, so we only focus on the good half, not the scumbag half like you people. Uncle Finn scoffs the rest of his statement. The entire room goes deathly quiet while they watch the scene. Ethan doesn't appear phased, but Elizabeth's pursed lips and flared nostrils tell me she's not going to take this confrontation as well as Ethan. I catch Ananda's eye and tilt my head toward Uncle Finn. Like the true friend she is, she jumps out of her seat and runs over to us. Uncle Finn, my favorite uncle! She wraps an arm around Finn's. 
His scowl drops and his face transforms into a smile. My Meshuggah friend. Finn lets out a big belly laugh. Come meet the new woman in my life. Those pictures you took of me worked. She can't seem to get enough of me. He claps his hands together once and pulls Ananda away from the table. Molly's shoulders visibly sag in relief when her brother leaves. She looks at Ethan and Elizabeth and smiles fondly. Oh, I'm sorry about my brother, but he's very protective of Adam. Oh, I'm really happy you two have reached out to him. Look, we understand, but like you said, we're not our father. We have a brother, and we want to get to know him. That's it, Ethan says. And we're not going anywhere, Elizabeth adds. Her eyes are still shooting fire in the direction of Finn. So, some people are just going to have to suck it up. Oh, I'm sorry, Adam says to Ethan and Elizabeth. He's all bark, really. He's probably already forgotten it. Uncle Finn is now laughing with Helen and Ananda, seemingly unbothered by the ugly scene he caused. He's not wrong. Our father was a son of a bitch, Ethan says. Enough about him. Come on, let's go to the bar and get a real drink. Adam turns to me and says, You going to be okay for a few minutes, Mel? I nod at him. He leans down and kisses my temple before he walks away with Ethan and Elizabeth. I watch Adam's fine ass in those black pants until he walks out of the room and out of my sight. I bite my lip at the thought of getting him undressed tonight. In fact, we were late leaving the house because I couldn't get enough of him earlier. Girl, you've got it bad. Hmm? I say to Tara, who is looking at me, smiling coyly. She wraps her arm around mine. I know that look. I'm sure you do, I tell her, and we both burst out laughing. I'm happy to see you guys, but you really didn't have to come. We're seeing you next weekend. On a normal day, Ethan and Elizabeth are extremely family-oriented, but now they have a brother and sister-in-law they are obsessed with. You could not keep them away if you tried. I gesture for her to sit, and I take the chair next to her. Tell me about that. How did they find out about Adam? Elizabeth hired someone to investigate their father. The girl must have a sixth sense. She was convinced he was hiding something. Ethan was at my family's house last year when Elizabeth showed up and dropped the news on him. But Adam was so damn stubborn. He's just like his brother and sister that way. I'm happy it worked out. Me too. I'm happy for Adam. And between us, he loves the attention they give him. Can I talk to you for a minute? Jason holds my elbow and pulls me to the other side of the room. Tara and Alex seem to be engrossed in conversation, so I let him take me away. As we're crossing the room, my mother laughs at something Molly says. As if she can sense my eyes on her, she looks up at me. To the unfamiliar person, she seems happy. She's in a red dress and has her hair in loose curls. She offers me a tentative smile. Did you invite her? I ask Jason. His eyes don't leave my mother's, but I don't smile back. Her show of bravado slips. But in true Diane Dupree fashion, she juts out her chin and continues her conversation with Molly. I wouldn't do that. Really, Jason? Just a few days ago, you tried to give me a guilt trip because she's suddenly interested in therapy. He pulls me into an empty corner, and I cross my arms. It wasn't my intention to give you a guilt trip. I was trying to fix this, fix our family. Our family isn't broken, Jason. My relationship with my mother is, but I don't need you to fix it. It is what it is. It hurts, but I've learned to deal with it. He nods, but his eyes are sad. He opens his mouth, but he closes it and subtly shakes his head. He seems to ponder his next words. He takes a deep breath and says, My impulse is to fix things, Melly. That's how I'm wired, but I realize that this thing between you and Mom is not my mess to fix. It's hers. She's the only one responsible, so as hard as it is, 
I'm going to leave it alone. I'm sorry for what I said last week, and I'll apologize to Adam, too. If you ever want to talk about it, I'm here. But this is your night, and I don't want to dredge that shit up. He sighs and takes both of my hands. I'm really proud of you. I had no idea you were interested in law school, but I'm so happy you're pursuing this. You are going to do amazing things. He pulls me close, puts an arm around my shoulder, and kisses my cheek. Love you, sis. And just so you know, if you guys move out, we'll just follow you. Alex and I want one more baby, so we're thinking of finding a single-family home. We need more space. Love you, too. But you should know you probably won't be able to afford whatever neighborhood we move to. He snorts, and we both burst into laughter. He wraps me in his arms, and a wave of emotion hits. A few tears fall, and because I want to annoy him, I wipe my face with his shirt. He lets out an exaggerated gasp and puts me in a headlock like he used to do when we were kids. Back then, I could never get out of it, and that hasn't changed. He tightens the hold, and each time I try to punch him in the stomach, he moves. You still punch like a girl. He spins me around in a circle while messing my hair. You ass! Do you know how long it took me to do my hair? He runs a hand through it, making a bigger mess of it. Let go! You're still smelly, he laughs and reaches for a drink from a passing server, but he never lets me go. I start to laugh and throw more air punches, at least until Adam steps back into the room with Ethan. His eyes narrow when he spots us. He looks absolutely ridiculous walking into the room holding a glass with a pink cocktail. Dupree, hands off my wife, or I'm going to put my hands on you. Your wife has been my sister for almost three decades. To prove his point, he messes my hair again before he finally lets me go. Deal with it. Adam scowls at Jason, who does an exaggerated scowl back. He even growls at him, but he offers Adam his hand. Adam takes it, and Jason leans in and gives him a half hug before he walks away. Adam hands me the pink drink. Oh, I saw the bartender make this for someone else and thought you might like it. It looks like the type of girly stuff you drink. Ethan lets out a snort at Adam's words, but I take the drink from my husband and give him a quick kiss in gratitude. Thanks, stud. I offer him a sip, but he makes a face of disgust after tasting it. Did you three have a nice chat? Elizabeth smiles, and Ethan nods. We did. Elizabeth steps between me and Adam and wraps an arm around mine. We're leaving around noon tomorrow, but want you to come spend the night with us. Vincent's there with the nanny, and he would love to see you. Sure, sounds fun, and I want to talk to you and Tara about being in the wedding. Vincent can be a ring bearer with Addison, and we'll find something for Ethan. Elizabeth gasps in surprise before all the words are fully out of my mouth. We'd love to, she says, right before she hugs me tight. Thank you, she whispers in my ear. While dinner is being served, Adam pulls me aside and says, Boy, the way, Elizabeth is like a pit bull with a bone about the damn holidays. But I told her we haven't talked about them yet. I'll let you decide which ones we spend with them. But I want us at home for Christmas. Ma goes to Ireland around Thanksgiving, so we can go to New York, but only if you want to. The only thing I want is for us to spend Christmas Eve and Christmas with Ma at home, preferably in our new house. I quickly agree, but my eyes narrow when I see Elizabeth not only chatting with Molly, but laughing, I nudge Adam in the ribs and point in their direction. I'll give your sister five minutes before she invites your mother for all the holidays for the next 20 years. I'll placate her and agree to Thanksgiving, but she won't be satisfied with just that. I love the idea of Christmas at home. I might even host. I look around the room and lower my voice and say, What the hell are we supposed to give them for Christmas? Oh, my God! What about a wedding gift? 
They're filthy rich. You couldn't come from a regular family? He looks down at me and furrows his brows. When I shrug, he laughs and subtly slaps my ass. Thank goodness I have a wife to worry about that stuff for me. Just make sure you leave cheapskate Mel behind when you shop for them. Tina arrives, holding a big gift bag. You call me any time to talk. I know a little something about law school. Hey, aren't you the one who gave my wife legal advice about ending our marriage? Tina laughs and takes Adam into a hug. She kisses both of his cheeks. I only invited you to rub our happiness in your face. Well, the joke's on you, because I knew there would never be a divorce. Now, what's this I hear about you being a secret gazillionaire? I should bill you for the legal advice I gave to your wife. 54. Adam. Mel's body is pressed close to mine. Her head is on my shoulder, and every few seconds I reach over and feed her a spoonful of cake mixed with strawberry ice cream. Between bites of dessert, I squeeze her thigh. She knows my touch is a promise of what's to come. Dinner was filled with laughs and the best Italian food in the city. My wife glowed all night. She laughed, fed me food from her plate, and kissed my cheek so often that Jason playfully told her to knock it off. Diane's presence at our table did not take an ounce of joy away from her. She barely talked to her mother at all. But Diane was so busy playing the proud mother for Ethan, Tara, and Elizabeth, she didn't have the chance to annoy Mel. You enjoying your party, love? Best party ever. Just wait until you graduate. I lean down, kiss her forehead, and offer her another spoonful. Tell me something, please. Is my daughter no longer able to feed herself? William's eyes light up at his own question. Adam kind of spoils me. I give Mel another spoonful and make a show of wiping her mouth. You deserve it, Tara says from across the table. Says the original spoiled rotten girl. Ethan says to Tara. Oh, please, you don't spoil me. Honey, that diamond necklace you're wearing says otherwise, Tina says, and the entire table erupts in laughter. How do you know he gave it to me? Tara challenges. Who else would put up with you? You're awful. Tara tries to push him away, but he wraps an arm around her shoulders and pulls her closer. When he kisses her temple, she leans into him and sighs at the contact. I'm doing the world a favor. I keep her close so that no one else has to deal with her. Oh, is that it? Tina asks with a laugh. How about one more round of champagne? I flag the waiter down and ask for champagne for the remaining guests. I hope it's to your liking, Diane. I think you mentioned something about a champagne lifestyle once. Or do you prefer beer? I can't remember exactly. Mel puts her face in my bicep and giggles. My eyes light up when I see a look of irritation cross Diane's face. But she only offers a fake smile. I never knew I deserved to be spoiled, Mel says. I offer her another spoonful, but she shakes her head. She smiles at me, but it's a tentative one. She reaches over and runs a hand through my hair, and her eyes fill with tears. Happy tears, she whispers. I have a feeling that Melly and Adam have an epic story, Tara says. She told us Adam was her neighbor. After making that statement, Elizabeth looks at us and says, But I know there's more. My daughter has been very tight-lipped about their courtship. All I know is I came to town and she announced she was married, Diane says. Mel's lips purse, but she doesn't give her mother her usual sharp retort. Oh, did Melly tell you that herself, Diane? William asks. Diane ignores William, so he says, Did I tell you how nice you look tonight? The entire table quiets down. Thank you. Mel's mother runs a shaky hand through her hair and smiles. Your stylist did a better job of hiding your horns this time. I try to stifle my laugh, but can't. And red is definitely your color. Yours and Satan's. Do we have to show everyone our dysfunction? Jason asks. Where's your much younger girlfriend, William? Did she leave you already? Diane asks. Every woman eventually leaves you, don't they? You'd love that, wouldn't you? You'd love for me to be as miserable as you are. 
But no, she's working. You remember what it's like to have a job, don't you? But I'll tell Jennifer you asked for her. You'll see her soon, though. She's doing Melly's hair for her wedding. And I left you, sweetheart. Let's not rewrite history. Dad's on fire tonight, Mel whispers in my ear. Remind me never to get on your dad's bad side, Melly, Ananda says. Tara looks around the table, her mouth hanging open in shock. I have a job now, thank you very much, William. Do you want to tell everyone how I supported you when it's Mel's night, I announce, cutting off whatever Diane was going to say. She exhales and sits back in her chair. The waiter returns with our champagne. I make sure to hand a glass to Diane. My eyes lock with hers, and when she smiles at me, I don't return it. Don't change the subject. We want to hear the story about you, too, Elizabeth insists. Oh, well, all everyone needs to know is, Mel abruptly stands up, cutting me off in the process. She runs to the front of the room. I raise my eyebrows and catch her eye, and she winks at me. I lean back in my seat, eager to see what she does next. Mel does not like to be the center of attention. Speech! Ananda yells. We've been here for hours, and no one was shy about taking advantage of the open bar. Everyone quiets down and waits. A bout of shyness hits Mel, and she looks down at her feet. But she soon straightens up. So, hi? She lets out a nervous giggle. Hey, Smelly! Jason yells. It's Melanie Loser. Melanie Flynn, to be exact. The entire room cheers, including me, who yells, Tell him, Mel! What did she say? Flint! Flint, Michigan? Uncle Finn asks the room. So, I want to say something. A few months ago, I married the most amazing man. My heart starts to thump, and the drink in my hand only makes it halfway to my mouth. It was unconventional. We went to Vegas for my dear friend's wedding, and we got married ourselves. All the hushed murmuring in the room stops. So, what does a new bride do when she wakes up next to her new husband? Oh, God, we don't want to know, Jason shouts. Well, this one freaked out, ran out of the room, and got on the next flight out of Vegas. I convinced myself he'd wake up and regret it, and I just couldn't face that. But he came for me, and no matter how hard I fought back or pushed him away, he was there, fighting for me, fighting for our marriage. That's probably because he begged you to marry him, Ananda yells. I smile at that and wait for Mel to agree or to make a joke, but she surprises me. She catches my eye and smiles. I'm going to make a confession, stud. She winks at me and turns back to the guests. So, I'm going to tell everyone something that only Adam knows. He didn't ask me to marry him. I asked him. Actually, I threatened to marry him and tie him to me for life. It was a moment of complete madness. Do you ever want someone so badly you think you'll go mad if you don't have that person? I did. He was mine. From the moment I first saw him working out in the backyard, he was mine. And I was his. I was done fighting it. I've never felt so much acceptance. Never had someone who was on my side through everything. I could set this room on fire and he'd support me. Let's not try that, darling, my mother says. My point is, I have the best husband. And yes... I asked him to marry me because I wanted him, so I got him. It wasn't conventional or planned, but it's still the best thing I've ever done. All the women in the room cheer. That's just a small part of our story. The other parts are just for me and Adam. I love you, stud. She walks back to our table. I stand up and she runs into my arms. Did I ever tell you how much I love liberated Mel? I kiss her until she's breathless.
Epilogue Melly What do you think? Jennifer stands behind me, and I smile at my reflection for the hundredth time today. I've been smiling since I woke up this morning in Adam's old bedroom. All the women spent the night at Molly's last night after leaving the rehearsal dinner. The men, including Uncle Finn, went to Ethan and Tara's place in the city. I can add a little baby's breath. It's an elegant, loose side braid. She weaves baby's breath down the sides and pulls out a few loose tendrils. You look beautiful, darling. Molly starts to cry again. She puts a hand on my bare shoulder. I trust my son. Always have. And look at what he did. He found the perfect woman for him. Don't make me wait too long for my grandbabies. She manages to mention grandchildren in every conversation lately. The door to the bedroom opens, and my four bridesmaids walk in, wearing matching cornflower blue dresses. The dresses are strapless with a sweetheart neckline. They cinch at the waist and have a long slit on the side. Oh, my God, you're so beautiful, Melly. Alex touches my loose braid, and our eyes catch in the mirror. Jennifer, you're amazing, Alex whispers, probably to ensure my mother doesn't hear. Molly invited my mother here last night, and, to my surprise, she agreed to spend the night despite knowing that Jennifer would be here too. She is, Tara agrees. Ethan and Tara invited not only Molly and Finn to their wedding, but Jason and Alex too. They extended invitations to my dad, Jennifer, and my mom. No one turns down a wedding invitation from a billionaire. I was kept so busy as part of the wedding party that there was no time for me to worry about my mother's presence. I can't say that our relationship has changed. I've been so busy these past few months with my wedding, work, and preparing for law school next month that I've had no time to dwell on our relationship or lack thereof. Everyone looks beautiful. I say, while looking at my reflection. Jennifer's done an amazing job with everyone's hair and makeup. My mother's the only one who went to her own stylist. As if she can hear my thoughts, she walks in, holding Addie's hand. Look, Auntie, I'm pretty. Addie spins in her dress. Her crown of flowers fall off her head, and Alex runs to pick it up. My mother walks over and stands behind me and looks at me through the mirror. She looks sad. Her eyes suddenly fill with unshed tears, and she dabs them with a tissue. You look beautiful, Melanie. You really do. She put a hand on my shoulder, and for once, I don't cringe at her touch. Thanks, Mom, I say to her. Can I talk to you alone for a minute? My stomach drops. I'm minutes away from marrying Adam. The last thing I need is to fight with her. Everyone in the room freezes. I'm sure Tara and Elizabeth have their suspicions about me and my mother, but they've never asked. Now's not the time, Diane. This is Melly's day. You've had years. You don't need to talk to her today of all days. Alex's words have bite. My mother visibly cringes. Her relationship with Alex never recovered. Alex is not shy about taking sides, and she's taken mine. It's almost time to go. The limos are here, Molly says. Please, I won't upset you, I promise. I nod once, and everyone else clears the room. I finally turn around and look at my mother. She smiles again, but it's marred by sadness, She takes a small, tentative step closer and holds out a hand to me. I can tell she's holding her breath while she waits for me to take it. I reach out and take her hand. Once I do, she lets out a sob. Mom, let's not do this right now. I only want to be happy today. I know, I know. She dabs her eyes again. You're such a beautiful bride. Such a beautiful young woman, and I know that's despite me. And it's your wedding day, so I don't want to make this about me. 
I just want you to know that I'm happy for you and that I'm proud of you. I'm so proud to have you as my daughter. I know I haven't shown it, but I am. I'm working all of that out, and it's a lot to unpack, Melly. I also want you to know that I tried before. Nine years ago, I saw a therapist. You were away at college, and I realized the damage I had done. You never came home. You never called. I'm not blaming you for any of that. You didn't call or come home because of me. But I wasn't ready to hear it back then. I wasn't ready to face what I had done. But I am now. She takes my hand and puts it to her lips. When my eyes fill with tears, she grabs another tissue and gently dabs them dry. Thank you for saying that. That means a lot, especially today, I say. I grab the tissue and wipe the corner of my eye, careful not to disturb my makeup. And Adam loves you so much. I'm so happy that you have that in a partner. That's what you deserve. That's all a mother can want for her child. She smiles wide, and for the first time since she walked in, the sadness is gone. I smile back at her, and she lets out a laugh. She takes a step closer and takes me into a hug. It's quick, and when she pulls away, she kisses my cheek. Thank you, Mom, I say to her. I think we'd better go before Adam comes looking for me. I don't want to miss making my grand entrance. There's a knock on the door, and my father walks in. He stops mid-step when he sees me. He opens his arms. I walk into them, careful not to get too close and ruin my makeup. The most beautiful bride in the history of the world. He tucks my arm in his and escorts me out of the room where everyone is waiting. Tara grabs my hand and walks with me. I like Adam and all, but I'm so glad you're part of the package, she tells me. I must admit that I love being part of Adam's family. I've gotten very close to Elizabeth and Tara. Their lavish lifestyle is something we are both getting used to. Ethan is sending us to Paris on his private plane. Instead of the hotel Adam booked for us, they are sending us to the Paris Four Seasons for one week and then to a private villa in Nice for another. And that was only the beginning. A few weeks prior. You can't say no, it's a wedding gift, Tara says, while she pours wine. We never go more than a few weeks without seeing each other in person. Either we will fly there for a weekend, or they will come to Boston. Not a day goes by that Adam doesn't talk to his siblings, and they're not the only ones making the calls these days. Adam FaceTimes them every night after dinner. He says it's to talk to Vincent, but I know the truth. He loves his brother and sister. But we don't need a private plane or the Four Seasons, I say, but no one is paying attention to me. And you already bought everything on our wedding registries? I look directly at Tara when I say that. All she does is laugh and wave me off. She won't admit it, but I know it was her. And that's not all, Ethan says. He looks at a grinning Elizabeth. She pulls an envelope out of her purse and slides it along the table. You open it, love. I'm almost afraid to, Adam says to me. I'm not sure if it's because they are extremely generous or because they are trying to make up for their father's awful treatment of Adam, but they love to spoil their brother. With shaking hands, I tear the envelope open. My eyes bug out when I see that it's a deed to an apartment in their building in New York. Apartment is putting it mildly. It's a 5,000-square-foot home overlooking Central Park. Adam is struck speechless when I hold the deed in front of him. He shakes his head, and I know he's going to tell them we can't accept it. But Elizabeth speaks first. It's a wedding gift. She reaches over and grabs Adam's hands. I promise we aren't trying to buy you off. We just love you guys, and we want to show you. We've missed out on so much time with you, Adam. We know we can't erase or make up for dear old dad, 
but let us spoil our baby brother and his wife. Say yes, or I swear I will cry again. Adam kisses the back of Elizabeth's hand. You don't have to give us things, and you two have done nothing to make up for, Adam reassures them. I love you guys too, and maybe I shouldn't have blown you two off for so long. He finally admits it, Ethan says. But who's going to fight over us if we have our own place here? Adam asks. Tara and I both laugh. It's a constant battle between Elizabeth and Ethan about where we're going to stay whenever we visit. I'm sure they'll find something else to fight about. Tara hands each of us a glass of wine and we toast. Let's go see the new place. Ethan's designer will be here to meet with you tomorrow. Thank you, but no more gifts, Adam says while we follow them out of the penthouse. Wait until you hear about the second part, Ethan says, ignoring Adam. Jason walks down the hall, and Alex's eyes light up when she sees him. I haven't seen you in a tux since our own wedding. She spreads her hands across his chest and smiles up at him. Isn't Melly beautiful? Alex asks when she finally drops her hands. She's still smelly, Jason says, but he smiles when he sees me. You look great, sis. Beautiful. Flynn is going to lose his mind. I adjust his bow tie. Instead of black ties like the rest of the guys, Jason's is the same shade of blue as the bridesmaid's dresses. We've come a long way, but there's no one else I'd rather have as my best person. I know his relationship with our mother has suffered, but true to his word, He's left things alone. He's made no other attempts to fix things. Mom's moved a few streets away to her new place, and Adam and I still live upstairs, at least for another few months until our house is ready. We never found a home we could agree on. We couldn't find one in our neighborhood with the swimming pool he insists I have, so we bought two old houses that were next to each other knock them down, and are building our dream house. Jason bought a house down the same street. Speaking of your groom, Jason pulls the phone out of his pocket, puts it to his ear, and walks away. A photographer starts taking snapshots. The limos are here. It's time to go, Ananda says. She stands back, and I run my hand down my fitted white wedding gown. It's strapless and has a sweetheart neckline. Tara let me borrow the diamond earrings and necklace she wore to her wedding, but I feel naked without the cross Adam's mom gave me. In fact, I can't wait to put it back on tonight. Adam. You'll see her in about an hour. I hold up my phone and roll my eyes at Jason. He smiles and that only makes me more anxious. You're already married, so relax, he says. Frustrated, I give him the middle finger. This time he laughs at me. Hey, Flynn, Jason says. Yeah? I'm happy for you and my sister. You're a good guy. We've come a long way in the last three months. He apologized for being an asshole, and we've actually formed a friendship. He and Ethan planned my bachelor party. The same party I told them I didn't want, but they managed to whisk me away for a weekend in Bermuda. I guess you're okay now that you've stopped being a mama's boy, I tell him. I'm the mama's boy. Your mother was literally wiping your mouth at dinner last night. And her house is like a shrine to you. Twine? Why do we need twine at a wedding? Adam, come take a look at your Uncle Finn. Don't be mad at your uncle for being the handsomest man at the wedding today. I give Jason the finger one more time and end the call. Uncle Finn spins around and whistles at himself. You two don't stand a chance. He playfully slaps my face and does the same to Ethan. And you, he says to Ethan, get your own face. This one already belongs to Adam. He says that to him every time they see each other. I think the first time he said it was his way of apologizing after their first meeting. Now he says it all the time. Except I had this face first. Ethan gives him the usual response. Thirst. The only thing I'm thirsty for is that open bar. Uncle Finn spins around one more time. Come on, boys. Our ride is here. He shouts before walking out of the room. 
Ethan turns to me and adjusts my bow tie. We're wearing matching tuxedos, and it's still unnerving to look into his face and familiar eyes, but we've become very close very fast. A day doesn't go by that the three of us don't talk, and I've started calling them instead of the other way around. The similarities between me and Ethan are more than just skin deep. We like the same foods, we're protective of the people we love, and we both carry the similar baggage left to us by the father we share. I'm still taller, I say. He smiles, and when he tries to mess my hair, I duck and he misses. Barely, he says. I'm still older, wiser, and I can still kick your ass. But you can't, I remind him. And how did I end up with three best men? I had originally asked Uncle Finn, but Vincent asked if he could be my best man too. When I told him yes, he insisted his dad stand up there with him. You picked a good woman, Adam. I'm happy for you, and I owe Mel a lot. My siblings love my wife, too. She's gotten extremely close to Tara and Elizabeth. But when Ethan was in Boston on business a few weeks ago, she asked him to stay with us and threw a small dinner party in his honor. Ethan had fun gloating to Elizabeth about that. He even FaceTimed her during the dinner party. It's been nice having them. I never thought they would want anything to do with me. I assumed they would see me like our father did. Like a dirty little secret. Even though I've always admired the sibling bond that Mel and Jason have, I never considered that I could have that too. But now I do. Dad! Uncle Adam! Let's go! Vincent runs into the bedroom wearing a matching tuxedo, takes my hand and starts to pull. Let's go get your uncle married, Ethan says. Ethan puts a hand on my shoulder, but that doesn't stop my body from shaking. Uncle Finn chases Vincent around the altar, but Ethan takes Vincent's hand and tells him to stand still. Uncle Finn takes the hint and calms down, but not before he grumbles something about Ethan being a spoil sport. The church is full. The small wedding Mel and my mother planned has more than doubled. Ethan's flown most of my relatives in from Dublin and has put them up in a hotel. He said it was a gift and I couldn't get mad about it. I look toward the front door, eager for the wedding to begin. I miss Mel. We've been so busy this past week with the wedding and hosting out-of-town relatives, we've barely had a minute to just be together. The doors open and the wedding planner comes in. She takes Vincent outside so he can walk down the aisle with Addie. I know my bride is outside that door. Any minute now. Relax, Ethan says. Says the guy who cried like a baby at his own wedding, I remind him. It was my allergies, he lies. I straighten up when the music starts to play. Our priest takes his place at the altar, and even Uncle Finn stands straight. The hushed murmuring amongst our guests ceases. The doors to the church burst open, and I stop breathing. It's a perfect August day, and the sunlight makes the room appear bright. There are white roses everywhere, and their sweet scent fills the church. My only request for the wedding was that no expense was spared. Mel told me I was crazy as she updated her wedding spreadsheet, but she did agree to increase the flower budget. Our mothers walk down the aisle together. My mother dabs her eyes the entire time. Diane smiles, but I can see some sadness in her eyes. Even though Mel did not exclude her from the wedding, their relationship is as strained as it's always been. Vincent and Addison follow, and they both pull little Mel in a white wagon decorated with flowers and filled with pink rose petals. The entire church swoons at the sight. Halfway there, Vincent and Addie give up and both run to the altar. Vincent stands next to his father, and Addie wraps her arms around one of my legs. Diane walks down the aisle, scoops the baby in her arms, and pulls the wagon out of the way. The bridesmaids are next, each wearing matching blue dresses and bouquets of white roses. The music changes to the bridal march and my heart starts to hammer inside my chest. Ethan hands me a handkerchief and I wipe my forehead while I wait for my bride. When she finally makes her entrance, she's between her father and Jason. But all I see is her. She wouldn't give me any hints about her dress. That is nothing like I imagined. 
I imagine something big and poofy. But she's in a form-fitting lace dress. The bottom flares out and has a long train. My eyes slide up her body, drinking her in, doing my best to seal this vision in my mind. She's lost weight these past three months. Between her workouts, diet, and stress of the wedding, she slimmed down. She's still perfect, though. Her veil covers her face, but I don't miss her smile. It's bright enough to light the entire world. I don't think I blink or breathe until she's standing in front of me. Finally, I lift her veil and I lock eyes with my bride. My entire world stops. She's all I see. And I have to ask myself how a man like me is lucky enough to be marrying the most beautiful woman God ever created. Her dad kisses her cheek, and Jason takes his place at her side of the altar. I cup her cheeks, so eager to kiss her sweet lips. But the priest clears his throat, and Uncle Finn grabs my elbow and pulls me away. Not yet, lad! He practically yells inside the church, causing everyone to laugh. You're so beautiful. She blushes and tears up. I love you, I mouth. I love you, she mouths back. Two months later, Melly. Oil get you some tea, love. I kiss Adam's hand and nod, so grateful for him. Oh, set the table, too, so relax. Or you think we should just stay in bed all weekend? I agree. I say, it's been a crazy six weeks, from our wedding to our honeymoon, and now my first semester of law school. I'm only taking two classes, but between my husband, work, school, building our house and our families, I'm exhausted. I have been for the past two weeks. What's for dinner? I ask. I should start reading for my torts class, but I lie on the couch and cover myself with Lola's blanket. The very thought of eating makes me want to gag, but I won't say that to my protective husband. He's been hovering for the past week, especially since I haven't been feeling well. Mom made us something. I'm not sure what, but she made chicken soup for you. Oi picked it up on my way home. She said she'll stop by and check on us tomorrow. I let out a breath of relief and say a silent thank you to the best mother-in-law in the history of the world. Soup I can handle. Adam comes over and puts a steaming mug of mint tea on the coffee table. He leans down and kisses my forehead. No fever, he says. I think a weekend of sleep will cure whatever ails me. Would you mind if we eat on the couch tonight? He puts a hand to my forehead, and I can see the concern in his eyes. No problem, wife. He kisses me again and returns to the kitchen. There's a knock on the door, and Jason and Alex come in. You look like hell, Jason says to me. I frown at him, but he walks over and feels my forehead. Once he's done with that, he checks my glands. Ew, you're my brother, not my doctor. Shoo! I playfully shove him away, but he ignores me. And what's that smell? I pinch my nose shut. Your cologne is horrible. He frowns at me and says, I'm not wearing any cologne. Well, you stink, I tell him. Hmm, is all Jason says. You guys want dinner? Adam asks our guest, and they both say yes. And where are my nieces? They are spending the night with mom, Jason says. What in the hell is that smell? I ask again when Adam uncovers a dish and sticks it in the microwave. I think it's chicken and dumplings. I make a gagging sound and Jason narrows his eyes. Alex comes and sits next to me on the couch. Melly, could you be pregnant? She asks. Adam freezes and then slowly turns around. He approaches and now all three of them are staring at me. Ah, uh, absolutely not. I'm worn out, that's all. Between our wedding, honeymoon, work, and school, I'm exhausted. I never miss a pill, so I can't be pregnant. Jason looks around again and says, No birth control is 100% effective, Melly. 
Well, I can't be because we have too much going on. I'm in law school, for heaven's sake. If ever there was a reason, law school would be it, Jason says back with a dramatic eye roll. Why didn't I think of this before? It makes sense, Mel. No birth control can withstand what went down on our honeymoon. I feel my cheeks redden. Alex laughs, and Jason makes a gagging sound. Adam, I admonish. I have a pregnancy test downstairs. Alex runs out, and I refuse to acknowledge the possibility out loud. But all the symptoms make sense now that I think about it. I haven't had my period since the week before our wedding, but I blame that on stress. Alex returns a few minutes later. I take the test from her and run to the bathroom. Adam follows right behind me. I can pee alone, stud, I tell him. I'm not letting you out of my sight from now until that baby is born. He puts a palm on my belly. When I look into his eyes, I can see the love. He wants this. I wrap my arms around him, and he rests his forehead on mine. I don't want to get your hopes up, Adam. He kisses the side of my neck and pulls me closer. I know him. In his mind, I'm pregnant. Too late. I'm already thinking of names. We're having a baby. I ask him to turn his back while I pee on the stick. It takes less than a minute for two pink lines to appear. The second it's confirmed, my husband lifts me off my feet and carries me bridal style out of the bathroom. He gently lays me on the couch, but instead of covering me, he kneels down, presses his face to my stomach, and kisses me. Does this mean what I think it means? Alex asks. I have my love, and soon I'm going to have a little love, my husband says. This concludes Takedown by Evelyn Sola. Narrated by Shire Bush and Troy Duran. Copyright 2021 by Evelyn Sola. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Evelyn Sola and was produced in the year 2023 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.